Harper Audio presents The Run by Stuart Woods, performed by Ken Howard. United States Senator William Henry Lee IV and his wife Catherine Rule Lee drove away from their Georgetown house in their Chevrolet Suburban early on a December morning. There was the promise of snow in the air. Kate sipped coffee from an insulated mug and yawned. Tell me again why we drive this enormous fucking car, she said. Will laughed. I keep forgetting you're not a politician, he said. We drive it because it is, by my reckoning, the least offensive motor vehicle manufactured in the state of Georgia, and because Georgia car workers and their union have shown the great wisdom to support your husband's candidacy in two elections. Oh, she said, now I remember. He looked in the rearview mirror and saw another suburban following them. They're there, he said. They're supposed to be. How did they know? Because I called them last night and gave them our schedule. The week before, there had been a terrorist attack on CIA employees as they had left the agency's building in McLean, Virginia, and certain agency officials had been given personal protection for a time. Kate Rule was the deputy director for intelligence, chief of all the CIA's analysts, and was therefore entitled. Oh, Will replied, sipping his own coffee and heading north toward College Park, Maryland, and its airport. They're not going to follow us all the way to Georgia, are they? I persuaded them that wouldn't be necessary. Good. It's a little like having Secret Service protection, isn't it? She nudged. Does it make you feel presidential? Nothing is going to make me feel presidential, at least for another nine years. What about the cabinet? If Joe Adams is elected and wants you for defense or state or something, will you leave the Senate? Joseph Adams was vice president of the United States and the way out in front leader for the Democratic Party's nomination for president the following year. Joe and I have already talked about that. He says I can have anything I want, but he doesn't really mean it. I always thought Joe was a pretty sincere guy, Kate said. Oh, he is, and he was sincere with the half dozen other guys he told the same thing. But I think I'll stay in the Senate. George has got a Republican governor at the moment, and if I left, he'd get to appoint my replacement, and we don't want that. Also, if Joe's elected, three or four top senators will leave to join the administration, among them the minority leader, and I'd have a real good shot at that job. And if we can win the Senate back, then the job would be majority leader, and that is very inviting. But you don't want to spend the rest of your career in the Senate, do you? You know I love the Senate. Will, you've been awfully closed-mouthed about this, but I know damned well you want to be president. One of these days, sure, Will replied. Will turned into the entrance of the little airport at College Park, on the grounds of the University of Maryland. He drove down the taxiway to where his airplane was tied down, got out of the car, and unlocked the cabin door. He climbed in and lowered the rear seat backs, then stowed the luggage Kate handed him. She drove the Suburban back to the little office and parked it there. Will had nearly finished his pre-flight inspection when Kate returned. She started to say something, but her voice was drowned out by the noise of a large helicopter setting down on the runway. Will recognized it immediately. So did Kate. I thought the President had already gone home to California for Christmas. I thought so, too, Will said. The air-stair door of the helicopter was lowered, but the engines were kept running. A young Marine officer in a crisp uniform left the craft and came jogging toward where Will and Kate stood. He ran up to them and saluted smartly. Senator, Mrs. Lee? Good morning, Lieutenant, Will said. The Vice President and Mrs. Adams would be honored if you would join them for breakfast at Camp David, the officer said. Will and Kate looked at each other. We were just about to take off for of Georgia, Will said. The Vice President instructed me to insist, the Marine replied. We'll have you back here before noon, and our people will get you an expedited clearance to Georgia. Will looked at Kate and shrugged. She shrugged back. He locked up the Mirage and followed the Marine back to the idling helicopter.
A moment later, they had taken off and were headed northwest across the Maryland landscape. Kate leaned over and spoke into Will's ear. You have any idea what this is all about? Will shook his head. Not a clue, he said. At Camp David, they drove past a number of buildings, then stopped before a large structure of timber and stone. A Secret Service agent escorted them up the path to the door on which hung the seal of the Vice President. He opened the door for them and ushered them in. Vice President and Mrs. Adams will be with you shortly, the agent said, and then left them alone in the room. They stood in front of the huge fireplace and warmed their backsides while they waited. I wonder what's keeping Joe and Sue. They're entitled. As if on cue, the vice president and his wife entered the room from a rear hallway. Will, Adams said, ignoring the outstretched hand and embracing him. It's good to see you. The women, who were less well acquainted than their husbands, touched cheeks and exchanged pleasantries. Have you had breakfast? the vice president asked. Not really, Will replied. Neither have we, Adams nodded at the waiter. Tell Carlos what you'd like. They ordered, and the Adamses joined Will and Kate before the fire. I love this place in winter, Adams said, and the president was kind enough to offer us the lodge. Where's Peter? I thought he'd be with you. It's his dad's turn to have him for Christmas, Kate said of her son. He's going to Boston. And how old is he now? Sixteen. A sophomore at showed his father's school. I know you're proud of him. I certainly am. He's doing very well in school. Sports, too. Where are your children, Mr. Vice President? It's Joe and Sue, please, Adams said. They're already at my folks' place in Florida. We're flying down to join them this afternoon. How is New York? Will asked. The Vice President's trip had been in the news. He made some speeches while his wife Christmas shopped. Just lovely this time of the year, Adams replied. We got to the theater a couple of times. It was almost a vacation. The food arrived and everyone dug in, keeping up an animated conversation. Will knew Joe Adams very well. Adams had been the first senator to befriend him as an equal when Will had arrived on the Hill as a senator, instead of as a senatorial aide, and he had known him through committee work before that. While their conversation was the chat of good friends, Will thought he caught something strained in Adam's behavior, and in his wife's, too. Finally, the dishes were cleared away and a pot of coffee was set on the table. There was a moment of complete silence. Then the butler came back. "'Will you and your guests like anything else at all, Mr. Vice President?' he asked. "'Thank you, Carlos. No. Would you tell the Secret Service man at the door and your own staff that we don't wish to be disturbed for a while?' Of course, Mr. Vice President. Carlos bowed and left the room. The silence came back. Will waited for someone to break it. Joe Adams finally did. Will, Kate, he said, we've asked you up here to give you some news personally. He paused and cleared his throat. Sue Adams stared out a window at the snow. First of all, I want you to know that this room is not bugged and our conversation is not being recorded. I had the Secret Service double-check that earlier today. What I'm about to tell you and Kate, I intend to tell only you and Kate. You will because, more than anyone else besides Sue, you have a right to know. You're as close a friend as I have, and you've put more into my presidential effort than anyone else. Kate... I want you to know because I don't want Will to have to keep this from you. I know that I don't even have to ask you both to keep this in the strictest confidence. Will and Kate nodded. The atmosphere in the room had become somber. Sue Adams got up and went to the window, turning her back to them. She produced a tissue and dabbed at her face. Our trip to New York wasn't just for speeches, the theater, and shopping, Joe Adams said. There was another reason. He took out a handkerchief, blew his nose, returned it to his pocket, then continued. The week before last, I had my annual physical at Walter Reed Hospital. It went beautifully, and I got a clean bill of health. Ironically, it was the first time I can remember when everything, weight, cholesterol, 
blood pressure, the works, was right on the money. But I wasn't entirely frank with the staff at Walter Reed. Will shifted uncomfortably in his seat. There was something they didn't pick up on at the hospital, Joe Adams said, something they wouldn't have detected unless they had been looking for and tested for it specifically. I'd had some symptoms that only Sue and I knew about. That's why we arranged the New York trip. My old college roommate is now one of the two or three top neurologists in the country, and he put together a very thorough series of tests, some of them quite new. The results of all this testing by the top experts in the field were conclusive. He looked at Kate, then back at Will. I'm in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Will had been holding his breath. He let it out in a rush. Joe, he began. Adams held up a hand. Please, let me tell you everything. I know your first question will be, shouldn't I get a second opinion? My testing encompassed three opinions, independently arrived at. They were all in complete agreement. I have it. It's going to get worse, and unless I get lucky and have a coronary... I'm eventually going to die from it. Sue Adams returned from the window and took her seat. Her eyes were red. Joe and I have a hard road ahead of us, Sue Adams said, and we're going to need your help. Adams continued. Your next question is going to be, I know, will I resign? The answer is no, and I'll tell you why. I talked with the president yesterday before he left for California, and I told him I was thinking of resigning my office in order to pursue my presidential campaign full-time. He neither encouraged nor discouraged that action. So I asked him frankly who he would appoint as my successor if I resigned. To my surprise, the president told me he had anticipated my thoughts about resigning. He told me he had decided not to appoint a new vice president. He's under no constitutional obligation to do so, of course, and he said that with barely more than a year left to serve, he thought that the speculation surrounding the appointment and the jockeying for advantage by various groups would create too much distraction from the important issues he wants to resolve before he leaves office. As it happens, I think he's right, but if I resigned, his failure to appoint a successor would leave us with an unacceptable situation. It would put the Speaker of the House in line to succeed the President if he should die before his term ends. Will nodded his understanding. Now, I've always made a great effort to have good relations with the Speaker, and I've tried to consider his position on various issues, but I have to tell you that his positions are so bizarre sometimes, and always so self-serving and serving of his party at the expense of the country, that I swear if he became President... I'd have to shoot him myself. Will and Kate both laughed. But rather than entertain that possibility, the vice president continued, it seems simpler just not to resign my office and continue to campaign for the presidency as vice president. Will blinked. Continue to campaign? He asked incredulously. Adams held up a hand. Easy, Will. I'm not crazy yet. In my condition, I'd never try to be elected president— There'll come a right moment to leave the race, and when it happens, I'll recognize it, but it's not now. The best medical advice I can get is that the progress of my disease will be slow, and that there's no reason why I shouldn't serve out my term. I'd like to do that, especially because I know now that I can never be president. I think that I can have a positive influence on events, and particularly on the next Congress if I remain in office. Will conceded to himself that that was so. However, I don't want my medical condition to become public knowledge as long as I can lead a fairly normal life. That would isolate me from any influence on events, and I don't want that while I can be a positive force in national affairs. If I announce my condition and resign now, then all I can do is go home to Florida, sit on the beach, and wait to go crazy and die. I can understand your position, Joe, Will said. Sue supports me in this, Adam said. She's always been my closest advisor, and she's going to stick close to me to be sure that I don't do the wrong thing because of a memory lapse, which, by the way, is my principal symptom so far, short-term memory loss. I'd like to stress that I am not delusional. 
I plan to deal with my memory lapses by having notes taken at every opportunity so that nothing will get by me. I'll depend a lot on Sue for that. That's a good idea, Will said. There's something else, Will, Adam said. When I withdraw, I'm going to do so in your favor. I'm going to ask my contributors to assign their contributions to your campaign. Will had not yet given any thought to his own position, and he was stunned. That's incredibly generous of you, Joe, he managed to say. But Kate and I are going to have to talk about this. Of course you will, Adams replied. Fortunately, you have the holidays ahead of you, and there'll be time before you announce. Announce, Will said. I want you to announce for the presidency right after the new year. I want you to have established yourself as a candidate independent of me in the minds of the electorate before I withdraw. I'll have to give that a lot of thought, Joe. Sue Adams spoke up. Will, speaking for myself, I think you are now the Democrat who is best qualified for the presidency. You're well established at the center as well as at the heart of the party, and Joe and I want to see you elected next November. We certainly do, Adams said. You are superbly qualified by temperament, training, and intellect. As far as I'm concerned, nobody in either party comes close. Will warmed to the praise, but he was being sucked into this little conspiracy, and he wasn't entirely comfortable with it. Adams seemed to sense his disquiet. Will, all I'm asking you to do is help me make a graceful exit from public life while accomplishing as much as I can in the time remaining to me. Is that too much to ask of a close friend? No, certainly not, Will replied. Good, Adam said. Call me when you've made a decision about announcing. Will took off from College Park Airport and called Washington Center for his clearance, as the Marine helicopter pilot had instructed him to do. To his surprise, he was cleared direct to his home airport in Warm Springs, Georgia, instead of being rooted on airways. He climbed to his assigned altitude of 18,000 feet, switched on the autopilot, and sat back, doing an instrument scan every minute or so. Hardly a word had passed between him and Kate on the helicopter ride back to College Park, and until now he had been too busy flying to talk. He wanted to talk. This whole thing scares me to death, Will said. You? Scared of running for president? Not that so much. It's Joe's situation. It's like a bomb that may or may not go off. Do you really think he's doing the right thing? Will shrugged. I'm not sure there's only one right thing, he said. It would be right if he announced his condition publicly and resigned, but who's to say that what he's doing is wrong? He has some very good points about his usefulness to the party and to the country over the next months. I certainly wouldn't deny him that. You understand that if the bomb goes off, it's going to hurt you as well as Joe. Maybe. That's entirely unpredictable. I've been thinking back over the history of the presidency, and the only thing I can think of that resembles this situation is Woodrow Wilson's illness in office and his wife's acting for him. Of course, it's not quite the same thing. Joe's not president. If he were, I think he'd have to resign, regardless of the consequences. Do you think Reagan was in the early stages of Alzheimer's during his last term? I don't know. It's possible, I guess. And it's also possible that nobody really noticed. After all, he was the oldest president. You'd expect some slowing down at that age. Remember when he had to testify in court? He said, I don't recall, dozens of times. At the time, I thought he was dissembling, but maybe he really didn't remember. Maybe not. Kate was quiet for a while, then she spoke. If you do this, it's going to play hell with our lives. Well, that's true of everybody who ever ran for the office, Will replied. Do you not want me to do it? Oh, Will, I think you'd make a superb president. You know that. I'm glad you think so. What we have to get clear between us is what your role is going to be. What do you want my role to be? We have two choices, I think. One is that you resign from the agency and play the campaign wife. I know you don't want to do that, and I don't expect you to. 
The other is for you to remain at the agency and do your job. I can say in campaigning that my wife and I are both public servants and that we decided together that the country would be best served by your remaining at the agency. Sounds good to me, Kate said. Understand, though, that there are times when I want you at my side, at the convention, for instance, and if I get the nomination on election night. At the whole convention or just for the smiling and waving at the end? At the whole convention, I think. There has to be some time when the party and the press gets to feel that you are a real person and not just a cardboard cutout that's set up for photo ops. All right, I can take vacation time for the convention. Also, when I make evening appearances in or around Washington, I'd like you on the platform, work permitting. Work permitting, okay. What about Peter? The last night of the convention and election night only. That's all I'll ask of him. I don't want to interfere with his schooling or with his relationship with his father. Yes, that would really set Simon off. I don't want you to press Peter to do this. I'd rather not have him there than have him think I'm imposing on our relationship. Peter loves you, Will, you know that. He'll be glad to help. You're going to have to warn him about the press, too, and... Will stopped. Tell him to stay out of trouble? Well, yes, he's a normal kid, and I want him to stay that way, but I don't want him getting busted for smoking pot or anything like that. Well, I think that's a reasonable request, she laughed. I think he'll think so, too. I'll need to talk about this with my folks, of course, Will said. Kate laughed. You think they're going to discourage you? It's their dream come true. Well, yes. Who else should you talk to? I wish Ben Carr was still alive. I'd sure like to talk to him. Who else? Tom Black, of course. I'd want him to run the advertising and to advise in general. I want Kitty Conroy and Tim Coleman on board right away. Conroy was the chief of his Senate staff and Coleman his press secretary. You need a top politician to be campaign manager, Kate said. Maybe another senator to do for you what you were going to do for Joe Adams. I'll have to think about that, Will replied. Nobody jumps to mind, and a third of them will be running for re-election. Thank God you don't have to make that decision, whether to run for president or for re-election to the Senate. At least if you lose, you'll still be in the Senate. There is that. You might even still be majority leader. If we can win the Senate next year, and the chances are pretty good, I think. All in all, Senator, I'd say you were in pretty good shape. Sure. All I have to do is beat a big field in the primaries and a Republican in November and along the way raise 60 or 70 million dollars. Oops, forgot about that. I'm not president yet. Of course, in the event that I actually get elected, the problem of your role is going to be a thorny one. Will, I cannot be Nancy Reagan or Rosalind Carter or Eleanor Roosevelt. I understand that. But even if you stay at the agency, there'll be a lot of times when you'll have to be at the White House. Interviews, events, state dinners and receptions, and probably some foreign travel. How am I going to hold down a full-time job at the agency and still attend all these state dinners and receptions? Listen, I'd have to hold down a job as president while attending them. Touché, she said. They were met at the Warm Springs Airport by Henry, the black retainer and factotum who had served the Lee family for decades. Will shook Henry's hand, inquired after his health and that of his wife, Marie, and got a satisfactory reply. Henry looked little older than he had ten years before. Henry dropped them at Will's lakeside cottage and drove on to the main house. Will and Kate showered and rested a while, then walked up to the main house for dinner. The house, a brick-and-granite Georgian structure, had been copied from Will's mother's family home in County Cork, Ireland, and Patricia Lee had acted as the general contractor, supervising every detail of the building. Henry brought them a drink in the library, and a moment later Billy and Patricia Lee entered. Patricia was nearly eighty, and her husband five years older, but they both looked remarkably well, Will thought, whenever he saw them. There was an exchange of embraces and kisses, more drinks were brought, and they settled in to catch up. 
We were so sorry Peter couldn't be with us, Patricia said, but we know it's his father's turn. How is the boy? Thriving, Kate replied. Will he come back to us this summer? For at least a month, Kate said. I'm not sure there are enough girls in Delano to suit him. I'll see what I can do, Patricia replied, smiling. Will's father spoke up. How come you were so late, Will? We were expecting you for lunch. I'm sorry about that, Dad, Will replied, but we were diverted before we could take off. The vice president invited us to Camp David for brunch. Billy cocked his head. That's a little odd, isn't it? Right at the beginning of the Christmas holiday? Will and Kate exchanged a glance, which was not lost on Billy Lee. What's up? Billy asked. I can't tell you all of it, Will said, and what I do tell you can't go any farther. Shoot. It looks as though Joe won't run for president. Everybody in the room sat stock still for a long moment. He's ill, then, Billy said with finality. I didn't say that. You didn't need to. Heart? Cancer? Nothing like that. I can't tell you more at the moment. Billy nodded. Then you'll be running. It wasn't a question. Very likely. I haven't made a final decision. What decision? There's no decision to make. If Joe Adams is out, you have to be in. Will didn't quarrel with his father. I haven't decided when to announce. Joe wants me to come out the first of the year. He's right. Time is short. Who else knows about this? Just Joe and Sue. That's what he told you anyway. Joe's a pretty sly politician. I believe him, Will said. Believe him if you like, but don't act on that belief. You're not getting cynical on me, are you, Dad? Just realistic. It wasn't bad advice, Will knew. He nodded. We'll have a lot to talk about over this holiday, Billy said. Let's not rush it, Dad. At my age, I have to rush everything. I wouldn't want to kick off next month without having given you the benefit of my wisdom. Well, you've never denied me that, Will laughed. His mother laughed with him. It's been pretty good wisdom, hasn't it? It has. I still know a few people around the country who could help, Billy said. Of course, there are fewer of them than there used to be. I'm going to need all the help I can get, Will said. Billy nodded. Just be careful what you have to give for it. Henry came in to call them to dinner. For the first time he could remember, sex did not render Will unconscious. He and Kate made love in their usual slow, caring way, and soon Kate was snoring softly and Will was staring at the ceiling. Finally, he drifted off. Sleeping on it would help, he knew. And when he woke up, he had made a decision. They brought muffins and coffee to the bed and propped themselves up, watching the Today Show. The phone rang. Kate looked at the bedside clock. It's not 7.30 yet. Your parents would never call this early. Will picked up the phone. Hello? Senator Lee? Yes? This is the White House operator. Will you speak to the vice president? Of course. There was a click. Hello, Will? Good morning, Joe. I hope I'm not calling too early. No, I was about to call you. I wanted to have your views on our conversation of yesterday after you'd slept on it. Joe, I understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. In your place, I might very well do the same thing. Is there a but at the end of that sentence? There is, Joe. I think you should wait until after the holidays, then resign. There was a long silence before Adam spoke, and when he did, Will caught a hint of hurt in his voice. Give me your reasons, he said. Whatever the state of your illness and its progression, the public perception of it is one of decline and delusion. You couldn't continue in office if the country knew, and I don't think you should keep this from the country. Are you worried about how I might behave if I continue in office? No, I think you and Sue together could figure out if you got to the point where you couldn't make good decisions, but you can't predict accurately if or when that might happen. There's also the danger of this getting out. 
I believe I have it contained, Adam said. Still, there are a number of people who know, and if there were a leak, you wouldn't be able to control the situation. That's possible, but not likely. Joe, I tell you this as your friend and admirer. The only way you can control this situation is to announce it and resign. If you don't, control will eventually pass to someone else, perhaps not someone of your choosing. If you leave office, you can still have influence. People will judge you by the quality of your reasoning and your statements. If you keep this quiet and it becomes known, then doubt will be cast on your every action and utterance during the time it was a secret. You must see that. Well, I certainly see that as a possibility. It's a question of how much risk I'm willing to assume. I suppose it is, Will replied, but I wouldn't be your friend if I didn't tell you exactly how I felt. I thank you for your advice, Will, and for your honesty and candor, the vice president said. I'll be in touch. Merry Christmas to you and your family. And Merry Christmas to you and yours, Joe. The line went dead. Will turned to Kate. I'm not going to announce while he's still a candidate. People would think I'm crazy if I did. And when Joe finally did pull out, they'd think that he and I had somehow colluded to get me the nomination, and they'd be right. They'd think I was using Joe's illness to my own advantage. Well, that's not true. You'd never do that. The appearance would be there, Will sighed. I wish I didn't know about this. I wish Joe hadn't called us up there and told us. I'd rather have found out the same time as everybody else. In my business, Kate said, there's no such thing as too much information. At the very least, Joe has given you time to think and plan. That's a great gift. It's one I'd rather not have. Nevertheless, you're stuck with it. Will left the farm and drove into Delano, to his and his father's law office. The firm of Lee and Lee had been central to the family's life since Billy had founded it after his return from World War II. It provided a business center for the family and outside income from cases, local and statewide, which had helped the Lees build a comfortable life. Now the firm was called Lee, Lee, and Robertson to include their partner of recent years, Tim Robertson, who, since Billy's virtual retirement and Will's election to the Senate, had essentially run the firm. Will was stopped half a dozen times between his parking place and the front door of the little office building. Everyone in town knew him, of course, and he knew practically everyone. Small talk of families and friends was exchanged, and finally he made it into the building. His office was neat and dusted, and a stack of mail and telephone messages was waiting for him. He went through it quickly. Apart from a personal letter or two from old friends, most of it was requests for constituent services. He stuffed those into a large envelope and marked it for forwarding to his Atlanta constituency office, then turned to the phone messages, answering a couple and scribbling notes for Tim Robertson or his secretary to answer the others. The last message in the pile gave him pause. It read, Charlene Joyner would like to speak with you urgently, and the return number was in the 310 area code. Will stared at the message, and a flood of memories came back. He remembered defending her boyfriend, one Larry Eugene Moody, against charges of rape and murder in a trial that fell in the middle of his first campaign for the Senate. He remembered losing the trial, and most of all he remembered a hot summer's afternoon spent naked with the beautiful Charlene in the little lake beside his cottage and in his bed. He and Kate had not yet been married or even engaged, and they had been estranged at the moment when Charlene turned up at the cottage. He remembered the flurry that the brief affair had caused in his campaign, and how it had probably worked out to his benefit in the election, but most of all he remembered Charlene naked, uninhibited, and imaginative. He felt a married man's guilt for the stirring that came with the memory. After a moment's thought he dialed the number. Hello, she said after the fourth ring. Her voice was sleepy, husky. Charlene, it's Will Lee. Will, how are you? She was suddenly wide awake. Well, I'm very well. I'm sorry to call so early. I forgot about the time difference between here and L.A. 
It's all right. I've got a ten o'clock call today. I have to get up anyway. I saw one of your movies on TV not long ago. The one about the singer. Country Blues. Oh, yeah. I got a nomination for that. I thought you were terrific. I'm glad about the way your career has worked out. Thank you, Will. That's nice to hear. You're living in L.A. all the time, then? In Malibu. That's where I am now. Keep the number so if you're out here, maybe we can get together. Will didn't want to reply to that. What are you doing next? I've just signed to do a film with Vance Calder next summer, she said. Well, movie stars don't get any bigger than that, he said. Oh, it's a wonderful script. My agent thinks it's going to do a lot for me. I'll be doing an English accent if you can believe that. I think you can do anything you want to. He stopped talking. It was time to find out why she had called. Uh, Will, she said somewhat hesitantly, the reason I called is about Larry Moody. The mention of the name soured Will's stomach. What about him? he asked cautiously. I'm going to finance an appeal for Larry. I hoped you might represent him again. Will resisted the temptation to respond with anger. Charlene, I've been in the Senate for ten years now. I don't try cases anymore, and I was never an appeals lawyer. I just thought that since you originally represented him, you might consider it. The only conceivable grounds for appeal I can think of is that he was inadequately represented by his lawyer, and you can hardly expect me to argue that before an appeals court. Oh, well, I just wish you would represent him. I'm afraid I can't. Can you recommend somebody? I'm sorry, but I'm so outside the loop on appeals of criminal cases that I couldn't even do that. Do you have an L.A. attorney? Yes, but he's an entertainment lawyer. He'll have some networking connection with a good appeals man. Talk to him and get him to research it for you. All right, I'll do that. Charlene, hasn't Larry already been through the appeals process? Yes, but he wants to try again. He's looking at the electric chair, you know, and sooner rather than later. I know. He was silent again. Well, I won't keep you, Will. I really would love to see you, though. It's lovely out here in Malibu, the beach and all. She paused. We'd be discreet, of course, she breathed. Thanks, Charlene, but I rarely get to L.A. I look forward to the new film with Vance Calder, though. What's the title? It's called Spin. It's a political thriller. I can't wait. You take care of yourself now. You too, Will. And I hope you'll call. Bye. He hung up, and he was sweating a little. His phone buzzed, and he picked it up. Yes? Tom Black is on the line for you, Betty, the office manager, said. Will you speak to him? Yes, Will said, but he paused a moment before pushing the button. Tom Black was the political consultant who had run both of Will's Senate campaigns. Tom? Will, how are you? I'm extremely well, and you? Just great. And Kate? She's wonderful. What are you up to? Oh, I'm just getting some ducks in a row for next year, Tom said. I'm afraid Joe Adams' candidacy has squelched a lot of others. Nobody wants to impose him for the nomination. That's not good for my business. You'll stay busy, Tom. I'm sure you've already got a half a dozen congressional and Senate candidates lined up. Oh, we'll be well represented next fall, I guess. I wish you were running. One of these days. Will? Tom said, I'm trying to set my house in order for 2000 and I want to ask you a question. As long as you don't expect an honest answer. Let's make this a purely hypothetical question. Okay, hypothetical is all right, I suppose. Okay, here it is. Will, if Joe Adams, for some hypothetical reason, decided to pull out of the race, would you, hypothetically, consider a run? Well... Hypothetically speaking, if Joe were hypothetically out of it, I might consider a purely hypothetical run. You understand, don't you, Tom, that right now my first obligation is to Joe, and that I would never oppose him? 
that apart from my friendship with Joe, I would be cutting my own throat in the party if I opposed him. I understand that completely, Will, and I agree with you. You certainly should not oppose Joe. Well, I'm glad you grasped that, Tom. One more question, then I'll let you off the hook. A hypothetical question? Absolutely. Shoot. If you should make this hypothetical run, would you want me in on it? Hypothetically? You bet your ass I would. I was hoping you'd say that. Who else would put up with me? Tom laughed. He seemed about to say something, then stopped. You have a great holiday, Tom, Will said. Sure, Will, you too. We'll talk again after the new year. I'm sure we will, Tom. Goodbye. He hung up. Tom Black knew something. Will was sure of that. But what did he know? And who else knew? Christmas dinner at the Lee Farm was much the same as Christmas's past, with Billy and Patricia Lee, Will and Kate, and Will's Aunt Eloise, Billy's younger sister. After lunch and coffee in the library, Billy took Will's arm and led him out in back of the house. It was an uncharacteristically warm day for late December, with the temperature in the mid-sixties, and they took seats on some teak chairs beside the swimming pool. "'I want to talk to you,' Billy said. "'Sure, Dad.' "'I've reached a peculiar time in my life,' Billy said. "'My political career is over, my legal career is over, my health is less than perfect. Still, I'm well enough to enjoy the comfortable life your mother and I have built for ourselves.' He paused and looked out over the little lake beside Will's cottage. But I'm not enjoying it very much. What's the problem, Dad? I miss the action. I miss problems to solve. I miss the give and take of politics in the courtroom. I miss doing something. What can I do to help, Dad? You can run for president. That's what you can do. That'll keep me going a few more years. Dad, I'd love to run, but all right, all right. Now, I know something's wrong with Joe Adams, and I know you can't tell me about it. I'd be disappointed in you if you breached the confidence even to me. Well, I'm glad you understand. I take it that whatever is wrong with Joe isn't going to be revealed immediately. I remember that a week or two ago he had his annual physical at Walter Reed and that his office released the results in a routine manner. So whatever's happened has happened since then. What I'm trying to say to you is that you have to make the most of the period between right now and the time Joe drops out. How can I do that? Without breaching a confidence? Oh, come on, boy, you're a better politician than that. You've got to put together a core of people to get a campaign organized. It's late, Will. Very late to be starting from scratch, and you're going to have to find a way to let your key people know what's coming. If you wait and let them be surprised when Joe pulls out, they'll be insulted because you didn't trust them. I see your point, Will said. Tom Black called me yesterday and asked a lot of hypothetical questions, and I gave him a lot of hypothetical answers. That's good enough, Billy said. Now you've got to start talking hypothetically with some other people. Pick people for your key campaign slots and tell them to start putting together a plan right now something that can be put into immediate effect when the moment comes. Well, I guess I can do that if I do it carefully. Also, I think you should start accepting speaking engagements in states with large blocks of electoral votes. California, New York, Illinois, and so on. And New Hampshire, of course. I still got a few friends around the country. I'll see if I can arrange a few speaking invitations. Dad, we can't let it get out that you're doing this. Oh, of course not, Billy snorted. And you shouldn't be given blatant political speeches. What you should do is select topics that are important to your audiences and give good, common-sense speeches on those issues. Your goal is not to win votes right now, but to impress the people you're talking to. That way, when you announce, you'll have people out there who'll remember that they liked what you said or the way you said it. You should include statements in each speech that will be quoted prominently in the press, too. I suppose you have some topics in mind. Oh, I guess so, Billy laughed. I think the situation in Russia and our relationship to that regime would be a good one. It's a dangerous situation. It's not getting the attention it should, either in the press or in Congress. Not too hard to envision circumstances that could lead to a nuclear incident. Well, you're right about that. What else? 
Start suggesting solutions to some big problems, saving Social Security, better health care, that sort of thing. If you show people now that you have some ideas for solving these problems, they'll remember that when you're a candidate. Dad, will you write me a long memo on all this? Sure I will. Give me something to do. Lately, I've been thinking too much about dying. Be nice to have something else to think about. On New Year's morning, Will arrived at his hideaway office in the Capitol at 10. Tim Coleman, his chief of staff, and Kitty Conroy, his press secretary, were waiting for him. Happy New Millennium, Will cried, eliciting flinches from both people. Senator, I hope this isn't your idea of a joke, Tim groaned. I was out until four. I haven't even been to bed, Kitty said. Sorry about that. My last guest didn't leave until after two, so I'm a little fuzzy around the edges myself. So what's up? Kitty asked. She was the less patient of the two. I wanted to talk to you today because the building is pretty much empty and I didn't want anybody around. You're firing us? Tim asked. No, I'm doubling your workload. Swell, Tim replied. This stays among the three of us until I say differently. Agreed? Agreed, the two said in chorus. I want you two to start today, right now, to put together a plan for a run for the presidency. The presidency of what? Tim asked, looking blank. The United States of America? Tim's expression didn't change, and Kitty looked just as blank. Will sat there and let it sink in. Okay, Kitty said finally. I'll bite. What's the punchline? I started with the punchline, Will said. Senator, Tim said slowly, don't you think it's a little early to start planning a campaign for eight years hence? I'm running this year, Will said. Kitty piped up. I didn't see the post this morning. Did Joe Adams drop dead last night? I saw him at midnight, and he looked fairly alive to me. Let me get this straight, Tim said. You, of all people, are going to run against Joe Adams? Will took a deep breath. I can't answer many questions, he said. Just take my word for it. Tim and Kitty exchanged a long look. Well, Tim said, can we assume that you know something we don't? Tim... Kitty, it's not inconceivable that someday someone may ask you for an account of this conversation. I'd like you to be able to answer truthfully that I didn't tell you anything, except that I intended to make the run and that you took my word for it. All right, Tim said. You're running, and I'm going to do everything I can to help. Me too, Kitty echoed. But we can't tell anybody we're helping? Not for the moment. Then how can we organize a campaign? I want you to put together a structure that will serve us from the day I announce until the second Tuesday in November. Everything from issues to fundraising. Make a chart. Next to every box, I want you to write a name, more than one. We won't get everybody we want. There should be a campaign manager at the top, and I don't want a figurehead. I want a working manager. You know what the other boxes will be. They won't be all that different from the senatorial campaigns. Are we going to get Tom Black in on this? Kitty asked. Not yet. Tom's on hold. He won't commit to anybody else. Back to your chart. On the day we're ready, I want to be able to call everybody we need very quickly. When this happens, it's going to happen fast. I doubt if we'll have a week between the moment of the final decision to go and the announcement, and I want to have everybody who's really important to us aboard during that week. I want to hit the ground running so fast that nobody will ever be able to catch us. Right now, our only advantage is that my eventual opponents don't know they're running. How much time do we have before you make the absolutely final decision? I mean, when is go day? Tim asked. I can only guess, but I should think it will happen this month. How much can we spend? Nothing. We've got about three-quarters of a million in my campaign fund, but we can't touch it yet. One of the first things we'll have to do on Go Day is round up enough people in enough states to get enough signatures on petitions to qualify for federal campaign funding. P. 
pay particular attention to that. Of course, Tim said. Forgive me for stating the obvious, but I want every base covered. Kitty, of course you'll pay particular attention to the press operation, but I want you also to concentrate on finding us the right person to assemble and train a staff of advanced people. We'll want someone who can pick up the phone and recruit at least a dozen experienced people on day one. We're going to need a campaign headquarters in Washington, Tim said. Put that at the top of your list. Can I feel out some people on real estate? Absolutely not. Your effort has got to be completely secret until we go, and I'll tell you how secret. I gave you both briefcases for Christmas? Yes, thanks very much, Kitty said. They have locks on them. I don't want you to create a piece of paper that won't fit into those briefcases, and I want you to be practically handcuffed to them. You ought to talk to no one, not even each other, about this on the telephone. You ought to create no computer files, not so much as a memo on this subject. You are not to talk to each other about this anywhere except in this room, in your offices or homes or in my office, and then only behind a locked door. You're going to have to keep regular office hours and do your regular work. I don't want anyone on the staff to know or even suspect what you're doing. Don't say anything to anybody that might make them think you're working on anything special. Phew, Kitty said. This is going to be tough. It won't have to be secret for all that long. Just in this initial organizing phase, we ought to be able to get a lot done today since nobody's going to come looking for us until dinner time. They both nodded. And I want you to find me a holy man. Tim's eyes narrowed. What? Well, I don't mean a guru or a television evangelist. I mean a man or a woman, a lawyer, who is so clean, so upright, that no one would ever believe him capable of doing a wrong thing. I want this person to be in charge of two things. One, to see that we strictly conform to both the letter and the spirit of the campaign finance laws. And two, to serve as a sounding board on ethics so that if anyone on the campaign has the slightest doubt that what he is about to do comes close to the line, he can call the holy man and get advice. The holy man's opinion will be final. Someone from academia, Tim said. Or a retired federal appeals court judge, Kitty chimed in. You're getting the picture. If Oliver Wendell Holmes could be resurrected, he'd be ideal. How are Kitty and I going to divide our time between the office and the campaign once we're underway, Tim asked. You're not. It has to be one job or the other. I don't want anyone to be able to say that I'm using Senate staff to run my campaign. Frankly, I'd like you both on the campaign, but I'll leave the final decision to you. I want the campaign, Kitty said. Me too, said Tim. Fine with me. Start thinking about finding your replacements and think about who else from the staff we'll want on the campaign. You know, Kitty said wonderingly, until a few minutes ago, I had a hangover. Now it's gone. Will laughed. Me too. Now let's get to work. Kate looked at him across the kitchen table. How do you feel now that you've started, she asked. Strange, he said. Exhilarated, tired, a little scared. I don't blame you on any of those counts. The phone rang. Will picked it up. Hello? Will, it's Susan Adams. How are you? Great, Sue. Let me put you on the speaker so Kate can hear. He pressed the speaker button. Okay, we're here. First of all, I want to thank you for such a wonderful evening on New Year's Eve. It was a great way to finish out the millennium. We were delighted to have you both, Kate said. How's Joe? As you saw the other night, he's doing well. Which brings me to my point. I have some good news, some bad news, and some good news. Shoot, Will said. First, the good news. Joe is going to make his withdrawal announcement next Friday. That took Will's breath away. He hadn't expected Joe to move so soon. We both felt we should get it over with and give the other candidates as much time as we can. I expect you're right, Will said. I know this won't give you as much time as you'd like to prepare, Will, but at least you're getting most of a week. I can't complain, Sue. Now the bad news. 
I'm going into Walter Reed tomorrow for a lumpectomy. Oh, Sue, Kate said. I'm so sorry. I assume it's contained if you're not having a radical mastectomy. But that's what my doctor assumes, too. I'm not real exercised about it. I'm sure everything's going to be okay. The other good news is that Joe is going to have an excuse to drop out of the race. More time with me and all that, and it won't be a lie. We've both become very conscious that our time together will be a lot shorter than we planned. I see your point, Will said. It's going to be a shock any way you put it, but... We're going to let a rumor out starting on Wednesday, just to give some sort of media transition. By Thursday night, it'll probably make the news. Joe thinks you should announce on Saturday. That'll give you a shot at the Sunday morning TV shows. That makes sense, I guess, Will said. You can say that I told you today. Let's not refer to our meeting at Camp David. It would hurt a lot of feelings around town if people thought you knew that far in advance. Good point. You won't have to lie, Will. I know how you feel about that. And after all, I did tell you today, just now. I'm okay with that, Will said. Oh, I'm being called to dinner. I'd better run. Thank you, Sue, and thank Joe for the warning. And our prayers will be with you tomorrow. They both hung up. Well, it's really on, I guess, Kate said. Looks that way. The phone rang again, and Will picked it up. Hello? Will, it's Joe. Will punched the speaker button. Hi, Joe. Kate can hear you, too. We were both sorry to hear about Sue's illness. It's going to be okay. Don't worry. The reason I called is that Sue forgot to tell you something. What's that? I'm going to wait a while after my announcement on Friday before I make an endorsement. I'm just not sure how long. This was a blow, but Will took it as well as he could. I understand, Joe. I think my endorsement will mean more after all the candidates have had an opportunity to establish a presence in the campaign and had an opportunity to have their positions on the issues known. You have a point, Joe. Don't worry, Will. I still think you're the best man for the job, and I'm sure I'll still think so closer to the convention. Thanks, Joe. They're holding dinner for me, so I'll say good night, and thanks again for the great evening. Good night, Joe. Will hung up. Well, Kate said, you noticed that he didn't exactly say he was going to endorse you. Will poked at his food. Yeah, I noticed that. He's playing his cards close to his chest. He's going to want something when the time comes. He already knows he can have anything in my gift. So how do you feel now? A little deflated? More scared than ever. Somehow I thought I was going to have most of January to plan. I guess not. Six days is better than nothing, which is what the other candidates will have. But don't worry about them. When the rumor hits the streets, people all over town are going to start making plans. He punched the speakerphone and started dialing. Excuse me. It took less than a minute to conference Tim Coleman and Kitty Conroy. You both listening? Yes, they said simultaneously. I'm going to announce on Saturday, he said. This coming Saturday? Tim said, aghast. I can't wait. You'll know why later in the week. We'll start calling the people on our list on Friday. Kitty, wait until then to stake out the capital steps for the announcement. This is all very strange, Kitty said. It'll make a lot more sense by the end of the week, Will said. Tim said, Will, I think our first calls on Friday should be to your Atlanta office. You've got a hard core of supporters there who'll volunteer to man a campaign office until we can get up and running. Let's get a couple dozen people on a chartered bus Saturday morning and have the office open on Monday. Sounds good, but we're going to have to find a headquarters and we can't start looking until Friday. Can't we fudge the date just a little? Will thought about it. All right, you can start on Wednesday morning, but do it through a third party. I'll see what I can do as well. Okay, Tim said. Kitty, start working on a draft of a two-minute announcement speech with the appropriate built-in sound bites. Right, I've got an idea for Saturday. Shoot. 
Let's get that bus started up here from Atlanta on Friday night and have you surrounded by supporters for the announcement. Good idea. Call the Atlanta office and tell them to book the bus, but don't tell them why. Book some hotel rooms around town for these folks to stay in. Consider it done. Okay, people, I want to see you both in my hideaway at 7 a.m., so get a good night's sleep. It may be your last for a while. He hung up. Kate put a hand on his cheek. I think maybe you've had your last good night's sleep for a while, too. Will had already made coffee in his hideaway office when Tim and Kitty arrived. First things first, Will said. I want each of you to write a campaign manager's name on a piece of paper. I'll do the same. They each did so. Let's see yours, Tim, Will said. Tim held up a sheet that read, Sam Merriweather. Kitty held up hers. Sam Merriweather. Will grinned and showed them his. Sam Merriweather. It's unanimous. You both realize you're going to be working for him as well as me. They both nodded. Sam Merriweather was Will's own congressman, representing Georgia's 4th District, which included Delano. He was in his late 30s, smart, energetic, and supremely well-organized. Kitty, call Sam at home and ask him to come and see me here as soon as he can. Kitty went to the other side of the room and picked up a phone. She came back a moment later. He's on his way. He was already in his office. Good. Now tell me, who did you two come up with for the holy man? Mason Rutledge, Tim said, known as Rut to his friends. I know him vaguely, Will replied. Bring me up to date on him. Tim read from a sheet of paper. Harvard Law, class of 48, private practice with Woodman and Weld in New York for 30 years with occasional leave for public service, work for Archibald Cox when he was independent counsel during the Watergate investigations, was axed with Cox during the Saturday Night Massacre, an assistant attorney general under Griffin Bell during the Carter years, responsible for, among other things, campaign law violations, said to have turned down the AG job when Clinton offered it to him. Clinton appointed him to the Court of Appeals. Rumor had that he would have appointed him to the Supreme Court, but the Republicans on the Senate Judiciary Committee would have obstructed, so he walked away from that. Last year, he retired from the court, and he now holds a chair in constitutional law and legal ethics at Harvard Law. Married 40 years, two sons, one an assistant AG, the other at Woodman and Weld. Old New England stock, spotless character, only a little pompous. Will he do it? Kitty spoke up. I know the son, Arthur, who's a justice. We had lunch a couple of weeks ago, and Artie said his father missed public life a little. My impression is he'll do it if he can stay in Cambridge. No reason why he couldn't do it with a phone and a fax machine, is there? Not that I can see. I don't think Harvard Law would require him to take a leave if he's just a consultant on campaign law and ethics. Put him high on the list to call on Friday. There was a rap at the door, and Will pressed the button under his desk that released the lock. Sam Merriweather walked in. Tall, shambling, always slightly disheveled, he gave an almost opposite impression of the man he really was. "'You're up early, Sam,' Will said. "'Shoot, I've been at my desk for at least two hours,' Sam grinned. "'Come sit down,' Will said. "'I've got some good news for you.' Sam folded his length into a chair. "'Always like getting good news.' Sam, Will said, I've decided to make you a United States senator. Sam smiled broadly. Well, I guess I could choke that down. He half rose. You want to switch seats now? Sit down, Sam, Will laughed. I didn't say I was going to do it today. How long do I have to wait? A little over two years, if you're lucky. What do I have to do to get lucky? You have to get me elected president of the United States. Is that all? It's the only way you're going to pry me out of my Senate seat. Well, shoot, it might be worth it to get you out of the state of Georgia. How am I supposed to help you? I want you to manage my campaign. Sam looked at Will narrowly. You're still drunk from New Year's Eve, aren't you? I'm as sober as a Supreme Court justice. Sam looked around at his companions. Are you three planning to assassinate Joe Adams? Because if so, I'm calling the Secret Service right now. 
I can't tell you all the details until Friday, but around noon on Saturday on the Capitol steps, surrounded by friends and supporters, I'm going to announce. Sam stared at him speechless. Sam, Tim said, it's all right. He's not crazy. Say yes. Hell yes, Sam said. You want me to resign from the house? No, keep your seat. You're going to be based in Washington anyway, so you can make all your votes. If you get me elected, you can come to the White House with me. And after two years, you can run for my seat against whoever the next governor of Georgia appoints to replace me. Sam frowned a little. If our Democratic colleague gets elected to that office, who do you think he might appoint to fill your term? Will laughed. Okay, Sam, if I get elected and you want my seat right away, I'll do everything I can to get you appointed. If he won't do it or if the Republican beats him, then you stick with me. Jesus, Sam said. I don't think I can get a better deal than that. He leaned over and shook Will's hand. Welcome aboard, Will said. Your first job is to find us a national campaign headquarters without letting on to anybody that it's for me. Will scribbled a name on paper and handed it to Sam. This guy just built a new office building downtown that's renting. I think there's some storefront space available. We'll need a floor for offices, too. Feel him out. I know him a little, Sam said. I don't think he'll figure out that I'm doing it for you. Good. You've got to play this very closely until, say, Friday afternoon. If we can really get rolling this week, we'll have at least a few days jump on the competition. Who else knows about this? Sam asked. Just the people in this room and Kate. Does Joe Adams know about it? I can't answer that right now, Sam. You're going to have to trust me to do the right thing. Shoot, Will, I trust you, and I'll keep my mouth shut. As soon as I announce, you're going to have to get your own office organized to run pretty much without you. I'm going to keep you real busy. Woo-wee, Sam said. Sometimes your life just changes in the blinking of an eye. Will and his little core of a campaign staff worked steadily at adding names to their list of campaign people. They had now added from Will's computer files possible state chairmen in each of the 50 states, and they were working on county chairmen in large municipalities. They divided the names among themselves, each with a list to telephone before the announcement. Will's made up of those people who would be insulted if not asked directly by him, Sam's of people just below that level, and Tim or Kitty to call the rest. Late Tuesday afternoon, the vice president's office announced that Mrs. Joseph Adams had undergone a lumpectomy at Walter Reed Hospital. In Wednesday morning's Washington Post, a columnist reported that Vice President Adams, the leading candidate for the Democratic nomination, was considering not running in 2000 because of his wife's illness. The story was all over the evening network news shows, and the vice president's press secretary had declined comment. Adams was said to be spending a lot of time at Walter Reed with his wife. On the day of the surgery, Will dispatched two dozen yellow roses to the hospital in advance of the announcement, and early in the afternoon called the vice president at Walter Reed. How'd it go, Joe? Perfectly, Will. She's already recovering beautifully, and her doctor is pretty confident that she won't need further surgery. I'm glad to hear it, and so is Kate. How are you coming on your campaign plans? Well, we've been mostly confined to making lists of people we want, but Sam Merriweather has signed on as campaign manager. A great choice. I'm going to want some of your people as soon as you cut them loose, Will said. When can I start talking to them? Not until after my announcement on Friday, Adam said. And at this stage, there are only a couple who aren't already on my current staff. I hope you won't steal too many of those. You tell me if there's someone you don't want me to ask. I'll leave it up to them, Will. But you have to realize that this is going to come as a great disappointment for all of them. They've been looking forward to the campaign. Maybe you should give them a few days to get used to the idea. Sure, I will. I'd better get back to Sue. I'll tell her you called. Give her my love. 
Will hung up and went back to work. Ten minutes later, the phone rang. It's Senator Keel, his secretary said. Will picked up the phone and spoke to the Democratic leader of the Senate. Afternoon, George, he said. You okay, Will? You bet. What's up? I was a little annoyed that I didn't know Susan Adams was having surgery until I saw it on CNN. I don't think she wanted anybody to know until she was sure it went well. But you knew. Keel sounded a little peeved, but then he usually did. Sue called us over the weekend. She and Kate are... Will let his voice trail off. He had been about to say that they were close, and that wasn't exactly true. He knew what was coming next. What about this thing in the Post this morning? I haven't read all the Post yet. Which thing? The thing about Jill might be dropping out. Now Will was stuck. I heard about that, he said. Is it true? If it is, I'm sure you'll be hearing directly from Joe, Will said. If it's true, are you going to run? Tempting, isn't it? Sure is. You know damn well I'll run. What about you? No kidding. You never know, Will said. But if I do, you'll be among the first to know. I like you, Will, Keel said, and I'd hate to have to clean your clock in the primaries. He chuckled unconvincingly. I'd hate that too, George, Will laughed. Okay, see you later. Keel hung up. Will called Tim Coleman into his office. I want you to call Moss Mallet and commission a nationwide poll of likely Democratic voters and find out who they'd vote for in the primaries with Joe Adams out of the race. It's going to cost. We're going to have to have it anyway, and I'd like to have it before Joe withdraws and muddies the waters. Don't tell Moss anything and swear him to secrecy on who ordered the poll. Tell him we might let him release the results as his own poll if we like the results. And if we don't? He can reveal all in his memoirs. Thursday morning, Sam Merriweather called. I think I got that real estate I was interested in, he said guardedly. How much? More than I want to pay, but it's a prime location. Nail it down. I can't write a personal check for this, Will. I'm not a senator, you know. Nail it down with your personal word of Southern honor instead of money. Sam laughed. Yeah, that ought to do it. Tell him he can have a check on Saturday. Okay, hang on a minute, Will. Sam covered the telephone. Will waited impatiently. He had a lot to do. Sam came back on. Turn on CNN, he said. I'll hang on. Will took the remote control from the desk drawer and switched on the TV, which was already tuned to CNN. A reporter was standing on the White House lawn. Unusual for this president to cancel all his appointments without some sort of announcement from the White House press secretary, he was saying. The Israeli ambassador was told only after he had arrived for a meeting with the president. We'll keep you posted. What is that about? Sam asked. I don't have a clue. He canceled his morning appointments? All his appointments for the day, apparently. Tim Coleman and Kitty Conroy walked into Will's office and he pointed at the TV. We heard, Tim said. What's going on? Maybe we at war or something, Sam said over the phone. With whom? Will asked. We're not that mad at anybody, are we? I don't know, Sam said. Wait a minute, here comes more. Will turned back to the TV. The anchor woman was being handed a sheet of paper. We're going to the White House now for some sort of announcement by the President's press secretary. The camera switched to the White House briefing room, where the press secretary was approaching the podium. I have an announcement, and I will not take any, repeat any, questions. This morning, before dawn, the President's valet found the President on the floor of his bathroom in the White House family quarters, unconscious. He had apparently fallen and struck his head. He was seen by his doctor a few minutes later, and as a precaution he was taken by helicopter to Walter Reed Hospital, where he is undergoing tests. I do not expect to have any further announcement about the President's condition until around 3 o'clock this afternoon, when the test results are expected. The Vice President has been informed 
and is meeting with the White House staff as I speak. I stress that this is a normal procedure in the event of the President's illness or temporary incapacitation. I will speak to you again around 3 o'clock. He turned and walked off the stage and through a door as a chorus of questions was shouted at him. Holy shit, Sam Merriweather said. Will picked up the phone and called the vice president's private office number. The phone rang six times before someone picked it up, but no one spoke into the phone, although he could hear voices at the other end. Hello, Will said repeatedly. Finally, he recognized the VP's secretary's voice. Yes, she said. Catherine, it's Will Lee. Is the vice president available? Hello, Senator, she replied. I'm sorry, he's over at the White House. He's asked me to tell everyone calling this line that he won't return any calls today and probably not tomorrow, but I'll add your name to the list. I'm sure he'll get back to you as soon as possible. I understand, Catherine, and thank you. Can you tell me what's going on over there? I'm afraid I don't know any more than was said at the news conference. All I know is that the congressional leadership and some others are meeting with the vice president now. Thank you, Catherine. Goodbye. Will hung up and looked at Tim and Kitty. Joe is meeting with the congressional leadership now, and he won't be calling me back today. Senator, Tim said, has it occurred to you that if the president dies, Joe Adams might appoint you vice president? It crossed my mind, Will said. That would certainly change everything to do with our plans, Tim said. None of our planning would be wasted. I'll still be running this year. Tim looked at him oddly. Do you really think that if Adams became president, he'd decline to run? Will shrugged. I can't get into that. Just continue to work on the campaign as if nothing has happened. Tim and Kitty looked at each other, then at Will askance. Don't ask, Will said. At three o'clock, they gathered around the TV set and waited for the press conference. The White House press secretary strode onto the platform and took his place at the podium. A hush fell over the room. Same rules as this morning, the man said. Absolutely no questions. He took a sheet of paper from his inside coat pocket and read from it. Tests being conducted on the president at Walter Reed Hospital are not yet conclusive. The press office will issue bulletins as information comes in. The vice president will address the nation on television at 6 o'clock this evening, Eastern Time. I will be making no further statements between now and then. He turned and walked from the stage. An uproar ensued. Is the president conscious? Someone screamed, but the press secretary left the briefing room and closed the door behind him. This doesn't look good, Tim said. We've no way of knowing that, Will replied. We don't know what's happening. He picked up the phone and called a couple of people close to the president, but got nowhere. He hung up. Everybody is just shutting down, he said. We're just going to have to wait. The phone rang, and Will picked it up. Hello? It's Kate. I gather you're going to be late for dinner this evening. Quite possibly. Have you heard anything? Nothing. Nobody's talking. Neither have I. I'll see you when I see you. They both hung up. Will, Tim, Kitty, and Sam Merriweather were gathered in Will's office at 6 o'clock. An announcer intoned, Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the United States. Joe Adams came on screen looking calm and confident. He was sitting at a desk, but it looked like a studio set, not a real office. Good evening, he said. As you have no doubt already heard, the President suffered a fall early this morning and was taken to Walter Reed Hospital, where he underwent a battery of tests. The doctors there have determined that his fall was very likely the result of a stroke, and the concussion resulting from his fall has complicated his condition. As of this time, the President has not regained consciousness, and the prognosis is guarded. The First Lady is with him in the hospital. Upon receiving this news, I convened meetings with the leaders of both parties in Congress, the members of the Cabinet, the National Security Advisor, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. At that time, since the President has been at least temporarily incapacitated, 
All the necessary steps were taken to have the vice president assume the role of acting president with all the powers of that office. This is a day that I hoped would never come, but I have always worked to keep myself ready for the possibility. I will act as president until such time as his doctors feel the president is ready to assume his proper role again. I want to assure you that the business of government will continue without pause and that the interests of the American people are being looked after in the same way as they were yesterday. I intend during my stewardship to continue the policies of this administration as they have been formulated over the past seven years. Adams paused, then continued. Now I must tell you of a personal decision which was speeded by the events of today. As you will have heard, my wife underwent surgery yesterday at Walter Reed. The surgery was a success, and she is doing well. Her full recovery and her continued enjoyment of our life together is, of course, very important to me. Last year I let it be known that I would be a candidate for my party's nomination for the presidency, and many of you have been kind enough to offer your support. However, my wife's illness, combined with the incapacitation of the president, have caused me to make the irrevocable decision to withdraw from the race. I shall not be a candidate for my party's nomination. I shall instead devote myself to the work of acting president until the president recovers and to my wife's full recovery and future happiness. I know that there are other able men and women of my party who may have been kept from the presidential race because of my presence in it. I now leave the field open to them, and I encourage them to take their ideas to the American electorate with enthusiasm and without delay. In order to have the fullest and widest ranging discussion of the issues by all the qualified candidates, I have decided that I will not endorse another candidate before the Democratic Convention in August. At that time, depending on the circumstances, I may or may not choose to do so. I ask all members of my party to respect my wishes in this matter. Now it remains only for all of us to extend our heartfelt sympathies to the First Lady, to pray for the President's full and speedy recovery and return to office, and for me to ask for your prayers in my execution of the work ahead. Thank you, and good night. Will stared blankly at the TV screen. That went very well, Tim said. I think everybody is going to be reassured. Will, Kitty said, what's wrong? Will's consciousness returned to his surroundings. Nothing, he said. Joe's speech was good. And now, he thought, we have a president of the United States who has Alzheimer's disease. Will was discussing Joe Adams' TV address with Tim, Kitty, and Sam Merriweather when his phone buzzed. He picked it up. Yes? Senator, his secretary said, the president is on line one. What? She repeated herself. Will picked up the phone. Hello? Will, Joe Adams' voice said, I'm sorry I couldn't call you before now but you've no idea what it's been like around here today. Mr. President, Will replied, that's quite all right. I understand perfectly. You've got a scrambler on that phone, haven't you? Yes, sir. Turn it on. Will pressed the button. It's on, he said. Good. I don't want this to go any further. Adams took a deep breath. The President is in a deep coma. He may well be dying. I see, Will said, conscious that others were in the room. I took his doctor aside and had a frank talk with him. The president's chances of survival are poor in the short term. That means that I have to start planning right now. I want you to know that if the president dies, I'll appoint you as vice president. I would expect the Senate to confirm you without delay. I see, Will said. Will, are you alone? Not exactly. Oh. I was wondering about your reaction. Don't say anything else except, yes, you'll accept. Yes, of course I will. Good. 
My first impulse was to install you in my EOB office right away so we could get your feet on the ground as soon as possible. But on reflection, I think it would be better to wait until we have more word on the President's condition. The next few days are apparently going to tell the story. I see. And the President has a living will in which he requests a do-not-resuscitate order be issued in the event of something like this, so he won't be put on a respirator. I think you should go ahead with your campaign announcement just as you had planned. I hope being Vice President will give you a big leg up on the nomination. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your statement on television. That will make it much easier for me to proceed. Then go to it, boy. I will. Goodbye until later. I'll let you know if there's a change in the President's condition. Goodbye, Mr. President. Will hung up. Which President was that? Sam Wariweather asked. The new one, Will said. And what did he have to say that needed scrambling? I can't go into it, Will replied. He did say that we should proceed with the campaign announcement as planned. Great. And because of what he said on television, nobody can fault you for jumping in. Along with a number of others, Will said. Now we all have a lot of telephony to do, so let's get started. Will and Kate sat before a blazing fire in his Georgetown study. He had poured her a scotch and himself a bourbon. A lot happened today, he said. I expect so. Tell me about it. Biggest news first. Joe Adams called me right after his TV address and told me that if the president should die, he will appoint me as vice president. Kate began choking on her scotch. Will got up and clapped her on the back a couple of times. I'm sorry, she said. I took it pretty much the same way, but others were in the room and I couldn't let on. Is the president going to die? The prognosis is poor, Will said. You know, I was never his biggest fan, but he did a good job and he was nice to his wife. I hope when I go, someone will speak as well of me, Will laughed. Oh, Jesus, Kate said suddenly. What's wrong? If you're vice president, we'll have to move into Blair House, won't we? You know, I hadn't given that a thought. I believe you are acquainted with how much I hate moving. I believe I am. Maybe since this would only be for the year, we could stay here. I'd love it if we could, she said. The telephone rang and Will picked it up. Hello? Senator, it's Tim. I'm in a car about a few blocks from you with Leo Berg, who's agreed to run our advance operation. That's great news, Tim. Tell him I'm very pleased. You'll get to tell him yourself. We'll be there in five minutes. What for? I'll explain when we get there. We'll try not to interfere with your dinner. Tim hung up. We're about to have visitors. Tim Coleman and a man named Leo Berg, who used to run the White House Secret Service detail. I don't know what they want. The doorbell rang, and Will let the two men in. Senator, Berg said, thank you for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to it. I'm glad to have you aboard, Leo. Now what can I do for you two? Senator Tim tells me that there was an attempt on your life some years ago by a right-wing militia group. Will glanced at Tim sharply. I'm sorry, Senator, but I felt Leo should know about this. Will turned back to Berg. That's correct. It was a group calling themselves The Elect, and it was run by a retired general named Willingham. Both Willingham and the assassin died in the attempt. Because of that, Senator, Berg said, I want to ask for Secret Service support earlier than it would ordinarily be granted in a campaign. Do you really think that's necessary? Sir, these militia groups are in touch with each other. If you've annoyed one of them, you've probably annoyed more. I don't know, Leo, Will said. I don't want to ask for anything that other candidates won't be getting. They can make their own requests, Berg replied. Kate piped up. Listen to the man, Will, she said firmly. Will sighed. All right, I'm listening. I'd like to do a sort of preliminary survey for the service, Berg said. Then I'll contact them tomorrow to arrange for your protection from Saturday. And if you'll allow me to do this now, I think I can save you some intrusion by a lot of agents. 
Now, let me familiarize you with what's going to happen from the point of view of the Secret Service. And Mrs. Lee, I'm glad you're here to hear this, because it's going to affect you, too. I'm all ears, Kate said. The service will likely assign you a detail of 16 men, Senator. A dozen of them will work in four-man teams on eight-hour shifts, and they'll be with you wherever you go. The other four will float, depending on the circumstances. Mrs. Lee, there'll be six assigned to you, and two will remain with you at all times. I don't think that will be entirely necessary, Mr. Berg, Kate said. Since I work at the CIA, and that is a very secure environment, they can escort me to and from work, though. Good point, Berg said, taking notes. Is there a downstairs bedroom in the house? Yes, Kate replied. There's a maid's room at the rear. We don't have any live-in help, so it's empty. Good. There'll be two men in the house at all times, and that will allow them to take turns sleeping at night. Do they have to be in the house? Kate asked plaintively. I'm afraid so. Don't worry. They're trained to be as unobtrusive and discreet as possible. Senator, they'll be in your office as well and in the corridor outside. And anywhere either of you goes, you'll be driven in a service automobile, probably a Lincoln Town car. Leo, Will said, I want you to stress to the service that life on this street should not be disrupted in any way. You're dreaming, Senator, Berg replied. The first time something controversial happens in the campaign, you'll have two dozen press out there howling for a statement, and there'll be sightseers, too. Rather than have that happen, ask them to block off the street and allow only residents through, Will said. I mean it, Leo. I'm not going to let this disrupt my neighbors' lives. Tell the service I'll be intractable on this point. Well, I'll see what I can do, Berg said, making a note. Now, could I look around the house? Sure. Tim stood up. You go ahead and have dinner, he said. I'll show Leo around. Thank you, Tim, Will said. He and Kate went into the kitchen, and Kate took some steaks out of the fridge. So it begins, she said, and there was a little sadness in her voice. Will worked on a combination of Senate and campaign business through the morning. Then, just before lunch, his pollster, Moss Mallet, arrived and was shown into Will's office. It was tight, but I have the results of your poll, Moss said. Tell me about it. There's good news and there's bad news. Shoot. The good news is that nearly a third of likely Democratic voters have heard of you. Will winced. What's the bad news? The bad news is that less than a third of likely Democratic voters have heard of you. Moss handed him a sheet of paper. Will looked at the paper. Jesus, ten years in the Senate and I register with only 32 percent of Democrats? Moss handed him another sheet of paper. Relax, it's not as bad as it sounds. Only 46 percent know who George Keel is, and he's the Democratic leader in the Senate. So much for an informed electorate. Listen, Will, this could be a lot worse. This is the first national polling we've done, you know, and I've seen guys you'd think were well-known who hardly raised a blip. Well, that's comforting. Okay, here's something that is comforting, Moss said, handing him another sheet of paper. Of those likely Democratic voters who know both you and Keel, 41% would vote for Keel in a head-to-head -head race and 46 would vote for you. What about the other 13%? A pox on both your houses, more or less. Will sighed. Look, Will, if we can extend these numbers, it means that as people get to know you, they'll like you better than Keel. What more can you ask? Well, I guess you're right, Will said. I promise you Tom Black is going to love these numbers. I'll feel better if he does, Will said. Anything else? That's it for now. Later we'll do polling on issues, running mates, the works. But for right now, that tells you where you have to go. And where is that? On TV, my friend, and the more often the better. I'd recommend doing an immediate campaign designed to raise public awareness of you. Kitty stuck her head in the door. There's a report on CNN that George Keel will announce on Monday, she said. That's good news, Will replied. We'll beat him by 48 hours. Not really. Not unless we start spreading the word now. This means people are already hearing Keel's name and not yours. I've had a bunch of calls from press asking what you're going to do, and I've been coy. I think it's time to telegraph your entry into the race. Okay, do it. Tell them I'll have an announcement to make tomorrow, and you'll get back to them on time and place. Start angling for the Sunday morning TV shows, too. 
Moss stood up. I've got to run, Will. I'm going to put together a polling proposal for the next month and send it to Tim. Let me know what you want to do. Will stood up and shook his hand. Thanks, Moss. I'll be in touch. Will stood on the Capitol steps in the still, cold winter air in bright sunshine, surrounded by a busload of Georgians and a herd of television cameras. Good morning, he said. During the past few days, we've seen American history take a sudden turn. The sudden and tragic illness of our president and the withdrawal of the vice president from the presidential race have cast the 2000 election in a whole new light, and a whole new slate of candidates is now stepping forward. I am pleased to be among the first of them. I'm here to announce my candidacy for president of the United States. The little crowd went as wild as a little crowd could. Will waited until the cheering began to subside, then continued. And I'm here to tell you why I'm running. He paused for a moment, then took a deep breath. This would be the sound bite that would be on every news program that evening. I'm running because I see my country torn apart by partisan wrangling. I'm running because I see the political parties jockeying for petty advantage instead of doing what we were sent to this building to do. He gestured over his shoulder at the Capitol. I'm running because I want to lead this country toward a new center, a new center where every voice can be heard, Democrat and Republican, a new center where conciliation and consensus can overcome ideology of any stripe and take us on toward new heights in the new millennium to come. We are a diverse country, but one idea has always driven us. We are all in this together. We'll pause for more cheering, smiling broadly, knowing that it was at this point that the TV news shows would move on to something else. I hold out my hand to every American, not just every Democrat, but every Republican and every Independent in this land. I tell you that together we can do anything, that from a new center we can take this country anywhere we want to go. We'll step back from the microphones, waving both hands and smiling. While the applause raged, he shook the hands of those around him. Then he stepped forward to the microphones again. I want to introduce you to some of the people who will be making this journey with me. First among equals is my wife, Kate. He held out his hand. She took it and joined him for a moment. You're going to be seeing a lot more of me than you will of Kate because she has important work to do here in Washington, and I'm not going to take her away from it wouldn't be good for the country. He introduced Sam Merriweather, Tim Coleman, and Kitty Conroy. Finally, I want to introduce you to someone who hasn't decided yet whether to vote for me. I'm determined that this campaign will follow the letter and the spirit of the laws governing campaigns, and that the actions we take will not just be legal, but ethical. With that in mind, I've asked former Federal Appeals Court Judge Mason Rutledge to be an objective arbiter of all our actions. Judge Rutledge has had a long and highly distinguished career at the bar, in the Justice Department, and in the courts. He has been, since his retirement from the bench, a professor of constitutional law and legal ethics at Harvard Law School. He will remain there during the campaign, but he will be on call when we need him to help us make the right decisions. And if he feels we haven't, he'll be free to call a press conference and tell you why. Judge Rutledge, he beckoned the tall, handsome man forward. Rutledge faced the cameras for only a moment. I'm here, he said, because I was impressed with Senator Lee's insistence on running a clean campaign, and I'm happy to help him do it. I expect I'll decide sometime before the first Tuesday in November whether I'll vote for him. He stepped back. Will came back to the microphones. Now, we're going to invite you all to join us on a brief tour of our new national headquarters. There are buses here for those of you who need a ride, and the rest can follow. We won't keep you long, and the next time I see all you folks watching on TV, I'll be asking you for money. Loud laughter. Preceded by two Secret Service agents, 
Will boarded a bus with his campaign workers and chatted with them while they were driven to the downtown office building that housed the headquarters. Will, Kate, Sam, Tom, Kitty, and Judge Rutledge sat in the Lee kitchen and ate hamburgers while they watched the evening news and Will's performance before the cameras. They made the top, or near the top, of every newscast. It went beautifully, Will, Tom Black said. I can cut at least three good commercials out of the footage we got. I was very impressed, said Judge Rutledge, who was staying the night. It was a good announcement, not too long. I hope I can make not too long the hallmark of my campaign, Will said. Kate spoke up. And I'm grateful, sir, for having been publicly let off the hook so early in the campaign. I promised and I meant it, Will said. Tom, what's next? Buy some long underwear, Tom said. We're going to New Hampshire. Zeke Tennant woke habitually at dawn, and Sundays were no exception. He left the bed gently so as not to wake his sleeping wife, Bonnie. He got out of his flannel pajamas and into long underwear, jeans, a flannel lumberjack shirt, and heavy socks and boots, then tiptoed out of the room. Zeke's sixteen-year-old son, Danny, was leaning against the inside of the front door, peering out of a narrow slat at the world outside. "'Morning, Daddy,' he said. "'Morning, Danny. What kind of night do we have?' I thought I heard a noise, but I couldn't spot anything with the night goggles. Heard a helicopter, though, I'm sure of that. Must have been two, three miles off to the west. Yeah, they come around with their heat detection systems trying to catch one of us out the house at night. We had a couple of inches of snow, but it stopped. You keep watch, and I'll get you some breakfast, then you can go to bed. Okay, Daddy. Zeke threw some homemade sausage in the pan and got some eggs from the gas-operated refrigerator, then sliced some of Bonnie's bread. A few minutes later, he set two plates on the table by the front window, and they sat down to eat. "'That mirror plastic stuff on the outside of the windows was an ace idea,' Danny said. "'Nobody can see in. "'Yeah, there was a time when we wouldn't dare sit down in front of the window like this.' The window was made of steel and the panes of armored glass. As the sun came up, the scenery outside took on a gray cast from the mirrored material. They could see down the mountain road some five miles to the highway. Zeke had chosen the site to provide an early warning. "'You going to church?' Danny asked. "'You know we can't do that right now. I'm going over to Harve Shelton's place for a little meeting, though.' You'll be okay here. The younger kids can keep a lookout, and I don't think they're going to try anything in broad daylight. And if they do, they'll have to deal with the landmines. You feed the dogs and let them in. Daddy, Danny said hesitantly, is anybody for sure looking for you right now? You can never tell, Zeke said. I got a failure to appear warrant out on me in Georgia. They can always use that for an excuse. But that's ten years old, isn't it? The boy asked. All they need is an excuse to come up here legal, and if they want to, they'll do it. How long you reckon we could hold out against them? Danny asked. Zeke looked at him sharply. As long as we have to, boy, you remember that. Yes, sir, Danny said. Zeke finished his breakfast and took a turn around the house. There were three bedrooms and two baths, a little office for himself, a kitchen and a large family room. He and his family and co-militiamen had built the log cabin themselves, and not from a kit. They were completely self-sufficient. The place had been built so that no small arms could ever penetrate. It would take heavy military weapons to breach the walls, and the feds couldn't do that for fear the media would find out. And if they did anyway, he had two M60 machine guns with mounts in the turret. Zeke got into a shoulder holster and jammed in his 9 millimeter automatic with two extra clips. He put a smaller automatic in his coat pocket, then strapped another to his ankle. He put on the sheepskin coat Bonnie had made for him and walked into the connecting utility building. He took the three-wheeler, not enough snow for the snowcat, and too much for the pickup. He popped the steel garage door, started the engine, and drove out. The door closed automatically behind him. 
the two German shepherds on the front porch lifted their heads and watched him go. Keeping a sharp eye out, he roared down a well-beaten trail, scattering powdered snow in his wake, and plunged into the woods. He drove for nearly two miles along the trail, then stopped at a heavy fence topped with razor wire and whistled loudly. A moment later he heard another whistle, and a section of the fence swung open. He gunned the engine and continued toward the cabin ahead of him. The garage door was open. He parked inside and pressed the button to close it. He walked into the house, hung his coat on a hook in the mudroom, and went into the living room. Half a dozen men greeted him. "'Hey, Zeke,' Harv said. "'You had breakfast?' "'Oh, yeah,' he said. "'We just finished some eggs benedict and champagne,' Harv said. "'Too bad you're late.' Everybody laughed. Zeke lowered himself into a chair by the fireplace. "'I could use a second cup,' he said. "'Mary?' Harv shouted. "'Get Zeke some black coffee, will you?' "'Coming!' a female voice said from the kitchen. A plump, pretty woman in her late thirties brought in the coffee. "'Morning, Zeke,' she said. "'Morning, Mary, and thanks.' "'Mary,' Harv said, "'if you'll excuse us now, we've got some business to discuss.' "'Bye, gentlemen,' Mary said, closing the door behind her. "'Well,' Zeke said, "'what did it come to?' Harv grinned. "'A little over a million eight, he said. "'I guess you want yours now.' "'I reckon I do,' Zeke said. "'I reckon everybody does. "'Did you have to launder it?' Harv shook his head. "'No, nah, it was all fresh out of three or four banks, "'a good mix of denominations, old and new bills.' I put away some bundles of sequential serial numbers, nearly half a million. Why didn't you fence it? Too soon. Everybody in the Northwest has heard that an armored car got hit. The feds are everywhere. We'll keep it a year or two, then sell it to somebody who can get it out of the country. Makes sense, Zeke said. Harv went to the wood box beside the fireplace and removed six bundles, tossing one to each man. A quarter of a million each, he said. I took my organizational fee and some expenses off the top. Fair enough, Zeke said, examining the bundle. The money was tightly packed and shrink-wrapped, then wrapped in brown paper. Don't go splashing out that stuff, Harv said. The feds will be sniffing around, and we don't want some citizen reporting that he took a lot of cash and payment for something. Let it cool off for a while. The other men nodded. Harv glanced at his watch and picked up a remote control. The satellite TV came on. They were on mountain time, and the Sunday morning political shows were coming on. "'Take a look at this guy,' Harv said. "'Any of you know him?' "'I know him,' Zeke said. "'That's right. You're from Georgia. What do you think about him?' "'I think he's everything that's wrong with this country, all wrapped up in one man.' Maybe we should turn our attention to him. It's been a while. You better believe it, Zeke growled. Some friends of mine tried to take him out ten years ago when he was first running for the Senate, but it all blew up in their faces. Was this Willingham and the elect? Harv asked. Yeah, he and another guy bought it and the rest scattered, including me. That guy has been too hot to touch since then. What do you think about now? I think if he got elected president, things would get worse for us. Christ knows I don't have any use for Republicans, but I'll be goddamned if I want another Democrat running things, especially this one. Well, we're refinanced now, Harv said. You want to take this on? It would be my privilege, Zeke said. I'll take 10000 from each of you for expenses. The others nodded and began breaking open their packets of bills. Zeke watched the image on the screen. He's got it coming, he said. Will stood at the factory gate, freezing his ass off in eight inches of fresh snow, his chest racked with coughing and his nose streaming, and wondered why he had ever wanted to do this. His shoes were soaking wet, his overcoat was not heavy enough for a New Hampshire winter, and his new long underwear clung damply to his body, making him colder instead of warmer. All he could think of was bourbon and a roaring fire. It was five o'clock and already dark. 
This was his eighth appearance of the day, and he still had two to go. Two Secret Service agents lurked a few feet away. Will had demanded that they back off. The whistle blew, and a moment later, men and women began streaming out of the plywood plant, gathering their winter clothes about them. Will saw they were all wearing snow boots. Why hadn't somebody thought of that? Hi, he said, taking off a thin glove and thrusting a bare hand at an approaching man. I'm Will Lee, and I'm running for president. The man stopped, but didn't take the offered hand. You a Republican or a Democrat? I'm a Democrat, Will replied, smiling. Then go fuck yourself, the man said, and continued on his way. Will's instinct was to aim a kick at the man's ass, but a woman was standing in front of him shaking his hand. Hey, she said, I heard you say something at the football game last night. I liked it, and I might vote for you. I really appreciate that, Will said. I like that stuff about the middle. The new center, Will corrected. Good luck to you. And to you, she said, then went on her way. Will got a couple of dozen people to acknowledge his presence before the crowd was gone, and he was left standing in the snow. A campaign volunteer, a college student from South Georgia, handed out the last of her leaflets and came over to him. Senator, you look awful, she said. I feel awful, he replied. I hope the van is running. I'm freezing, too. I'll get it started, she said cheerfully, and ran ahead. Will trudged through the wet snow, feeling like a character out of Dr. Shivago. An agent opened the door for him, then got into the back seat. The van was cold-soaked, and the girl was having trouble getting it started. Finally, it came to life, and a rush of icy air came out of the vents. "'We're going to end up in a snowdrift, and they won't find us till spring,' Will said. "'How do people live in weather like this?' "'It ain't Georgia, is it?' the girl said." Freeze your buns off. As she turned a corner, the van began to move sideways. Oh, shit, she said under her breath as she spun the wheel into the skid. She was too late. The van slid broadside into a large SUV idling at the curb. I'll take care of this, the agent said, opening the rear door. No, I'll do it, Will said. You stay out of it. He waited while the girl inched the van forward so that he could get the door open. Thank God there was no TV crew, he thought. A large man was climbing out of the vehicle while a woman waited in the front seat. It was our fault entirely, Will said, preempting the man's coming outburst. My driver has never driven in snow before, and I want to make this right. What do you think the damage is? The man stopped in his tracks and turned to look at his damaged car. I reckon a good fifteen hundred bucks he said. Will dug a checkbook and a pen out of his pocket. Well, let's make it two thousand. Body work is expensive these days. Fifteen hundred will do it, the man said wearily. Make it out to Harry Hoskins. Will wrote the check and handed it to the man. I'm really very sorry, he said. I know what an inconvenience this is going to be for you, and I wish there was something more I could do. He stuck out a hand. I'm Will Lee, and I'm running for president. I hope this won't cost me your vote. The man laughed. Senator, you're the fifth candidate I've met today. There's two in the supermarket over there. Good luck to you. He got into his car and drove away. Will climbed back into the van, which was now a few degrees warmer than the outside air. Let's go. The girl was practically in tears. I'm so sorry, Senator. I don't know what happened. Wasn't your fault, Marianne, he said, suddenly remembering her name. Make a note to rent cars with snow tires from now on. Yes, sir, she said. Will sighed and fell fast asleep. He was jolted awake as the van struck the curb. We're here, Marianne said. It's the Kiwanis Club meeting in the basement of the town hall, right there, she pointed. I'll leave the engine running. Will struggled out of the van. There was a man waiting at the front door of the hall to take him inside. Will peeled off his light topcoat and stamped the snow off his feet, leaving a puddle behind him. 
He was shown to the head table, shaking hands all the way, and a bowl of hot soup was put in front of him. He got that down gratefully, then started on the fried chicken, which wasn't bad. By the time he was ready to speak, he was warm, if damp, and very sleepy. He missed his first cue, then hopped up and went to the microphone. He opened his mouth to speak, but nothing came out. A man stood up and tapped the microphone, which was on. Will tried again, and this time he managed a squeaking noise. He had no voice, whatever. He grabbed a notebook from his pocket, scribbled something on it, and handed it to the man at his left. The man read it, stood up, and leaned into the microphone. It says my name is Will Lee, and I'm running for president, and I've just lost my voice. The crowd roared with laughter. As Will was making his way out of the hall, mutely shaking hands, he found his way blocked by a large man. "'What size shoe do you wear?' the man asked. Puzzled, Will tried to speak, then got out his pad and wrote down 10D. The man looked at the pad, nodded, and stepped away. Will was back in the van before he realized that the man who wanted to know his shoe size was the same man whose car his van had struck earlier. It was after ten o'clock before Will got back to the depressing motel the campaign had booked him into. Kitty Conroy was waiting for him. How'd it go? she asked. Will tried to speak and couldn't. Oh, my God, Kitty said, helping him off with his coat. You've got laryngitis? Will nodded wearily and headed for the bed. Kitty stopped him. Oh, no, you don't, she said. Not in those clothes. She began stripping them off him, aided by Mary Ann. The Secret Service agent stood by the door, watching morosely. We'll get you home first thing tomorrow, Kitty said. You're no good to yourself if you can't talk. Will shook his head. Not yet, he mouthed. All right. We'll see if you can talk tomorrow. Then we'll decide. There's only one more day to go anyway. The door to the room opened and another Secret Service agent walked in, carrying a large parcel. This was just delivered, he said. I've already checked it out. Puzzled, Will opened the box and found a thick winter parka with a fur collar, a pair of snow boots, and a hunter's woolen cap with ear flaps. There was a note in an envelope, and Will opened it. The letterhead said, Harry's Menswear. Dear Senator Lee, it read, we don't like to have our candidates die on this in New Hampshire, so please accept the enclosed with my compliments. You not only live, but you'll fit right in. It was signed Harry Hoskins, the fellow whose car you bumped into earlier this evening. Will fell into bed already asleep. The next morning, still unable to speak, he wore his new winter clothes to the airport. The anchorman gazed into the camera, rustled the useless papers in his hand, and read from the teleprompter to the national television audience of the primary night special. The polls will be closing shortly in New Hampshire, and when they do, we'll tell you what our exit polls are showing. The weather was unexpectedly good today, and the turnout has been heavy. While there are half a dozen names on the ballot, three are expected to take the lion's share of the vote. House Democratic leader George Keel is expected to win outright with something more than 50% of the vote. Then Senator Mark Haynes, the firebrand liberal from Nebraska, and Senator Will Lee, the moderate from Georgia, appear to be running about neck and neck for second place and are expected to take in the region of 18% each. That could change in Senator Haynes' favor because Senator Lee had to fly back to Washington with a galloping case of the flu four days ago, so he couldn't be around for the home stretch. Let's go to Lisa Helford in Manchester for an update. A young woman in fashionable ski clothes appeared on the screen. Thanks, Bob, she said. Immediately the screen was filled with shots of people lining up at the poles, and she continued voiceover. The unexpectedly heavy turnout was certainly due to the blue skies and warmer temperatures in New Hampshire, after weeks of weather that would be considered really filthy by anyone not from New Hampshire. The candidates braved it as best they could, and one, Senator Will Lee of Georgia, fell by the wayside, done in by the New Hampshire winter. 
An amateur cameraman caught him at a Kiwanis Club meeting five days ago at the moment when his health failed him. The shaky screen and tinny sound of a home video camera showed Will approaching the dais, trying to speak, then scribbling something on a notepad. When the club's president read what Will had written, the room erupted in laughter. We caught a glimpse of Senator Lee at the local airport the following morning as he beat his retreat, and he seemed a lot better prepared for the weather after a sympathetic Kiwanian who owns a men's store got him kitted out. An image of Will in his brand-new winter clothes filled the screen as he trudged across a snowy ramp to his airplane, turned and waved, only his eyes visible between his parka's fur collar and his cap, the ear flaps of which were tied under his chin. When the camera returned to the reporter, she was laughing. "'That's it from New Hampshire, Bob,' she said. "'Back to you.' Bob Blakely, the anchorman, was laughing, too, when he came back on. "'Thanks, Lisa. Now let's go to our commentator, Bill Varner, who has been talking to New Hampshire voters for days. Bill, was that the height of fashion in New Hampshire last week?' The camera panned to a desk where Varner sat. Bob, that's the way you have to look up there if you want to survive the primary. Actually, Will Lee's early departure from campaigning may have hurt him badly. What I'm predicting now is that Will Lee is going to lose at least five or six points out of this, and most of those votes are going to go to George Keel, who will fatten his majority in the state. This could actually have the effect of derailing the Lee campaign, since the New Hampshire primary has been for so long a harbinger of things to come at the convention later in the year. So if Mark Haynes does a little better than expected, we might very well see Will Lee withdrawing from the race after he gets his voice back. The camera went back to the anchorman. If that happens, Bill, what's the overall effect on the race going to be? Well, Bob, unless some dark horse appears from nowhere and turns on Democratic voters, George Keel is going to be the out-and-out frontrunner for the nomination. Keel is a more conservative Democrat than Will Lee, though hardly a right-winger, and Haynes is so liberal that nobody gives him much of a chance for the nomination. The most he could hope for is a shot at vice president when he gets to the convention. So you think Will Lee could really be out? Could happen, Bob. And it would be a pity, because I think a lot of Democrats around the country would find him an attractive candidate when they got to know him. Well, it's all very interesting, Bill, and the polls are closing in New Hampshire in just a minute. So after the break, we'll come back with our exit polling and see if Will Lee is going to be able to manage to stay in this race. The cameras went to commercial. Will, Kate, and a dozen of Will's staff sat around a large screen television set at campaign headquarters. Will could talk again now, though he had been advised not to unless absolutely necessary. This doesn't look good, Tim Coleman said. We sure could have used those four days. Will nodded. I wish we had some poll results of our own, Tim said. We're about to get some, Will whispered. Bob Blakely came back on camera, sitting at a V-shaped desk with three other people, among them Bill Varner. Our director is telling us that we're going to have these exit poll results flashed on our big screen behind us, and none of us has seen them yet. So this will be hot off the wire. He turned toward the screen behind him. Here they come. Bill, you want to take us through this? Sure, Bob. I... Varner stopped talking. Wait a minute, here, are you guys in the control booth running a game on us? He pressed a finger to his earpiece. This is really what's come in? He listened again. All right, here we go. Now remember, these numbers are from exit polls, and we won't have the real numbers until midnight, but what we've got here is a major near upset. Our exit polls are showing Congressman George Keel, not with more than 50% of the vote as predicted, but with only 41%. Next, and this is stunning, I don't know what happened, is Senator Will Lee of Georgia with 36%, and after him, Senator Mark Haynes with only 8% of the vote. You think there might be something wrong with our exit polling bill? The anchorman asked. Varner had his finger to his earpiece again. I'm hearing from New Hampshire that our people are standing behind these numbers, that they're real. And what is this going to mean, Bill? 
It means that Will Lee is solidly in this race. He's still behind, but if these numbers hold, then something has happened in New Hampshire that we never expected. If he can bring in numbers like this while in bed with the flu for the last four days of the campaign, then he may really have something going for him. Back at campaign headquarters, Will was being hugged by Kate and pummeled on the back by Tim Coleman and Kitty Conroy. Let's wait for the real results, he managed to whisper. It was midnight now, and 98% of the ballots in New Hampshire had been counted, confirming the network's exit polls. Bob Blakely and Bill Varner still sat at their desk. Bill, Blakely said, this has certainly been a big night for Will Lee. To what do you attribute this big surprise? Bob, we've put together some footage taken earlier today when the polls were still open, and we asked people who voted for Lee why they did. Let's listen. A woman carrying a small child appeared on camera. I met him a couple of times early in the campaign, she said, and I just liked him. And when I saw that thing from the Kiwanis Club, I just laughed until I cried. I really felt for him. An elderly man came on camera. I heard that his car ran into another fellow's car right before that Kiwanis meeting, and Mr. Lee wrote him a check on the spot. That impressed me. A young woman's face appeared. Well, he's charming, isn't he? He gives an honest answer to a question, and he looks you in the eye. He doesn't talk like a politician, even when he can't talk. Another woman. Listen, I've had the flu myself, and I know how bad it can be, but he kept going until he couldn't go anymore, and I admire that. The camera went back to the studio. Well, Bob, I don't know. I guess the folks in New Hampshire just like the man. Bob, we haven't been able to get George Keel to join us, but we've got Jim Thomas, Keel's campaign manager, so let's go over to Keel campaign headquarters. A bespectacled man appeared on the screen. Jim, what happened up there today? Well, Bob, we won the damn primary. That's what happened. But you didn't get a clear majority, as you had been predicting you would. Why not? Listen, it was you guys who predicted that, not us. We're just glad to have the victory. Do you think you would have won if Will Lee had had those last four days to campaign? Sure I do. I think we would have beat him even worse. Thanks, Jim. The camera went back to the studio, and Bob Blakely turned to the camera. Well, we've got just one more stop to make before we're done. Even though George Keel got the most votes, the big winner in New Hampshire seems to be Will Lee. Will appeared on the big screen from his campaign headquarters, smiling. Senator, your staff has told us that you can't say much because of your delicate voice, so give us just some idea of how you feel tonight, and we'll let you go. Will's eyebrows shot up. Well, Bob, he croaked, I think I can win this nomination if I can just get sick enough. Republican Senator Frederick Wallace of South Carolina picked up the remote control and switched off the television, still laughing. His companion, Jeb Stewart Calhoun, the junior senator from South Carolina, took a swig of his bourbon. Well, Freddie, what do you think of that? Wallace puffed on his cigar. I think Will Lee kicked George Keel's ass. That's what I think. And what do you think that means for us? I think it means we ought to be worried. Jesus, Freddie, why? You think we have anything to fear from Will Lee? Jeb, didn't you listen to what those New Hampshire voters had to say? Sure I did, and it didn't make any sense to me. Well, I guess that's why you're not president. Those people like Will Lee, which shouldn't have come as such a surprise to me since I like him myself. Think about it. How many likable presidential candidates have we had since Jack Kennedy died? Ronald Reagan was likable. Right, right. Who else? Well, Bill Clinton, although I personally hated the son of a bitch. Anybody else? Calhoun screwed up his aging brow. Not that I can think of. And what else do Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton have in common? I can't think of a thing. They both were elected to two terms, you horse's ass. Oh, yeah. Now tell me, Jeb, who would you rather run against, George Keel or that nice-looking, charming fellow who just kicked George's ass? Oh, I see your point. 
But just because he did well in New Hampshire doesn't mean that'll translate into getting the nomination. Jeb, the folks in New Hampshire are the most hard-bitten, skeptical, cantankerous voters in this country. Just about every one of them has met two or three presidents and a whole lot of candidates. If Will Lee can charm them, he can charm anybody. Calhoun drank some more bourbon. Well, what are we going to do about it? Is the man clean? Nobody's clean, Jeb. You above all people ought to know that. Calhoun reddened. Then there must be something we can get on him. I've known him since he came to work for Ben Carr, Wallace said, and he's as clean as they come. He puffed on his cigar, then smiled a small smile. That's not to say he's clean, though. You know something I don't, Freddy? Jeb, I know a hell of a lot you don't, and don't you ever forget it. Come on, Freddy. What have you got on him? There's a woman in Will Lee's past, Wallace said. A very beautiful woman, in fact. Very telegenic. Tell me about it. Wallace got up and poured himself another bourbon, then settled again in the winged chair before the fireplace. It goes back a good ten years, he said, back when Will was first running for Ben Carr's seat. He got himself roped into defending a young fellow down in Will's home county. The fellow was charged with raping and murdering a colored woman. Will's client had this very beautiful girlfriend. She sat there in court every day and knocked everybody's eye out. I guess she knocked Will's eye out, too, because he ended up screwing her. Calhoun leaned forward. Let me get this straight. This woman was the girlfriend of Lee's client, and he screwed her? Not only was she the client's girlfriend, but she was the principal defense witness. She was the client's alibi. Lee screwed a witness in the trial, his own witness? Well, it was a little more complicated than that. Will was still single at the time, although he'd been seeing Kate rule for a while. But they had busted up at that particular moment, and the client's girlfriend had dumped a boyfriend, too. So technically, Will and this girl were free, white, and 21. And the girl had already completed her testimony in the trial. What about the boyfriend? Did he get off? Nope. He was convicted of first-degree murder and rape and sentenced to die. And did he? Not yet, but soon. Wallace permitted himself a small grin. Unless he gets himself a first-class appeals lawyer. Has he got any grounds for appeal? How about his lawyer was screwing his girlfriend and allowed him to get convicted so the two of them could go on screwing each other? He said this was ten years ago and he's about to die. That means he's already exhausted the appeals process. Didn't this come up before? It did, but it was mishandled by a stupid lawyer. What that boy needs is a better lawyer. The phone rang and Wallace picked it up. Who is it? Freddy, it's Eft Afton. How are you? Just a minute. He covered the phone. You get on it, Jeb. I've got to take this call. He watched until Calhoun was out of the room, then returned to the phone. I guess we got a little surprise tonight, boy. I guess so, Afton said. I'm not worried, though. I'd love to run against a closet liberal like Will Lee. Wallace sighed deeply. You just don't get it, do you, boy? Huh? The man you want to run against is George Keel. But he's the conservative. If that liberal tag ain't going to stick to Will Lee, he's got some credentials on national defense and a good record on the budget, and that ain't all. Folks just naturally like him, and that can't be said of you. I mean, the hardcore is going to be with you all the way, but you're going to have to attract the independents and a lot of Democrats if you want to get elected. Come on, Freddy, I've been toning down the rhetoric, or at least confining it to preaching to the converted. Eft, face it, you lack charm, and Will doesn't. Trust me, you want to run against Keel. Well, I guess I'm not going to have much to say about who the Democrats pick, am I? Maybe not, but I am, Wallace replied. What do you mean? I got a few irons in the fire. I'm going to get George Keel the Democratic nomination, and nobody's ever going to know how it happened. Wallace hung up the phone without another word and began sipping his bourbon again. Will, my boy, he said into the fire, you're never going to know what hit you. Thank you. 
Zeke Tennant got down from the pickup truck at the dark crossroad, then turned to his son. You take care of things now. I don't want to have to worry about anything, and you won't be hearing from me for a while. Don't you worry, Daddy. We'll all be fine, and we'll wait to hear from you. Might be weeks or months. Don't you worry. I'd never worry about you, Daddy. Zeke got his duffel out of the pickup, then handed the boy his wallet. Keep this for me. He leaned over and let his son kiss him on his cheek, then closed the truck door and watched as the boy made a U-turn and drove away into the early morning hours. Half an hour later, with the sun peeking over the horizon, the bus stopped in response to the flashlight Zeke was waving, and he got on and bought a ticket from the driver. Zeke stowed his duffel in the overhead rack, then settled into his seat and tried to get some sleep. Fifteen hours later, Zeke disembarked at the Las Vegas bus terminal and found a cab. Ten minutes later, he got out at a modest apartment complex and walked through the parking lot to the building nearest the street. He let himself into the ground-level apartment, kicked the accumulated junk mail out of the way, and looked around. It seemed to be as he had left it, a furnished two-bedroom unit with one bedroom set up as an office. He took his duffel into the bedroom, unlocked the closet with his key, and pushed the hanging clothes aside to reveal a wall safe with an electronic keypad. He punched in the code, opened the safe, took out a wallet and checkbook, and put them into his hip pocket. Then he opened the duffel, dug to the bottom, and began stacking bundles of bound U.S. currency into the safe, keeping a couple of bundles for immediate use. Zeke took a shower, shaved off his beard, except for the mustache, then packed the clothes he wore into a garbage bag for disposal later. He got dressed in garments he had left in the apartment, then poured himself a bourbon and turned on the TV. He was now Harry Grant. Eight months before, Zeke had taken the same bus to Las Vegas, carrying only what he wore and his duffel, which concealed $100,000. His first stop had been at a barber shop, where he had gotten a haircut and a shave, leaving his handlebar mustache. He had then rented this apartment, paying a year's rent in advance. He had bought some nice, middle-of-the-road businessman's clothes, then had taken himself to a casino, where he had bought $5,000 in chips from one window, then more from another. Carrying the chips in a tray, he had sat down at a blackjack table and started to play. Zeke was a card counter and a good one. Playing carefully, never winning too much, he had nearly doubled his stake before he attracted the attention of a pit boss who watched from a discreet distance. Zeke was untroubled by this attention. He lost some, then won some more. When he tired of blackjack, he headed for the backroom poker games, buying still more chips along the way. He played until the wee hours, and when he had accumulated a little over $50,000 in chips, both bought and won, he cashed in everything, asking for a casino check. He had just laundered some money. The following morning, he had taken the casino check and opened a bank account. Even in Vegas, a bank looked at you askance if you came in with that much cash. Over the time he had spent in Vegas, he had made other deposits— always under $5,000, to avoid filling out any federal forms. Now, back in Vegas, he had a healthy bank balance, plus what he had brought with him. He ordered in a pizza and a six-pack of beer and spent the evening watching TV. The following morning, he began running errands. He already had a Nevada driver's license and a visa card from his earlier visit. Now he had some business cards printed. Harry Grant computer consultant, hardware and software. He bought a decent computer and a telephone answering machine and had them sent to the apartment. Then he went car shopping. He liked cars, and he was going to enjoy this. He visited half a dozen dealerships. Then he found a two-year-old Lexus ES300, the smallest model. It had less than 20,000 miles on it. He bargained hard, then wrote the man a check and waited while he called the bank. He drove away, pleased with his purchase. The car was luxurious and comfortable, but it didn't look all that different from a Toyota, so it was fairly anonymous. That night he gambled, losing a little this time, 
Then he picked up a prostitute at the casino bar and took her back to the apartment. She called herself Cherry. She looked around carefully. "'You're not going to give me any problems, are you, Harry?' she asked. "'Of course not, baby. We're just going to have a drink and ball. Nothing weird about Harry Grant.' She was compliant, even enthusiastic, and Zeke enjoyed himself. When they were both spent and she was getting dressed, Zeke led her into the office. "'I want you to do a little favor for me,' he said. "'I thought I already did that,' she replied. "'Don't worry, there's no work involved, and it's worth another twenty. "'What do I have to do?' she sighed. "'Just a minute,' he said. "'He wrote some words on a sheet of paper and handed them to her. "'I just want you to record an answering machine message for me. "'You've got a very nice voice.' "'Okay.' "'Zeke pressed the button, and she read. "'You've reached Harry Grant Computer Consultants,' she breathed. We're on the line with other customers, but if you'll leave a message, someone will get right back to you. Very good, Zeke said. Now it sounds like I'm a company instead of just one guy. Glad to help. You going to give me cab fare? He handed her a fifty. Here, baby, you've been great. You want to do it again? I'm available, she said, handing him a card. Zeke waved goodbye to her and went to bed. Before he left Vegas, Harry Grant was going to be a real guy known to lots of people. Will let himself into the Georgetown house. A Secret Service man stuck his head out of the bedroom under the stairs and waved hello. Will waved back and tiptoed up the stairs, carrying his luggage. Although he had become accustomed to the constant presence of the agents on the road, he had not yet gotten used to having them in the house but then he hadn't been at home much the past few months. Light showed from under the bedroom door, and he opened it. His wife looked up from her book. "'Hello, sailor,' she said. "'Like to give a girl a good time?' She let a strap of her nightgown fall off a shoulder. Will dropped his bags, shucked off his clothes, and climbed naked into bed with her, while she slipped the nightgown over her head. There was no talk, just immediate lovemaking. When they were finished, he lay with his head on her breast. "'God, I've missed you,' he said. "'A politician can't get laid on the campaign trail anymore, you know. Bill Clinton screwed it up for all of us.' "'Well, gee,' she replied. "'A politician's wife can do very well for herself, what with three shifts of Secret Service men in the house. Those boys are always randy.' He bit her on a nipple. So, how was it? Could have been worse, I guess. At least I didn't get sick. I get the impression from the papers that it's going okay, but not great. A reasonable assessment, he agreed. George Keel is turning out to be more of a handful than I'd imagined. He's well ahead in the delegate count, and we've got less than a month before the convention in L.A., and he still won't debate me. So, my darling... How would you feel about being vice president? Will sat up and stuffed a couple of pillows between his back and the headboard. I really, really don't want to do that, he said. I'd rather be slugging it out in the Senate than representing George Keel at funerals. Might not be all bad, she said. Joe Adams has done it well. Doing it well is not the point, Will replied. The point is that as VP1 has absolutely no power of any kind, and George is not the sort of guy who's going to share it. I'd get about the same treatment that Harry Truman got from FDR. You forget that Joe Adams is president of the United States at the moment. Well, I don't want to sit around waiting for George to kick off. What's the news on the president? He wakes up from time to time, but doesn't seem to be able to communicate. I got that from Sue Adams. By the way, you do remember that we have dinner at the White House tomorrow evening. I remember, and I have the awful feeling that George Keel is going to be there, too. And I'll have to make nice with his wife. Oh, yes. Won't that be fun? She could win a Mamie Eisenhower look-alike contest, Kate said, even to the clothes. I love you and your caddy, he said, kissing her ear. I talked to Sue Adams again today, Kate said. And how is she? More important, how is Joe? 
She said everything was fine. I'm not sure why I didn't believe her. Will sat up straight. Do you think Joe is worse? I don't know. She was chipper enough, but there was something under the surface that I couldn't read. Still, they wouldn't be giving this dinner party if he wasn't all right, would they? Will relaxed. You're right, they wouldn't. You know, I've hardly given Joe a thought for the past few months. Don't feel guilty. He's had his hands so full that he probably hasn't thought a lot about you either. God forbid we should read about some incident in the papers or start hearing rumors that he isn't quite right. I suppose I should give some thought to what I'll do if I do hear those rumors. What can you do? Well, I can press him to resign, I suppose. I'm not really comfortable with the knowledge that he's ill. But then F. Efton would become the acting president, wouldn't he? Well, I suppose the country could stand even that for a few months, although it would give him a big leg up on the general election. I think he's going to get the Republican nomination. I hope he does, Kate said. Wouldn't you enjoy running against him? It would get dirty. On his part only, I hope. I hope, too. I have to tell you, Kate said, I have a sense of foreboding about this. After the Clinton mess, everybody's fair game. Well, game, maybe, but not fair game. And the current atmosphere may cost the Republicans a lot of seats in the House. How about the Senate? I think it's unlikely that we can get majorities in both houses. So if you're president, you'll likely have a Republican-controlled Senate? Probably, so I don't want to piss them off too much during the campaign. I've worked hard to build relationships with a lot of Republican senators, and I don't want to squander that in a dogfight with F. Efton. Terry Cogan drove through the flat South Georgia countryside toward Reedsville. Cogan was a small-time Atlanta lawyer in his late 30s who supplemented his DUI cases and ambulance chasing with occasional investigative work, and he was pleased to have this job, even if he wasn't sure who he was working for. He'd gotten a call from another lawyer in a big Atlanta firm, a friend of his father, who'd sometimes sent cases his way, and the man had been tight-lipped about who was instructing him. He made his way to the state prison, parked his car, and identified himself at the front gate, his way having been smoothed by a call from a state legislator of his father's acquaintance. Fifteen minutes later, he was shown into a sparely furnished room, and five minutes after that, a guard brought a man into the room and left the two of them alone. "'Hey,' the man said. "'I'm Larry Moody.' "'Terry Cogan,' the lawyer replied, offering his hand. Cogan had done his homework on Larry Eugene Moody. The young man was thirty-five now, and his blonde hair was thinning and creeping up his scalp. Otherwise, he looked much the same as in the pictures at his trial. "'Did Charlene send you?' Moody asked. "'Charlene Joyner? No. I'm an attorney, and I represent some people who are interested in your case, people who are opposed to the death penalty.' They sat down. "'I'll tell you anything I can that'll help,' Moody said. "'I'm scheduled for October 30th, and I'm getting worried.' "'I can understand that,' Kogan said. If I can just get a new trial, I know I'll be acquitted. That nigger girl who testified against me at my trial is dead, you know. She got killed in a car wreck last New Year's Eve. Kogan had not the slightest doubt that Moody was guilty of the rape and murder of which he had been convicted. He knew that the girl Moody was referring to was a last-minute witness who testified that Moody had raped her when they were in high school. I think you could be right, he said. I've read the trial transcript and I think that without her testimony, you'd have been acquitted. Damn right I would have. It's a shame your lawyer wasn't smart enough to keep her off the stand. Will Lee? He's running for president now, did you hear? I heard. I'm sorry you weren't better represented. Well, he did good, really, Moody said, looking at the ground. I didn't tell him nothing about the nigger girl, so he sort of got blindsided at the last minute when one of my old high school teachers was on the stand and mentioned her. The prosecutor was all over that right away, and there wasn't really nothing Mr. Lee could have done. So you don't blame Will Lee for your conviction? Kogan asked, making some notes on a legal pad. 
I'd have thought you'd have been pretty pissed off at him. For what? He did the best he could, and that was damn good. Well, how about that business between Lee and Charlene? Moody laughed. Listen, Charlene likes to fuck better than anybody I ever knew. I've been in jail for a long time, so she was getting pretty horny, and when Charlene's horny, she can have just about any guy she wants. You ever seen her in the movies? Many times. So you know how sexy she is. I sure do. Well, let me tell you something. Charlene on the silver screen ain't nothing compared to Charlene up close. Jesus, I get horny just thinking about it. When we were living together, I'd come home from work, and we'd do it, and we'd do it again at bedtime, and then again first thing in the morning, you know? We used to go to the drive-in movies, and we'd fuck in the back of my van just for a change. So I know what Mr. Lee was up against when she showed up at his place that afternoon. Do you know what happened that day? Oh, Charlene told me all about it after the trial. She liked talking about it. What exactly did she tell you? She said she went out to the Lee farm over by Delano. She went back to this little house behind the big house where Mr. Lee lived. It was on a little lake. Anyway, when she got there, she saw him diving in the lake, and he was naked. So she got naked, too, and jumped in with him. So they fucked in the water and then again inside the house. I can only imagine, Kogan said. Tell me, Larry, do you remember whether this little scene between Charlene and Will Lee took place before or after she testified at your trial? Oh, it was afterward, I think. Charlene and I had a little spat when she wouldn't fuck me in jail, and she wasn't talking to me at the time. And she had already testified by then. I see. Well, look, Larry, here's the thing. What? Just about the only grounds you'd have for appeal would be that your lawyer was incompetent. Oh, I don't think he was incompetent. Charlene said he was real good at it. Larry, I'm talking about his being incompetent in the way he represented you at your trial. You mean if I said he did a bad job, I might get a new trial? Possibly, Kogan said, not looking at Moody. Now, think back, Larry. Isn't it just possible that you did tell him about this witness, this black girl who said you raped her in high school? Kogan didn't wait for Moody to respond, but plowed ahead and that maybe he could have done something to exclude her testimony, and because he didn't, you got convicted? I mean, if I had been representing you, I think I would have anticipated that and gotten her evidence excluded as irrelevant or called other witnesses to refute her testimony. He watched Larry Moody closely for his response, and he thought he saw a little light go on in the eyes. Well, Moody said, his eyes narrowing, now that you mention it, I think I might have told him I'd been falsely accused of raping that nigger girl. Nothing ever came of it, you know. There wasn't nothing to back up her story, just her word against mine. Even my old teacher said on the stand that she never believed I raped the girl. Well, it would help if you could remember exactly when you told him that and what the circumstances were, Kogan said. Your story has got to be credible, you know. You've got to be believable. Think back and see if you can remember exactly when you told Will Lee about this black girl's accusation. Moody massaged his forehead for a moment. I got it, he said. It was the first time I met with him in the Greenville jail. I'd just been arrested the day before, and the judge appointed Mr. Lee to defend me. He came to see me, and he asked me all sorts of questions about my background and where I was when that girl got murdered and all that. And then he asked me if there was anything I wanted to tell him, anything he should know, and that was when I told him. What exactly did you tell him that day? I told him I'd been falsely accused in high school by this nigger girl. Of course, I didn't say nigger because Mr. Lee was a real liberal, you know. So he did know before the trial about this incident, and he didn't take any steps to protect you from the testimony of this potential witness? Yeah, that's it. I remember now. I told him about all this that first time I met him. Kogan was writing as fast as he could now. Tell me, Larry, how often are you and Charlene in touch these days? We write letters now and then, although I'm not much of a letter writer. She always writes me back, though, and once in a while I call her out in California when I can catch her at home. She's been trying to get me a good lawyer for an appeal, and Mr. Lee wouldn't do it. 
Charlene asked Will Lee to file an appeal for you? Yeah, she did. And he wouldn't? No, he wouldn't, son of a bitch, Moody said, looking angry. But Charlene and Will Lee are in touch with each other? Yeah. She said she talked to him on the phone. Do you know if Charlene and Lee have met recently? I mean, have they gotten together, maybe had sex? Think carefully now. Moody's eyes narrowed again. Well, I couldn't prove it, and Charlene didn't exactly say that, but I kind of got the impression, you know. You want me to ask Charlene the next time I talk to her? She'll tell me if she's been fucking him. I know she will. But I don't think it's a good idea if you ask her straight out, Larry. I mean, if she flat out denied it, then it would be hard to prove. Sometimes it's better if you don't know all the actual facts of a thing, you know? If you say so, Mr. Kogan. Kogan tossed his legal pad into his briefcase and stood up. Well, Larry, it's been good to meet you. Moody pumped his hand. Do you think I can get me a new trial, Mr. Kogan? I can't promise that, Larry, but I will look into it. I think it's just possible that the people I represent might find it to be a good thing for you to have a new trial. I'll be in touch. Kogan drove back toward Atlanta, excited. He had been repelled by Moody and his blatant racism, but he might get more work out of this case than he had expected, so he could stand that. He resisted the temptation to use his car phone. He'd ask for a face-to-face -face meeting when he got back to Atlanta. Will and Kate were delivered to the White House by a Secret Service car and escorted by an usher to the Blue Room for cocktails. There was a larger crowd than Will had expected, and a number of them were people he had not expected. George Keel was there, as he had predicted, but so were Eft Efton, the Speaker of the House, and Robert Mallon, the Governor of Arizona, who was Efton's chief opponent for the Republican nomination. "'Well, I'll be,' Kate murmured, looking around. Susan Adams approached and kissed them both. "'We're so glad to see you,' she said. This is the first time we've entertained at the White House since the First Lady insisted on exchanging quarters with us. Any news on the President's condition, Will asked. He's as before, and the First Lady thought that since Joe is now running the country, we should be living in the White House. Certainly neither of us would have ever suggested it. It was presented to us as a fait accompli. Well, I think the First Lady was right, Will said. This is where you and Joe belong. Joe's on the other side of the room, spreading joy, Sue said. I know he wants a private word with you before the evening's over. Of course, Will replied. Any time Joe likes. The Speaker of the House materialized at Will's elbow. Evening, Will, he said, with a warmth that caught Will off guard. Catherine, you look lovely tonight. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Kate said. How are you, Eft? Will asked. I'm better than expected at this stage of the campaign, Afton replied softly as if he didn't want to be overheard. You think you'll have a majority of delegates before the convention, Will asked? Could be, Afton replied. Then it looks like it'll be George Keel and me in the general election. And you, of course, you'll be on the ticket, won't you? Only if I'm at the top of it, Will said, surprising himself. That's the boy. Efton said, punching Will's shoulder. Never say die. Sometimes the voters say it for you, Eft, Will replied. Excuse me, I want to talk to George. He steered Kate in the direction of his opponent for the Democratic nomination. Keel greeted him, smiling broadly. Well, Will, he said, I thought you'd be on the road. Funny, George. I thought you would be, too. Well, I guess I can afford a night off to have dinner with our acting president, but frankly, I'm surprised you can. My people tell me we're going to take the nomination on the first ballot by a hundred and fifty votes. Will managed a broad smile. You go right on thinking that, George. I love an overconfident opponent. Keel managed to chuckle, then turned serious. Will, you and I need to sit down and talk about some things. How about tomorrow morning at nine in my hideaway office on the hill? I'm afraid I'm off at the crack of dawn tomorrow, George. Maybe at the convention? Well, Keel said, I suppose our relative positions will be better defined by that time. 
I guess they will, Will agreed. An usher came into the room, rang a gong, and announced dinner. The crowd moved into a room that had been set with four tables of eight as a string quartet from the Marine Band played in the corner. Will and Efton were at the same table, as were George Keel and Mallon. Will wondered if there were some subliminal message in that. Was Joe Adams trying to tell the crowd something? He looked across the room to where Joe sat, chatting earnestly with a beautiful woman to his right. The guests worked their way through three courses of dinner, chatting noisily. They were on coffee when Joe Adams stood up and addressed the group. "'Good evening to you all,' he said. "'This is the first time that Sue and I have entertained in the White House "'since the First Lady so kindly asked us to move in, "'and we are very pleased to have you all as our first guests. "'What you have in common, of course, "'is that after the coming election "'you will all play important roles in the running of the country. "'Almost certainly the eventual nominees of the two parties are here, "'and by extension the next President of the United States. So what Sue and I have here is not just a very special group of guests, but a very distinguished, captive audience. There was a low chuckle from the crowd. You all know that I have declared my intention of withholding my endorsement of any candidate before the convention, and I believe my party can select a slate without my help, even at that time. Of course, after the conventions, I have to say that I'm leaning towards supporting the Democratic candidate. Loud laughter. Although I don't expect to take much part in active campaigning. Hear, hear, Eft Efton shouted, and the crowd laughed again. I didn't say I was going to be neutral, Eft, Adam said with a smile. I asked you all here tonight, he continued, not to once again convey my hands-off position during the campaign, but to talk about your hands-on position. I hardly have to tell you that in recent years, our political process has taken on a harsh, even bitter partisanship that has not served either the process or the country well. We have spent far too much time and energy fighting for political advantage instead of working to make this a better country. I want us all to stop it, and the current campaign is the time and place. Because of the position in which fate has placed me, perhaps I'm in a better position than most politicians to call for this change. During my months as acting president, I have bent over backward to govern in a bipartisan fashion, and some of you have responded to that effort, while others have been, shall we say, less enthusiastic. We're beginning the new millennium in extraordinarily good shape. A healthy economy, a lack of major military conflict and even political conflict, low unemployment, lower crime rates, and high optimism among our fellow countrymen. The last century has often been called the American century. Well, let's have another American century. Let's consolidate the gains that our fathers and grandfathers and we ourselves have fought so hard to earn. And let's go on to make this a better, safer, more peaceful country while maintaining our leadership role as the world's only superpower. But I'm falling into clichés here, and I don't want to do that. I want to ask every one of you to go into this election as Americans first and party politicians second. I want an end to personal attacks and false moralizing. I want the next president to reach out to both parties and their constituencies. I want each of you here to dedicate himself to a new bipartisanship in this country. I believe there is more at stake right now in this country than at any time since the end of World War II. And if we can't face the next century working together, we have a great deal to lose. I know that there are those among you who think that you are all right and everyone else is all wrong. I know this is true because at times I have had those same feelings myself. Doing this job has shown me that I was wrong. Then something happened that frightened Will. Joe Adams stood, his head down, staring at the table in front of him, saying nothing. For a moment, he thought Adams was near tears, 
Then he realized that he had simply forgotten what he was going to say, or perhaps even where he was and who he was talking to. Sue Adams reached out and took her husband's hand, and still he did not continue. Somebody had to do something. Will got to his feet applauding. So did Eft Efton, and in a moment the crowd was standing, cheering. Sue Adams led her husband from the room. At the door he paused, waved to the crowd, then disappeared. The applause died, and Will's eyes found Kate's across the table. He could see the fear in them. Before dawn, Will kissed a still-sleeping Kate goodbye, went downstairs, gave his bags to a Secret Service agent, and got into the car. Tim Coleman and Kitty Conroy were waiting for him, sipping coffee. So, how was the Adams' first White House party, Kitty asked. Just great, Will lied. He had lain awake last night wondering if Joe Adams' slip was temporary or indicative of a slide into permanent senility. You don't sound as if it was great, Kitty said. Sorry, I'm still half asleep. Well, Tim said, this ought to wake you up. I had a call yesterday from Lou Regenstein. The movie mogul? That's right. He's the chairman of Centurion Studios. I don't think I ever met him. You've met Vance Calder, haven't you? Yes, at a dinner party in New York a couple of years ago. Well, Calder is apparently a big fan of yours. Well, first I've heard about that, Will said. You must have impressed him at the dinner party. We did talk a lot. I found him very bright. For a Brit, he seemed pretty well informed about American politics. He was born there, but he's been an American citizen for more than 20 years. And in addition to being Centurion's biggest star, he's a major stockholder in the studio. Anyway, both Calder and Centurion want to get behind you in a big way. How big? Calder and the co-star of his next film want to host a fundraiser for you in L.A. right before the convention. He's promised to get a thousand people to his house at a thousand dollars a head. A million bucks in individual contributions? Wow. And a lot of them will contribute to the party, too. There's more. Centurion is going to give a million to the party after you're nominated. That would make them the single biggest contributor, wouldn't it? By a long shot. Tell them I accept. I already have. I hope you don't mind, but I thought it was better not to hesitate. You did the right thing, Tim, Will said. This is a great way to start the last leg of the campaign for the nomination. He looked at Tim and Kitty. So why do you two look so glum? I guess you haven't seen the Washington Post this morning, Kitty said, handing it to him and pointing to a story below the fold. The headline read, Former client accuses Senator Will Lee of incompetence in appeal of murder conviction. What the hell is this, Will said. Larry Eugene Moody is appealing his murder conviction, Tim said. His grounds are that he was incompetently represented by you in his original trial. Will was having trouble reading the story in the moving car. Go on, he said. Just how was I incompetent? He says, or his new lawyer says, that you failed to depose a key witness against him, and that you offered no other witnesses to counter her testimony. This would be the black girl who said he raped her in high school? That's the one. It's true that her testimony probably got him convicted. I thought I had it won until another witness blurted out the story about the alleged rape. Does the lawyer say how I was supposed to know she'd be called? Moody says that he told you about the accusation in his first meeting with you and that you did nothing to prepare for the witness. That's a bald-faced lie, Will said. Larry was convicted because he withheld that information from me. If I'd known about the incident with the girl, I would have known how to avoid opening the door on her testimony. Was there anyone else at that first meeting between you and Moody? No, we were alone. Too bad. It'll be your word against his. All right, Kitty said. Let's run down what we've got here and figure out how to deal with it. This story is, of course, immaterial to anything in the election. I think it's a sideshow staged by the Republicans. They're just hoping that enough mud will stick to hurt you. 
What we've got to do is to issue a statement this morning refuting the charge of incompetence and stating the basic facts in the case. All right, I buy that, Will said. You can type it up on the airplane and release it to the traveling press on the way west. After I hand that out, I think you ought to go forward in the plane and just chat with them informally about the murder case. You have nothing to hide. It's just Moody's desperate attempt to avoid being put to death, etc., etc. Tim spoke up. I think it's interesting that if Republicans are involved in this, they're out to get you even before the convention. That indicates to me that they'd rather run against George Keel than you. A backhanded compliment, if I ever heard one, Will replied. Then something popped into his mind. Wait a minute, he said. You said that the fundraiser in L.A. is going to be hosted by Vance Calder and his co-star? That's right, Tim said. And who is his co-star? Gosh, I forgot to ask, Tim replied. As soon as they're awake in L.A., call and find out. Okay, I'll call Regenstein back at nine their time. Kitty was looking sharply at Will. What is it? she asked. I think I might know who the co-star is, Will replied. Who? Kitty and Tim asked simultaneously. It might very well be Charlene Joyner. It took a moment for the penny to drop. Then both their mouths dropped open. Oh, shit, Kitty said. Charlene called me over the holidays and asked me to handle an appeal for Larry Moody. I refused. This is not good, Tim said. Well, there are going to be a thousand people there. Maybe it'll be all right. You don't understand, Tim said. There's more to the news story about Moody's appeal. He picked up the post turned into an inside page and read. Moody's lawyer also charged that Will Lee had a sexual relationship with Moody's girlfriend during the trial, in which she was an important witness in establishing Moody's alibi. The girlfriend, Charlene Joyner, is now one of Hollywood's rising stars. Oh, Jesus, Will said. I agree, Kitty chimed in. I thought we had killed that particular snake in your first senatorial campaign, but it's back. Maybe that's not a bad thing, Tim said. What are you talking about, Kitty demanded. I wasn't all that active in that campaign, Tim said, but as I recall, there was a school of thought that the uh, incident with Charlene Joyner may have actually helped in the campaign. That was before Bill Clinton, Kitty said. Oh, Tim replied, there is that. Yes. Will agreed. There is that. Zeke Tennant read the syndicated column in the Las Vegas newspaper with interest. He had been waiting for his pigeon to come west. Senator Will Lee, in spite of being well behind frontrunner George Keel for the Democratic nomination, continues to drive his staff nuts by doing quixotic things like his appearance in Santa Fe, New Mexico this weekend, at a fundraiser in Santa Fe's main plaza for his friend, Congressman Roberto Chavez. Although it has been pointed out to him that New Mexico has only five electoral votes and that his time could be better spent in more thickly populated states, he has insisted on going to the aid of Chavez, who is in a tight race against a right-wing Republican and whose support may be eroded by the presence of a Green Party candidate on the ballot. Santa Fe looked good to Zeke, he could drive there overnight and be there in plenty of time for the political rally. He thought Santa Fe and its plaza might afford a good opportunity for a kill. Zeke put down the paper, got out a suitcase and started packing. He went into the master bedroom closet, removed a panel and took out a check sniper's rifle, which broke down and went into an ordinary looking briefcase. He hid the rifle's silencer under the spare tire since only that was illegal, and headed out of Las Vegas. Zeke drove at the speed limit, even though he was fully prepared for a stop by the police or highway patrol, with his driver's license, credit cards, and other ID, he had no wish to invite attention. He had plenty of time. Will Lee's political rally wasn't until the day after tomorrow. 
He got to Santa Fe at noon the following day and made his way to the plaza, driving slowly around it, noting the Indian jewelry sellers displaying their wares on the sidewalk in front of the old governor's palace. There was only one hotel directly on the square, La Fonda, which stood at the southeast corner. He used his cell phone to reserve a room, then parked in the ground floor garage and checked in. He took a long nap and woke late in the afternoon with the sun low in the sky. His room gave a partial view of the plaza, not good enough to shoot from, but then he had no intention of firing from a room he had rented. He would have to do some exploring. He shaved, showered, dressed, and took an elevator to a roof restaurant on the east side of the hotel. There was an outdoor bar, and he took a seat looking around him. The rooftop terrace was on the wrong side of the building for shooting, but above him was more roof. At the back side of the hotel was a trellis planted with some sort of climbing plant. It went up a good twelve feet to what seemed to be the roof. It should do nicely. Zeke went back to the bar and concentrated on finding a woman to pick up. After all, he had another twenty-four hours, and he had to do something with his time. The next day, Zeke checked out of his room around four in the afternoon. He allowed a bellman to carry his luggage to his car, then tipped the man, who went back into the hotel. Zeke waited a minute, then walked out of the parking lot and down the street toward the plaza. Signs posted in shop windows gave the time of the rally as six o'clock, giving him plenty of time to size up the job. Near the center of the park in the plaza, Workmen were completing a wooden platform which rose about four feet from the ground. Zeke walked around behind the platform and looked back toward La Fonda. Good. A perfect line of sight to the northwest corner of the hotel's roof. He walked back to the hotel. In the garage, he removed the briefcase from the trunk of the car, then dug out the silencer from under the spare tire and placed it in the briefcase with the rifle. He walked back into the hotel and took the elevator to the roof. He stepped out into the rooftop bar, which was deserted, since it didn't open until six, then went directly to the trellis. He looped the briefcase's strap over his shoulder and began climbing. Shortly, he was on the roof. He walked around the perimeter of the building, examining each side for escape routes. The way he had come would be best, of course, but after six, he might be seen by someone in the rooftop restaurant. On the south side, however was a cast-iron drain pipe running straight to the ground, ending behind an adobe wall. He remembered that the garage had a window on that side of the building. Satisfied, he walked to the northwest corner of the building and, staying low, peered over the parapet. Perfect. He had a full view of the wooden platform in the center of the plaza park. Zeke glanced at his watch, then sat down, leaned against the parapet, took a paperback novel from his pocket, and began to read. Will was awakened at five o'clock by Kitty Conroy in his suite at the El Dorado Hotel. They had landed in Santa Fe earlier in the afternoon, and after half a dozen brief meetings with local Democratic supporters and a couple of media interviews, he had had time for a nap. Will showered, freshened his shave, and got into a freshly pressed pair of jeans and some borrowed cowboy boots. We're going to walk up to the plaza, Kitty said. It's only a couple of blocks from the hotel, and you can shake a lot of hands on the way. Will's right hand had toughened up a lot over the past few months. You had to get in shape for campaigning. Together with Kitty, he started for the elevator, accompanied by two Secret Service agents. A mariachi band was playing in the plaza now, and Zeke put away his book and peered over the parapet. There was a thickening of the crowd at the northwest corner of the Plaza Park. Will Lee was walking toward the platform, shaking hands. Zeke quickly assembled the rifle, screwing the silencer onto the end of the barrel. Then he took the fat telescopic sight from the case and, peering through it, looked down at the plaza. He could see Lee clearly and up close now. Except for some glare from the setting sun to the west, it was an excellent setup. He'd wait until Lee mounted the platform and faced the crowd to speak. Then he'd go for a headshot. Then he saw something he hadn't expected. There was a box of security around Will Lee, and at each corner was a man in a suit. What Zeke had not expected was that each of the four men 
wore an identical metal button in the lapel of his suit. What the hell was the Secret Service doing here? Lee hadn't even been nominated yet. As he thought about this, he concentrated his gaze on the lead agent and saw the man suddenly squint as some sort of light swept across his face. Then the man looked up and directly at Zeke, alarm on his face. He pointed at the northwest corner of La Fonda. Zeke realized that the setting sun had been reflected into the man's eyes by his telescopic sight. The man continued to look at Zeke, and he raised a fist to his lips and said something into a microphone hidden in his cupped hand. Christ! Zeke started breaking down the rifle and packing it into the briefcase. He'd never have climbed onto this rooftop if he'd known the Secret Service was in town. He was lucky there wasn't an agent in his lap right now. They would have checked the rooftops earlier today. Keeping low, Zeke jogged toward the rear of the building. The trellis was too risky now. There'd be cops coming up that elevator to the roof restaurant looking for him. As he reached the rear parapet, he heard a commotion from the direction of the restaurant. Quickly, he slung the carrying strap of the briefcase over his shoulder, swung a leg over the parapet, grabbed the drain pipe with both hands, and clamping the instep of each foot to the pipe, slid rapidly down the side of the building, four stories to the ground. He ran to the window that let light into the garage, which was hinged at the top. He swung it open and looked inside. Nobody in sight. He wriggled through the window, dropped to the garage floor, and ran to his car, slinging the briefcase into the trunk. He got the Lexus started, then drove slowly out of the garage. The attendant was out of his cubicle, standing in the street, looking toward the plaza. The sound of sirens came from that direction. The man didn't even see Zeke turn right toward the cathedral, then right again. As he did so, a police car passed him, going in the opposite direction toward the plaza and the hotel, its lights flashing, its siren wailing. Zeke drove slowly west, leaving the downtown area. Another two minutes, and he'd be out of town. He'd been stupid. He should have noticed that with the sun setting, his scope would reflect. And he hadn't known the Secret Service was on the job. That was going to make his work more difficult. But, he reflected not impossible. He drove west across New Mexico and Arizona. He stayed overnight in a motel in San Bernardino. Then the next morning he bought a large map of Los Angeles and did some studying. It didn't take long to get his bearings. The L.A. Coliseum was in a neighborhood he didn't care for, but after driving around for a while he found a neat block of houses, and one of them had a sign outside advertising a room for rent. The landlady, Mrs. Rivera, looked him over, and when he offered her a month's rent in advance, found him acceptable. Zeke left his suitcase in his room, then went for a drive. He was looking for construction sites, and in less than an hour he found two that seemed promising. Next he drove back to the Coliseum and drove slowly around it until he saw a sign that read, L.A. Coliseum Employment Office, Hiring Now. He parked in a nearby lot, combed his hair and walked into the office and up to a counter. "'May I have an employment application, please?' The woman behind the counter gave him a form and a ballpoint pen and indicated a table where he could sit and complete the application. Zeke used his Las Vegas address and identity, Harry Grant. Asked for his skills, he thought about it, then put down carpentry and electrical work. As an afterthought, he put down installation and repair of computers and sound systems. He had done all of those jobs in other existences. He turned in the application and sat down to wait. A few minutes later, a man appeared behind the counter. Harry Grant, he asked. That's me, Zeke said, standing up. The man looked him up and down. Come with me, he said, raising the countertop to let Zeke through. He led the way to a windowless office down a hallway and offered Zeke a chair. "'My name is Hills,' he said, looking at Zeke's application. "'I see you live nearby. How long you been there?' "'Moved in today,' Zeke said. "'Just got into town.' "'Where from?' "'Las Vegas. I've been there for the past eleven years.' "'Doing what kind of work?' "'Well, I've done a little of everything at one time or another, but for the past four years I've had my own business.' installing computers and home entertainment systems. What happened to your business? I did okay at it, but it's tough being self-employed. 
I got to the point where I was going to have to start hiring help, and I thought, well, I don't really want to do that. I'd rather just find something good and work for somebody else. I kind of got tired of Vegas, too. Hills nodded. You haven't put down any references, he said. Like I said, I've been self-employed. I could give you the names of a couple of people I did installations for. Good. What are they? Zeke rattled off two names and phone numbers in Las Vegas, along with the name of his banker. He had prepared for this long ago. You mind if I call these people now? Hills asked. Go right ahead. Hills held out a plastic bottle. While I'm at it, you may as well fill this for me. I assume you don't mind taking a drug test. No, sir, not at all. Zeke followed the directions to the men's room. He used the john, filled the plastic bottle, dawdled a bit, and returned to the office. Well, those folks thought well enough of you, Hills said, taking the bottle from him and labeling it. Do you have an electrician's license? Zeke did, but in Georgia, under his own name. No, sir, but I could probably pass the test. What kind of carpentry work have you done? Everything from framing to finish work. I did two years as a cabinet maker's apprentice when I was 18, building kitchens, and I'm good at installations. Well, you're an interesting fellow, Harry, Hill said. I've got a need for some temporary people at the moment. You interested? I'd prefer something permanent, Zeke replied, but maybe what you've got might lead to that. It might very well. Tell me, can you work from architectural drawings? Yes, sir, that's what I did at the cabinet shop, and my boss let me work pretty much on my own. Good. Right now we're getting ready for the Democratic Convention, and we're stretched pretty thin. With your range of skills, I could offer you twenty an hour to start, and after the convention, if you show me you can do the work, I might have something better for you. I think twenty might be all right to start, Zeke said, but I think I can show you I'm worth more than that if you'll give me the chance. Harry, when I run this drug test, what am I going to find? Urine, Zeke replied. I like a beer after work, but I've never been a drug user. Good. Let's say you're hired, pending the test results. It'll take me a day to run the test and get you processed. Have you got your own tools? Yes, sir, Zeke lied. I'll call you tomorrow and let you know for sure, but I think you can expect to be back here the day after tomorrow at 8 a.m. sharp to start work. He rose and shook Zeke's hand. Zeke left the office and got back into his car. He needed some tools, and he thought he knew where to get them. He drove around for a while until he began seeing a lot of bars and pawn shops. At the second pawn shop, he found what he was looking for. At a surplus store, he bought some coveralls, work boots, and a hard hat. He put his tools in the trunk of the car and began driving again back to the construction sites he'd seen earlier. He circled a large excavation until he heard a siren and somebody yelling, Fire in the hole! A moment later, a satisfyingly large explosion went off. Oh, yeah, Zeke muttered under his breath. He looked hard at the little shack on the edge of the excavation, festooned with signs warning of danger and high explosives. Nothing like advertising, he said aloud, laughing. When he got back to his rooming house later in the day, his landlady called to him as he passed her living room. Mr. Grant? Yes, Mrs. Rivera. She fumbled for a piece of paper in her pocket. A Mr. Hills called. He said to tell you everything is okay and you can start work tomorrow instead of the day after. As his campaign airplane approached Los Angeles, Will picked up the telephone, the only item on the aircraft that he felt worked consistently well, and called Kate at home. Hello, she said. Good evening. This is the next president of the United States. Oh, God, not another dirty phone call. Show a little respect, Missy, or when I'm president, I'll exile you to the Department of Agriculture. Could you breathe a little harder, please? I don't feel I'm getting the full effect. I promise you the full effect just as soon as you arrive in L.A. Oh, well, there's a problem. I can't come tomorrow. What? A flap at the office. I can't go into it, but, Kate, I need you here. Will, I'm sorry, but, Kate, I haven't asked much of you during the campaign, but this is important. The delegates are arriving, and I want them to see you with me on television. Peter, too. Will, I'll just be a day late, that's all. You know I wouldn't be late if it weren't important. Well, the fundraiser is the day after tomorrow, Will said. You can't miss that. Oh, 
Is this the one where I get to shake the hand of Charlene Joyner and thank her for screwing you? That's the one. And short of thanking her, you have to be nice. The press is primed for this event, and it must go well. Look on the bright side. You get to spend some time with Vance Calder, too. You met him in New York, remember? I believe I may have a vague recollection of having met the biggest movie star in Hollywood and the handsomest man on earth, yes. I'll make you a deal. You spend all your time with Charlene, and I'll spend all my time with Vance. Will felt a need to change the subject. The Secret Service will meet you at LAX, and you'll get VIP treatment all the way. You mean I won't have to wait for my luggage and a rent-a-car? You'll go straight from the airplane into a limo, and from there straight into my bed. Where exactly are you now? Will looked out the window. We're flying over the eastern suburbs of Los Angeles, which go on forever and ever. Are you landing at LAX? No, at Santa Monica. Kitty thinks it'll be easier to manage the press there than at LAX. Will you be on TV when you land? If I'm not, I'm firing Kitty. Then I can watch. Oh, boy. Send me a signal, if you love me. Scratch your crotch. Will burst out laughing. On national television? Never mind. Charlene would probably think it was a signal to her. I'll see you the day after tomorrow, Will said, still laughing. Count on it, my love. I love you. You better. As the 737 landed, Will looked across a taxiway into a boiling crowd at the Supermarine Terminal. Oh, look, he said to Kitty Conway as they raced past, engines in full reverse, a spontaneous demonstration. Yeah, Kitty replied, and it only took three weeks to put together. The airplane came to a halt and everybody stood up. Funny, Kitty said. I feel as though the campaign is starting right now as if nothing we've done so far matters. Just everything from here on in. Do you feel that way, Senator? I think I do. It's very strange. The door to the airplane opened and the noise filled the cabin. Somewhere a band was playing. Happy days are here again. Let's go, Will said. He stepped out onto the gangway, and the roar of the crowd struck him like a breaking wave. His knees were weak as he walked down the steps. Then, as he mounted the platform, the roar became even louder, and suddenly he felt as if an enormous rush of energy had passed from the crowd to him, and for the first time he was one with his audience. The band stopped playing, and the audience slowly grew quiet. Will began to speak, and magically what had become his standard stump speech grew into something else, rehearsed yet improvised. He was modest, then amusing, then serious, then finally inspiring. He knew he had never spoken so well, and when he ended and stepped back from the microphone and listened to the crowd cheer, he felt he had crossed into some fresh, new political territory. The Secret Service agents herded him and a handful of staff down a funnel of screaming people toward a line of waiting vehicles. Will shook hands on either side of him, felt people grabbing at his clothes, heard them shouting at him. Then he was in the back of a Secret Service limousine with Kitty and Tim, and they were moving faster and faster. To Will's surprise, they drove straight across the runway and out of the other side of the airport. "'Isn't this dangerous?' he asked. "'We got the FAA to close the airport for a few minutes until we were clear,' Kitty said. "'Senator, what happened back there? I've never heard you speak like that.' I don't know, Will said. I got this incredible rush. That was a very well-trained crowd, Kitty. Kitty shook her head. Only a couple hundred of them were ours. The rest just showed up. Something is happening here, I swear it is. I've never experienced anything like it before. Neither have I, Will said, his heart pounding. Don't let it stop. The motorcade turned into the back drive of the Bel Air Hotel and pulled into a parking lot behind a two-story building. Will was led down a tunnel and through a ground-floor door into the handsomest hotel suite he had ever seen. It looked, he thought, like the home of a very rich and very tasteful Hollywood producer. He heard voices, and the first person he saw was Charlene Joyner. She was standing facing the door next to Vance Calder and a short, well-tailored man Will had never met. Will! Charlene cried and rushed forward, kissing him on the cheek. 
Charlene, he said, it's good to see you. It had been ten years since he had seen her, and she had then been in her early twenties. A decade had made her even more beautiful, and the perfect hair and Armani suit helped. I believe you've met Vance Calder, Charlene said. Will shook the movie star's hand. Of course. It's good to see you again, Vance. And this is Lou Regenstein, Charlene said, pointing Will at the shorter man, the chairman of Centurion Studios. Mr. Regenstein, I'm very happy to meet you. Please, Senator, it's Lou. Lou it is. I want to thank all three of you for the magnificent effort you're making for my campaign. I believe it is the most generous act I've ever heard of, and I'll never forget it. Won't you all sit down? Everybody sat on facing sofas before a fireplace. I want you to know, Calder said, that the fundraiser is fully subscribed, a thousand people at a thousand dollars a head. He handed Will a check for a million dollars made out to his campaign. Will accepted the check and looked at it. Outside of a couple of defense expenditures, that's the biggest check I've ever seen, he said. However did you round up so many people? It was easy, Charlene said. We simply announced that the party would be limited to a thousand, so we had an immediate demand for tickets. Hollywood loves anything exclusive, Regenstein said. How is Arrington, Vance? She's very well, and so is our son, Peter. We have a boy named Peter, too. He's arriving the day after tomorrow with his mother. He's a chote. Charlene jumped in. If you're on your own, will you come to dinner tomorrow night at my house in Malibu? I'm having a few people in. I'm so sorry, Charlene, he said, but you have no idea the schedule I'm keeping while I'm here. Your fundraiser counts as recreational time. Maybe next trip. I'd love to meet Kate, Charlene said with patent insincerity. Regenstein stood up. Well, Senator, we'd better be going. I'm sure you've got a lot to do. Will stood, too, shaking the man's hand. Thank you again, Lou, for all your help on this fundraiser, and I haven't thanked you properly for Centurion's incredibly generous gift to the party. I only hope it gets spent on my campaign in the general election and not on George Keel's. Will, Charlene said, can I have just a moment of private time with you? Of course, Will said, looking around the room for rescue. Kitty, Tim, and two Secret Service agents were with them, and Kitty was whispering to an agent. Will shook Vance Calder's hand again. I'll see you at the party. Kate and I are both looking forward to it. Everyone filed out of the room except the Secret Service agent to whom Kitty had been whispering. Could we be alone for a moment, Will? Charlene asked. I'm sorry, Charlene, but the Secret Service insists on being with me at all times. The agent nodded vigorously. It's policy, ma'am. Charlene looked annoyed, but she returned to her seat on the couch. Will sat on the sofa opposite. What did you want to talk to me about, Charlene? he asked. It's about Larry Moody's appeal. The people from the J. Edgar Hoover Institute called me and asked if I would ask you to file a brief as part of the appeal. Will was startled at the mention of the right-wing group. What sort of brief, he asked, baffled. Well, as you know, the basis of their appeal is that Larry had legal counsel that was inadequate. I believe incompetent was the word they used. Yes, well, they're hoping that you'll file a brief confirming that your representation of Larry at his trial was less than your best. I mean, you had the senatorial campaign going, and Senator Carr was ill, and— Are they insane? Will demanded. Do they really think for a moment that I would state to an appeals court that I am an incompetent attorney? Now, Will, it's just a matter of form, and it's to save Larry's life, that's all. It's not a matter of form, Charlene. No self-respecting attorney would ever do such a thing. I'm sorry that your friend faces the electric chair, but he put himself there— first by raping and murdering a young woman, second by insisting on his innocence instead of allowing me to plead to a lesser charge in return for a reduction in sentence, and third by lying to me from day one. I know all that, Will, but I'm very fond of Larry. He helped me at a difficult time in my life, and I'm still grateful to him. Well, that speaks well of you, Charlene, that you would stand by your friend, but I'm afraid I can't be of any help to you in this matter. 
You must understand that it's absolutely impossible for me to do anything for Larry now. Charlene sighed deeply. Well, if that's your last word. It is, I'm afraid. Will stood up to encourage her to do so. Charlene stood and came toward him, her arms out. Will grabbed her by the shoulders and held her at a distance while he pecked her on the cheek. It's good to see you, he said, steering her toward the door. And I want to tell you again how grateful I am for your help with the fundraiser. It was an incredibly generous thing to do. They had reached the door, and the agent held it open. See you at the party, Charlene said, and before Will could back away, she leaned forward and kissed him on the ear, using her tongue. Good night, Charlene, Will said, trying to keep his voice steady, and noting the expression on the face of Kitty Conroy, who was waiting to come in. As Charlene passed out of the room, Kitty slipped in. Can I get you a Q-tip, she asked as the door closed. Thanks for keeping an agent here, Will said. What did she want? She wanted me to file a brief in Larry Moody's appeal, admitting that I gave him incompetent representation. Oh, is that all? Kitty hooted. And I thought she wanted your body. Maybe she did, Will said defensively. He dug the check out of his pocket. I guess she thought the price was right. Kitty looked at the check. Jesus Christ, I never thought I'd see such a thing in my whole life. Just get it into the hotel safe and don't take any detours to Las Vegas on the way. Don't you worry, Kitty said, reaching for the door, and I'll ask the Secret Service to post extra guards to keep Charlene out. Zeke presented himself for work as requested, and Hills, who had hired him, walked him down to the floor of the Coliseum, where a large platform was under construction at one end of the space. Hills called another man over. Hank, this is Harry Grant, who's just coming to work for us. I think you might find him useful. Harry, this is Hank Greenbaum. Hank will be your foreman. Good to meet you, Hank said. I hear you have quite a range of skills to offer us. I'll help wherever I can, Zeke replied. Tell you what, climb up on that ladder there and tell me what you think of the framing plan of our platform. Zeke climbed up and surveyed the work for a couple of minutes, making mental notes. He came back down. Who designed the framing, he asked. A kid in our in-house design office. Zeke shook his head. You see a problem, Hills asked. How many people at a time are you likely to have standing on it? Maybe as many as two hundred. And what are you flooring it with? Half-inch plywood, then carpeting, Hank replied. Zeke shook his head again. I think that under a lot of weight it could be a little rickety. Let's go take a closer look, Hank said, and you can tell me what you do to make it better. The three men walked under the platform and through the framing. Zeke looked around. You see how he's got this series of boxes designed? I think we could make it a lot more rigid if we put cross members in each box, and then I'd use three-quarter inch plywood for the flooring. That ought to keep it rigid, and it would feel a lot more substantial underfoot, too. I agree, Hank said to Hills, but I'll have to have approval for the extra expenditure. It shouldn't be too bad. We can exchange the half-inch plywood for the three-quarter and get full credit. I might even be able to get them to throw in delivery. Do it, Hills said. Zeke did the shoring up himself, and Hank Greenbaum watched him closely. By quitting time, all the cross members were in, and the framing was ready for the plywood flooring. Good job, Hank said. You're going to be real useful around here. I like the way you use tools. Thanks, Zeke replied. What do you want me to do tomorrow? Come on up to my office and take a look at some plans, Hank said. Zeke followed Greenbaum up to a small room above the platform, and watched as he unrolled some architect's plans. This wasn't done by no kid, he said, looking at them. 
Nope, this was an expert job, Hank agreed. These are the plans for the podium. It's pretty elaborate, as you can see, wide with raised paneling. It has room for all the telephone and sound system wiring and the teleprompter equipment, and directly under the podium there'll be a closet where all the junction boxes will be located. That way, if there's a problem during the convention, we can solve it without sending men out onto the platform. Zeke nodded. What's this? he asked, pointing to another kind of box at the center of the podium. The Secret Service is supplying that. It's basically a three-sided box made of quarter-inch steel plate. It's accommodated into the design so that it won't show, but anybody standing at the microphone will be protected on three sides from gunfire. I'd like you to take whoever you need and assemble and install the podium. It's due in tomorrow morning from the cabinet makers. Then, when you're done, the painters will come in and finish it. What about the electrical work? Zeke asked. That's being done by an outside contractor. I think it would be a good idea if, after I've got the thing installed, I worked with them on running the wiring and siting the junction boxes. I've done a lot of that. It's okay by me, Hank replied. Can I take these drawings home with me tonight and do some planning? Then I can go right to work on the installation as soon as the cabinet work arrives tomorrow morning. Sure, go ahead, but for God's sake, don't lose them. That's my only copy. Don't you worry, Zeke said. Will stood before the California delegation, the largest and, from his point of view, most important of all. They had given him a standing ovation upon his introduction. I've already talked myself blue in the face all over California, he said, but I'd like to answer any questions you may have. Tell us where you stand on the Castle Point Naval Base, a man in the front row said. Will took a deep breath. That's a tough one, but I'll be frank. It's very likely that the base will be closed. You know how important that base is to California, don't you? The man asked. I certainly do. Military bases are important to every state. They're big employers, and they pump a lot of money into the local economies. Then why do you support closing it? I'm still waiting for the final report from the commission before I make that decision, but I have to tell you, it doesn't look good, and I'd like to tell you why. All right, go ahead. As important as military bases are to the states, they're even more important to the country as a whole. We don't have any weapons system that costs as much to build or maintain as a large military base costs us. Year after year, we try to close a few so that we can make big savings on the defense budget, but year after year, congressmen and senators fight to keep them open because it means votes to them. So the president set up a special commission to make recommendations on which facilities should be closed, and barring any really huge errors in their recommendations, I'm committed to accepting them. My home state of Georgia is likely to lose a big base, too, but if it makes sense for the country, I'll accept that. The good news is that there's never been a better time to reduce the number of bases. We're in the middle of a booming economy, and that means that the people who lose their jobs will find it easier to find new ones. California has the lowest unemployment rate that it's had for 30 years, and those people will quickly be absorbed into new jobs. Remember, too, that if Castle Point is closed, it will very likely be put to private commercial use, and that will create a lot of new jobs. He pointed to a woman in the third row. How do you feel about the Clinton impeachment business? I think it was a sustained right-wing Republican political tantrum, from the Starr investigation to the Judiciary Committee hearings to the House impeachment vote to the presentation of the House managers. President Clinton's sins were just that, and not impeachable offenses. The whole process was an outrage against the Constitution, and the Republican Party is going to have to bear the political consequences for what they did. It's my hope that a great many of the instigators of impeachment will be voted out of office in November. That got a rousing round of applause. Will spent another half hour answering their questions, then moved on to other state delegations where he answered, mostly, the same questions. Zeke slipped out of bed, took a zippered canvas bag from underneath, and checked its contents. A pair of dark coveralls, a ski mask, a pair of driving gloves, a dozen feet of clothesline, a set of bolt cutters, and a 15-inch length of lead pipe wrapped with two rolls of friction tape at one end. 
He slipped into some jeans, a T-shirt, and a pair of canvas boat shoes that wouldn't leave a treadmark, then crept down the stairs and out of the house. It was a ten-minute drive to the construction site he had picked out, and when he arrived, he drove around the block twice, looking for LAPD patrol cars and for the night watchman. He saw no cars, but the watchman was walking the perimeter of the site. Zeke parked and watched until the man returned to his shack. Zeke got into his coveralls, rolled the ski mask so that it looked like a watch cap, slipped on the thin gloves, then grabbed the bag and headed for the fence. He cut his way through the chain links with the bolt cutters and slipped through. The watchman was still in his shack, probably dozing. Zeke ran lightly over the rough ground to the shack. From inside, he could hear the sounds of an old movie coming from a small TV set. He pulled down the ski mask, removed the lead pipe from his bag, stood behind the door, took a deep breath, and coughed loudly. A moment later, the TV went off, and the door opened. Zeke waited for the man to take a step or two, then swung the pipe in a short arc toward the back of his neck. There was a faint thump, and the man fell in an uncoordinated heap. Zeke dragged him back into the shack, and with a length of clothesline, lightly hogtied him, then stuffed the man's own handkerchief into his mouth. He turned the TV back on and turned up the volume. Zeke left the shack, and standing in its shadow, waited three minutes, watching for traffic. There was little to be seen and no patrol cars. He ran toward the explosives shed. He cut through the padlock with the bolt cutters and let himself inside. There were no windows, so he switched on the light. Everything he wanted was there. He had to resist the temptation to take it all, but he settled for two pounds of plastic explosive, which was about the size of a brick, and some detonators. He stuffed everything into the bag, checked for traffic again, and ran back to the opening he had cut in the fence, then to his car. He tossed the bag into the trunk, got in, and drove away. A few blocks down the street, he stopped, shucked off the coveralls and threw them along with the shoes, the gloves, and the ski mask into a dumpster. Then he drove home and crept up the stairs again. The following morning, Zeke stood with Hank Greenbaum as the disassembled podium was brought to the platform on a forklift and lowered gently to the plywood floor. "'How long will you need to install the thing?' Hank asked. "'I'll have it put together tonight and ready for painting,' Zeke said, "'but I may have to put in some overtime.' "'That'll be fine,' Hank replied. "'How much help do you want?' "'Just one man.' "'Rico!' Hank hollered to a man across the platform. "'Get over here and help Harry put this thing together.' Rico walked over. "'Sure thing,' he said. "'Take your orders from Harry,' Hank said, and walked away. The two men began unloading sheets of custom-built paneling from the forklift. Shortly before noon, as the podium was beginning to take shape, Two men in suits arrived. Secret Service, one man said, and they both flashed ID. We're just looking the platform over, the agent said to Zeke. What are you two men doing here? We're assembling and installing the podium, Zeke replied. Let me just make a note of your name, the agent said, looking at the laminated ID badge hanging from Zeke's pocket. He jotted down some information, then he did the same with Rico. "'How do we get under the platform?' the agent asked Zeke. "'There's a door at the back and one at the front,' Zeke replied. "'What are we going to find down there?' "'Nothing, except a closet where all the telephone, electrical, and sound system wiring is let in.' "'Thanks. Carry on,' the agent said, and the two men walked away. Zeke went back to work, breathing easier. When the quitting whistle blew, Zeke turned to Rico. "'I'll take it from here,' he said. There's not much more to do. Whatever you say, Rico replied. See you tomorrow. Zeke continued to work on the podium as the rest of the work crew made their way off the Coliseum floor. Finally, he was alone. Using a power saw, he cut a section out of the floor under the podium, then hinged it, creating a trap door. He had planned this to give quick access to the wiring closet below. Nobody would think it was anything but a good idea. He let himself down into the closet, switched on the light, and gazed at the wiring installation. Slowly, he identified each wire and where it led. Each wire was marked with a strip of masking tape, and its destination was written on the tape. 
He located the wire that would lead to the microphone on the premise that once the mic was installed and working, nobody would pay any further attention to it. He looked around the closet, which was nothing more than a six-by-eight-foot framework of two-by-fours, clad in quarter-inch plywood. All that this room needed for his purposes, he decided, was a ceiling. He took some measurements, then went behind the platform where materials were stacked, found a piece of scrap plywood that was big enough, then trimmed it with his power saw and went back into the closet. He cut a number of holes in it for the various bunches of wires to run through, then he re-ran all the wires and tacked the plywood to the framework. It was hardly noticeable since it did not impede the work of the electricians, but now he had a gap of four inches between the new closet ceiling and the plywood that made up the floor of the platform. The gap would be there when he needed it, very near the new trap door. He cleaned up after himself, gathered his tools, and went whistling home, content with his day's work. Will pulled his black bow tie tight and examined it closely. He had once seen Vance Calder perform that task in a movie, and his result had been a lot better than Will's. Kate came out of the dressing room where she had been applying her makeup. Better let me take a look at that, she said. Wow, Will breathed. That is some dress. It was black, short, and low cut. I thought it would be good for the Hollywood glitterati to know that there are tits back east, Kate replied coolly. How does it come off? Will asked. Later. Now let me at that bow tie. She did something to it, and when Will checked it in the mirror, it looked almost as good as Vance Calder's. There was a rap on the bedroom door. Come in, Will said. A Secret Service agent poked his head in. No bulletproof vests tonight, Will said adamantly. No problem, Senator, the agent replied. We've already checked the name, date of birth, and social security number of every guest and every Calder employee, including the caterers. Everybody's clean. The car is ready when you are. Will glanced at his watch. 5.45. They were to be there early for an early dinner with the Calders before the other guests arrived. Are we ready, Kate? Kate smoothed the front of the dress. We're ready. Where's Peter? The boy appeared from the kitchen, looking surprisingly mature in his dinner jacket. The starlets are going to be all over you, Kate said, straightening his tie. That's my dream in life, Peter replied, kissing his mother carefully on the cheek. I understand the callers have paired you up with someone for dinner, Will said. Oh, great, Peter grunted. I'll have to entertain somebody's granddaughter, I guess. Every woman is somebody's granddaughter, Kate said, steering him toward the door. It was only a short drive to the Calder's Bel Air residence. A uniformed guard stood at the gate along with a Secret Service agent, and a crowd of press had already gathered outside the gate. A galaxy of strobes went off at their approach, and Will waved through the window. Kitty has only allowed a couple of pool cameras onto the grounds, he said and a couple of print reporters. It's like a Hollywood opening, Peter said. They drove up to the house, which was a low, sprawling Spanish-style residence with a tiled roof. Vance Calder and his wife, Arrington, were waiting at the front door. Next to them stood Lou Regenstein, and Charlene Joyner was on his arm in an Academy Award-class dress, with cascades of newly-styled blonde hair spilling over her shoulders. Well, here we go. Kate said, eyeing Charlene. Don't bite, Will replied as they got out of the car. There were handshakes and cheek pecks all around. Then as they went into the house, Will spotted what he thought must be the most beautiful creature he had ever seen. He recognized her immediately as the teenage star of a new television series that had gotten a ton of publicity lately. And here's Peter's date, Vance Calder said. Peter, this is Astrid Bergson. Astrid... This is Peter Rule Lee. For just a moment, Peter had the expression of a felled ox. Then he recovered himself and shook the girl's hand. Vance leaned over and whispered to Kate, Don't worry, she's only sixteen, too, and very sweet. They had entered a broad hallway that ran all the way through the house to the gardens beyond, and Vance steered them into the adjacent living room where a butler was waiting with flutes of champagne on a silver tray. Everyone chatted like old friends. P. 
Peter and Astrid, cokes in hand, stood near the fireplace. I've seen your TV show, he said. I think it's terrific. Thank you, the girl replied. I hear you're a chote. That's right. How can you manage both school and the show? Oh, there's a law about that. I'm tutored every day and my grades are very good. How are you enjoying L.A.? Well, mostly I've limited myself to the pool at the Bel Air Hotel. You should see some of the city while you're here. I'd love to do that, he replied. How about I show you around some this weekend? Fantastic. I'm coming east in a couple of years, she said. My deal with the show is that I can leave when college starts. I'm planning to go to the Yale Drama School. Yale sounds great, Peter said. I think I'll go there, too. He gave her his best smile. I was thinking of Harvard, but what the hell? She laughed a wonderful, tinkling laugh through gorgeous teeth. Peter sighed. By the time they were on dessert, the noise level in the hallway outside the dining room had risen to a dull roar. The paying guests were arriving, and if the volume of their laughter was any indication, they were already beginning to get their thousand dollars worth. Arrington Calder set down her coffee cup. I think it's time for us to go and mingle with our guests. Will, we've a microphone set up on the terrace. Perhaps you'd say a few words to them first. Of course, Will said. Arrington took his arm and led him out of the dining room, through the hallway and out onto a terrace, which was elevated over the broad rear lawn and gardens. Everybody followed. As they stepped onto the terrace, applause broke out. Vance stepped up to the microphone. "'Good evening, and thank you all for coming,' he said. "'I think it's time you all met the reason we're here. "'Ladies and gentlemen, the next President of the United States, "'Senator Will Lee.' "'The crowd roared its approval as Will stepped to the microphone. "'Finally the applause died. "'Good evening to you all. First of all, I want to thank our hosts, Vance and Arrington Calder, "'for being so kind as to allow us all to invade their home this evening.' Second, I want to thank them as well as Charlene Joyner and Lou Regenstein of Centurion Studios for organizing this event and for extorting so much money from all of you. It's important for you to know that although there is a limit of $1,000 per person that can be contributed to a candidate, there is still no limit on what an individual can contribute to the Democratic Party, which can use the fund in the general election. Lou Regenstein and his board of directors have been so wildly generous as to contribute a million dollars to the party, and I hope each of you will consider following their example. Now I'd like to introduce you to my family. This is my wife, Kate, and our son, Peter. He put an arm around each of them and pulled them forward as more applause broke out. Kate is here so that she could meet Vance Calder again, and Peter is here so that he could meet Astrid Bergson. Tonight, I want to thank you for more than your financial contribution. I want to thank you for your personal contribution to the political life of your country. People from that far-reaching community we all think of as Hollywood have always taken an interest in national affairs, just as the nation has always taken an interest in them. So many of your faces are so well known to the American people that they have come to think of you as their neighbors out west and they want to know where you stand when it's time to choose the nation's leaders. I am very proud and very grateful that so many of you are standing with me. The Democratic Convention opens tomorrow, and tonight, all across the city, there are other parties like this taking place, though perhaps not quite so well attended as this one. There will be parties, too, for candidates of the Republican Party, and though you may rightly think of them as opponents, after the first Tuesday in November, we are all, Democrats and Republicans, going to have to work together to make this country all that it can be. It is at the center, not the left or the right, where the work gets done, and that new center is where we are all going to have to meet each other and our obligations to our country. We are all in this together, and together we will take this country into the new millennium. We'll step back from the microphone to huge applause. He pulled Kate and Peter forward, and they all waved at the crowd. When the applause had finally died, Vance Calder came to the microphone again. Now that you've gotten your money's worth, dinner is being served. 
We've felled a large number of oxen, and for those of you who are California vegetarians, we have denuded the San Joaquin Valley for your dining pleasure. Will did his level best to shake every hand at the party. He and Kate wandered through the crowd, talking with the guests, laughing at jokes and thanking everyone. Outside of Washington or Georgia, Will had never been to a party where there were so many familiar faces, faces that he had watched hundreds of times at the movies and on television. He posed for pictures with most of them. Then there was a tug at his elbow, and Charlene was there. Kate had fallen back into the crowd. We need to talk alone, Charlene said. Not even if you have a gun, Will said, sotto voce, through a smile. Not here, not with everyone taking pictures. I hope you understand. He turned and grabbed an actor's outstretched hand, thrilled to be saved from a tabloid fate. If Will had felt busy before, the tempo of his existence increased markedly with the beginning of the convention. Will's parents arrived. Billy and Patricia Lee were housed in a suite adjoining Will's, and both began working the telephones, calling delegates in their hotel rooms and on their cell phones, extracting assurances where they could. On the evening of the first ballot, Billy called a meeting in Will's suite. He looked grim. All right, listen up, he said, and the two dozen people in the suite grew quiet. We're not going to win the nomination tonight, he said, and there was a collective gasp. I've counted and recounted, and we just don't have the delegates. The good news is George Keel doesn't have them either. The room burst into babble again. Will stood up. Everybody shut up and listen to Dad, he said. Billy looked around, then continued. I make it that Keel is 12 to 14 delegates short, and we're about 35 short. What we have to do this evening is to make sure we don't lose even a single delegate on the first ballot. If we can do that, then we'll have a better shot on the second ballot, I think. It's important that after the first ballot we pick up some delegates, even if it's only half a dozen. I want instructions to go out to our people on the floor to tell our delegates to hold fast and not expect to walk away with this thing. If we can get through two ballots tonight without losing and maybe pick up a few votes, then we'll have a real shot at winning tomorrow night. Will and I will be calling the delegation chairman on the floor, shoring them up, and I want each of you to make sure that every one of our delegates with a personal phone gets at least one phone call on the floor. It'll make them feel good. Now go to it. Most of the campaign workers left for a meeting room in the hotel where a phone bank had been set up. Each of them had a list of names and numbers to contact. Well, Billy said, what worries me most is California. They'll hold on the first ballot because they'll have to, but on the second ballot, we're going to lose some people. Because of the Castle Point Naval Base? That's right. I've heard from some friends that Keel's people have been promising some of the California delegates that if he's elected, he won't close the base. But he's already committed to following the commission's recommendation on Castle Point, just as I have. Right. And we have to hammer that home with every California delegate. When they call the roll, California is the fifth state to be called in the first big state. If there are significant defections, it could start a snowball effect for Keel. But if we can hold, it may give a lot of other delegates some backbone. So you and I are going to personally contact every California delegate we can. Well, let's get started, Will said. By tradition, he couldn't appear at the convention until after the balloting. So he began working the phones. Zeke was under the convention platform with two Secret Service agents. It was the third set of agents he'd given the tour, and this pair were being very meticulous. He went through every under-platform installation, working from a detailed set of drawings, pointing out the wiring plans for lighting, sound system, teleprompters, and telephones. The agents knew what they were doing, Zeke realized. These guys were technically oriented, and they understood everything pointed out to them. How many telephone lines? an agent asked. Six to the podium, Zeke said. Another six to the rest of the platform and the green rooms. It's a Lucent Partner Plus office system with a max of 24 extensions, and they're all in use. An agent popped the cover on the main phone panel and went through it line by line and extension by extension. It's been checked and rechecked by the people who installed it, Zeke said. It's working perfectly. The agent nodded. I just wanted to be sure there was nothing in the box but telephone wiring. The man had given Zeke an idea. 
He'd planned to detonate with a timing device, but now he realized that these people might very well spot that. The telephone system offered a more elegant solution. Above their heads, a roar went up from the crowd. Sounds like they've finished the balloting, an agent said. Will sat with his father before the big screen TV in the living room of his suite, a list of delegates before them. The last of the big states, Texas, was polling its delegation for the second ballot. If we can get past Texas without losing too many delegates, we can hold our own, Billy said, but not much better than that. The television commentators were having a field day. They had not seen a race this close for many conventions. The Texas vote was announced by the delegation chairman to a roar from the whole convention. We're alive, Billy said, but there are still 50 delegates from other smaller states to go. They held Utah and Vermont, then lost two Virginia delegates. Washington, West Virginia, and Wisconsin came in as expected. We have a net loss of one delegate, Billy said. It's not much, but it scares the hell out of me. Only Wyoming was left to vote, with only three delegates, all of whom had voted for Keel on the first ballot. They were sitting together in the front row. Mr. Chairman, the delegation leader boomed into the microphone. Wyoming is unanimous for Senator Will Lee. Well, I'll be damned. We got a net gain of two, Billy cackled. I wish it was six, but it'll have to do. Will waited for the governor of California to come on the line. It was ten minutes before twelve noon, and the California delegation to the convention was about to meet in caucus. Hello, Will, Governor Morrison said. Thad, how are you? Rushed, we're about to meet. I wanted to talk to you personally before you caucus, Will said. It's about the Castle Point Naval Base. I hope you've found a way to change your position, Will, Morrison said. George Keel has. I know. So what's it going to be? I've got to go into that meeting and tell my delegates where you stand. I can't change my position, Thad. I've taken a public position on accepting the Commission's findings, and I've done it for the right reasons. I want you to tell your people, for me, that it's my belief that we'll never get the defense budget under control if we're going to allow political interference of this kind, and I won't be a party to it. George doesn't seem to have a problem with it. Thad, let me put a couple of questions to you. Shoot, but be quick. First of all, are your delegates going to support a candidate who makes a political promise to accept the Commission's findings, then reverses his position for self-serving reasons? That's a legitimate question. I'll put it to the delegates. One more. If George is willing to reverse himself now to get your delegates' votes, what's to prevent him from reversing himself again after the election? Morrison was briefly silent. I'll put that question to them, too, he said finally. That's all I've got to say, Thad. Do your delegates understand that the nomination may be riding on how they vote on this? If they don't, I'll explain it to them. Will you call me back and let me know how they vote? I can't do that, Will. This is a closed caucus, and the results are not to be revealed until the vote tonight. Thanks for listening, Thad. Good luck, Will. He hung up. Will replaced the receiver and turned to the group in the living room of his suite. Well, that's it. It's all I can do. What did Morrison say? Kitty asked. Just that he'd put my views to the delegates. Tim Coleman spoke up. I've been doing the math, he said. If we lose eight or ten votes from California, it doesn't have to cause a snowball, not if we do our work on the other delegations. If we can change a few votes our way, we can hold for at least another ballot. We can't go on coming in second, Will said. I think that after this ballot, we'll have trouble holding delegates from all over the country. If we lose this one, even by a few votes, we're done. Patricia Lee spoke up. Will, why don't we talk about who your choice for vice president is going to be when you win? Everybody burst out laughing. That's my ma, Will said. 
Across town, Zeke went into an electronics shop and began buying. He bought a telephone voicemail system that was compatible with the lucent equipment being used for the convention podium, a number of other parts, and some lucent labels. Back in his room, he unscrewed the top of the voicemail box, and using the wiring diagram that had come with the unit, he traced the printed circuits for various functions. When he had all the functions traced, he soldered a thin wire to a circuit, then attached the other end to a flashlight bulb. Using the system's built-in recorder, he recorded a list of voicemail options. Finally, he connected the voicemail system to Rose's phone line, and using his cell phone, called the number. Welcome to the podium of the Democratic Convention, his own voice said. Please choose from one of the following three options. If you wish to be connected to the podium, press 1. If you wish to hang up, press 2. And if you wish to set off an explosive charge that will blow the podium and anyone near it to eternity, press 3. Zeke laughed aloud at his own joke. He pressed 3 and watched as the flashlight bulb lit up. Bingo. Then he re-recorded the third option. Now it said, If you wish to be placed on hold for the rest of your life, press 3. That should keep anyone who is accidentally connected to the number from pressing 3. Chuckling to himself, he packed the equipment into a bag and left for the Coliseum. Senator, Kitty said, can I ask the obvious question? I mean, I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you. Go ahead, Will said. If George Keel can play this game, why can't you? Why can't you just call Thad Morrison back and tell him you'll keep the base open, then after you're elected, close the fucking thing? Would you really rather be right than president? Because to tell you the truth, I'd rather be wrong and be the president's press secretary. Come on, Kitty, you know better than that. All right, you wouldn't make the next edition of Profiles and Courage. But you'd have a shot at running the country, you know. Kitty, if somebody had told me six months ago that I'd find myself in this position, then maybe I wouldn't have taken so firm a stand on the commission's report. Maybe I'd have found a way to weasel out of it or rationalize it or something. But that's not the way it happened. As it turned out, I took that position. Then I repeated it ad nauseum to get other senators to support it. Then I told everybody who'd listen that I wouldn't change it. So I'm stuck with it. And that's that. So if we're going to win this thing, we're going to have to find another way to do it. Let's get started. Zeke waited for a lull in the afternoon's proceedings. Then, when the maintenance workers were on a coffee break, he went into the closet under the podium and installed his system, connecting it to the last of the six telephone lines coming into the podium. Only one of the numbers was given out. A caller dialed the first number, and if it was busy, the call rolled over to the second number and so on until all six lines were busy. When they were, a caller would get a busy signal. Only if the caller directly dialed the number for the sixth line would he reach Zeke's voicemail system, and only the telephone company and Zeke had that number. Zeke had copied it from the installer's records. He attached a lucent label to the black box. He doubted if anyone would notice it, but if somebody took the lid off the box, the insides would look like nothing more than part of the phone system. He would attach the explosives later, after everyone was used to seeing the box there in the closet, and after the closet had been inspected numerous times. Tim Coleman put down the phone in Will's suite. It was a little after five. What? Will asked. That was an acquaintance of mine who was at the California Delegations Caucus. You didn't tell me you knew anyone like that, Will said. I didn't want to mention it in case the call never came. And what was the result of the caucus? Fifteen delegates switched their votes to Keel. Will sagged. Keel was only 14 votes short of the nomination. Patricia Lee spoke up. It's not over, she said. We've still got a chance to gain votes from other delegations. Tim shook his head. I don't see how we can make up that many votes before tonight. Let's get to work, Will said. Will and his inner circle of around two dozen people had a buffet supper in his suite as the convention opened and the balloting began. His campaign had put every possible person on the convention floor to canvas delegations, looking to change as many votes as possible. California, 
the chairman called out. The television screen was filled with the face of Governor Thad Morrison, who was deep in conversation on a cell phone. California, the chairman called again. Morrison held the phone against his chest and grabbed a microphone. Mr. Chairman, he said, his voice booming around the Coliseum, California wishes to delay its vote until the end of balloting. Will grabbed Tim Coleman. What's going on, he asked. I don't know, Tim replied, shaking his head. I've heard nothing from my source as far as I know. We're still losing 15 votes. Something is going on here, Will said. I wish to God I knew what it was. Tim had a chart and was marking the votes of the various delegations, while Kitty used a calculator to do a running total. The balloting finished. We've got 222 votes, and Keel has 256, Kitty said. Then we're done, Tim replied, his shoulders sagging. We haven't heard from California, Patricia Lee said. California, the chairman called out. Here we go, Kate said. Mr. Chairman, Thad Morrison called out. California votes 39 for Will Lee. Cheering broke out. That gives us 261, Kitty said, and we need 270 to win the nomination. Keel only needs 14 votes. And, Morrison continued, 15 votes for George Keel. The Keel supporters erupted. Pandemonium reigned in the hall. The chairman banged his gavel to no avail. Will put his head back and closed his eyes. Something's happening, Tim said, pointing at the big screen TV. Thad Morrison was back at the microphone shouting something. What's he doing, Will asked. He's trying to get recognized, Tim said. Gradually, the chairman regained order. The chair recognizes Governor Thad Morrison of the great state of California. Mr. Chairman, Morrison said, I request a poll of the delegation. What's the point, Kitty asked. We've lost. As the polling began, a phone rang and somebody answered it. It's for you, a worker said, handing Will the phone. Not now, Will said, riveted to the TV. It's the vice president. Will took the phone. Hello? Will, Joe Adams said. I want to apologize to you. What do you mean? I assume you're watching TV. Yes. I've been on the phone with Thad Morrison three times this evening. That's why California didn't vote at first. And what were the two of you talking about? I've been trying to nail down some information all afternoon, and I finally confirmed what I had suspected. And what was that, Joe? I found it suspicious that George Keel would reverse himself as he did about the Castle Point base. It would have been unlike him to do that. But he did. And for a reason. There was a leak from a staffer on the Commission on Base Closings. The Commission is going to recommend that Castle Point remain open. Will's jaw dropped. I don't believe it. Believe it. George Keel found out about it. That's why he promised Thad Morrison he'd keep the base open. And when did Thad Morrison find out about this? I was telling him when California was called on to vote. Tim was yelling, We've got five more delegates back. Tim tells me we've got five California delegates back so far, Will said. That means George can't win on this ballot. And more to come, I hope, Adam said. I think the delegates from the Castle Point area wanted to make a point. They voted as they promised their districts they would. Now, with this new information, they feel they can vote as they wish. Let's hope they wish you were the nominee. We've got 12 back, Tim shouted. We need two more to win. A moment later, it was over. The chairman spoke up. The chair records 54 votes for Lee, none for Keel. Senator Will Lee is nominated. His last words were drowned out by the roar from the convention floor. People were dancing around Will's suite, hugging and kissing. Hands clapped him on the back. Women smeared him with lipstick. His wife and mother both embraced him. So, Will, his mother said, who's going to be your vice presidential nominee? Someone came to Will with a phone. It's George Keel. Will got everyone quiet, then picked up the phone. 
Congratulations, Will, Keel said. Thank you, George. It was a tough fight. You ran a hell of a campaign. Will, I want to put everything I've got at your disposal. I've got about four million dollars in the kitty and a lease on an airplane that's a lot nicer than yours. Thank you, George. I'm very grateful to you. There was a silence. Will decided to break it. George, I'd be honored and very pleased if you would be my running mate. I'll give that very serious thought, Will. When can we talk more about it? Let's have breakfast tomorrow morning at eight, Will said. My place. Your place at eight, Keel said, then hung up. Will put the phone down. Patricia Lee spoke up. Did I just hear you offer George Keel the job? You did. But we didn't talk about this, Tim Coleman complained. We should have discussed it. There was nothing to discuss, Will said. George came within a hair of winning the nomination. It would be an insult to nearly half the delegates not to ask him. He's got as good an organization as we have. He's better plugged in with party officials all over the country than I am. He's an expert on foreign policy, and I'm not. And, he said, smiling, he's got four million dollars and a very nice airplane to offer us. Well chosen, Kitty shouted. Somebody discovered a case of champagne, and corks began to pop. Will's father sidled over. You didn't say whether Keel accepted, Billy Lee said to his son. We're having breakfast tomorrow morning, Will said. Be careful what you give him. He can be hard to handle. I'll keep that in mind, Will said. Zeke waited in line with the other workers while the Secret Service ran each of them through the metal detectors. He wasn't worried until he saw the dogs. Two Labrador retrievers were coming down the line with their handlers, sniffing at everyone. Zeke shifted the box to his other hand to keep it as far away from them as possible. He'd never dealt with sniffer dogs, and he began looking around for the quickest way out of the building. A dog passed him, sniffed at his clothes and his lunchbox. Hold out the cardboard box, his handler said. Zeke held out the box. His plan was to hit the man with his metal lunchbox and run like hell. It wasn't much, but it was all he had. He had packaged the explosive into two zippered plastic bags, then scrubbed any explosive's residue from his hands. After changing clothes, he had sliced open a large chocolate cake he had bought, hollowed out the bottom, and replaced the top. Now the dog was showing a great interest in his cardboard box. Set the box on the table and open it, the man said, and his hand was on his gun. He had one more shot at this before running, Zeke thought. He set down the box and untied the string. The agent opened the box and turned to his dog. Rocky, we're not looking for chocolate cake here. He turned to Zeke. This dog would do anything for chocolate. What's the cake for? For the guys in my crew. It's their last day and my girlfriend baked it for them. Okay, the man said, and turned to his next customer. Sweating, but breathing easier, Zeke walked into the Coliseum with a pound of gelignite. Will opened the door himself. George Keel was standing there, dressed for golf. At the bottom of the path, a passel of reporters stood, shouting questions at both of them. Come in, George, and let's get away from the noise. You playing golf today? At the Bel Air Country Club, Keel said. My clubs are in the car. You want to join us? Wish I could, but it's a big day, and I've got a speech to write. You didn't already have it written, Will? Keel asked. That shows a lack of confidence. Will passed Keel a tray of pastries. It shows a superstition about not anticipating too much. Have a seat. The two men sat down at the table with their breakfast. Have you thought about running with me? Will asked. I haven't thought about anything else, Keel said. Tell me what your concerns are about running with me. I don't have any concerns at all about running. I look forward to it, in fact. My concern is that I don't want to be a wooden Indian vice president. Well, I don't want that either, Will replied. How do you see yourself operating in the vice presidency? Two things, Keel said. I want to be a deputy president as well as a vice president. I want to get the same briefings that you do, and I want unfettered access to you. 
Well, that goes without saying, Will said. I wouldn't have it any other way. Good. The second thing is, I want to run foreign policy from top to bottom. I want to choose the major appointees and give them their instructions. George, let's be perfectly clear on this, Will said. The president runs foreign policy, and that's it. Of course, I'll want your advice on every move and on every appointment, but final judgment will have to rest with me. You know I can't delegate a major responsibility like foreign policy. Then I don't see how I can do it. You can do it, George. Tell you what, and this is just between you and me. I don't want to read about it in the papers. I'll give you a veto on the Secretary of State appointment. Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, Keel said. The National Security Advisor is a member of the President's personal staff. I can't give you that. But I'll certainly want your opinion on my options for that post. Keel stared into his coffee. Come on, George, you're going to have to trust me. I suppose so, Keel said. Listen, if you'd rather be Secretary of State, I'll give you that. Keel shook his head. No, I'd rather be over the Secretary of State. And you will be. What if we disagree? I'll bend over backwards to see your point of view, but if there's a disagreement on a serious matter, I'll have to rely on my own judgment. It can't be any other way. Keel nodded. All right. I don't guess I can get a better deal than that. Then let's announce it together, Will said. The two men left the suite and walked down the path toward the waiting throng of press. Zeke closed the closet door behind him, took the cover off the voicemail system, and began soldering. It took him less than ten minutes to run and conceal the wires. He replaced the plywood ceiling of the closet. Later in the day, it would take him even less time to place the explosives. He began humming to himself, Happy Days Are Here Again. While the convention was nominating George Keel for vice president, Zeke went to the employees' lounge and after making sure that he was alone, opened his locker and removed the cake. Quickly he dismembered it, put the gelignite and two detonators into his toolbox, and disposed of the remnants of the cake in a nearby garbage can. Then he took the long walk to the front of the Coliseum, carrying his toolbox, and walked through the rear door under the platform. A Secret Service agent was on duty. "'What's up, Harry?' asked the agent, who knew him by sight. I've just got to run a final check on the sound system, Zeke replied. We don't want any glitches during Lee's speech. Right, the agent said. Go ahead. Zeke walked toward the area under the podium, waving at another agent who was guarding the front entrance to the area. He let himself into the electrical closet and went to work. He removed the screws from the ceiling he had built into the closet, set the gelignite on top of the plywood, and secured it in place with duct tape. Then he had only to connect the previously placed wires to the two detonators and stick them into the explosive. He used two detonators in case one might be defective. He screwed the plywood ceiling back into place and spent a moment checking the appearance of everything, then looked at his watch. Lee was scheduled to speak at 9 o'clock, and it was 7.35 now. He closed his toolbox and left the closet. Everything okay, the agent asked as he departed the platform. Everything's just perfect, Zeke replied. George Keel, having been introduced to the convention, took the podium and made a rousing acceptance speech. Then he introduced the vice president and stepped away from the podium. Joe Adams stepped to the microphone amid thunderous applause. When he had finally quieted them, he began to speak. Let me begin by telling you that if I had hand-picked our candidates myself, the same two fellows would be on this platform tonight. Zeke was already at Los Angeles International Airport. He parked his car in a dim corner of the long-term garage, removed his suitcase from the trunk, changed into a business suit, then found a bottle of Windex and a cloth, and methodically sprayed and wiped every square inch of the Lexus inside and out. Windex had been his friend at the Las Vegas apartment and at Rose's house, and he had removed every trace of himself from both places. 
He wiped the spray bottle clean, dropped it into the trunk with the cloth, and closed it with his elbow. Then he picked up his suitcase and headed for the check-in counter. On the way, he stopped in the shadows for a moment, removed an electric shaver from his bag, popped up the trimmer, and quickly shaved off his mustache. Then he put on a pair of horn-rimmed glasses. At the counter, he presented his ticket, which he had bought at a travel agent's office the day before, then headed for the gate. He had plenty of time, so he checked in again, then took a seat at the bar across from his gate and ordered a scotch. Joe Adams was on the TV, and he had just begun his speech. He was running a little late and long, Zeke thought. His flight left at 9.30, and it was already ten minutes past. He had to make the call before he boarded, and it was going to be tight. Joe Adams was winding up. Now I present to you, and I say this with absolute certainty, the next president of the United States, Will Lee. Adams stepped back and Will came forward. The crowd went wild. Will stood with Joe Adams as the cameras flashed and the crowd roared. Then he waved George Keel forward to join them. The three men stood together on the podium and waved to the crowd. Zeke stared at the television image. They had issued a last call for his flight, and he wanted Lee alone on the podium when he made the call. But why not take out the three of them all at once? Under the platform, Hank Greenbaum, the crew foreman, stepped through the door and showed the agent in charge his ID badge. "'Have you seen Harry Grant?' he asked. "'He's one of my men, the one with the handlebar mustache. "'Yeah, he was in here, I don't know, maybe an hour ago, "'but I haven't seen him since.' "'Funny,' Greenbaum said. "'I haven't been able to find him anywhere.' "'He walked forward to the electrical closet and went inside. "'He picked up the wall phone receiver, "'punched the button for the last line, "'and called the maintenance office. "'This is Greenbaum,' he said. "'You seen anything of Harry Grant?' Last I heard of him, he was doing a final check on the sound system. I wanted to speak to him, too. Hang on a minute, and I'll look around for him, Greenbaum replied. He pressed the hold button and left the closet. Zeke punched the number into his cell phone, staring at the TV screen and the three men. Busy signal. What the hell? he said aloud. Huh? the man next to him said. Sorry. Zeke replied. Mr. Warren? Mr. Warren? A woman's voice said over a loudspeaker. Your flight has boarded and is about to depart. Please come to the boarding gate immediately. Warren was the name on his ticket. Redialing the number, Zeke trotted toward the gate. Still busy. He walked down the ramp and into the plane, redialing. Still busy. I'm sorry, sir, a flight attendant said. You'll have to turn off your cell phone. FCC regulations. Zeke punched off the phone and took his seat. How soon can I use that? he asked, pointing at the air phone on the bulkhead a few seats away. Not until we're at our cruising altitude and the seatbelt sign goes off, she replied. How long will that be? We're pushing back now. Shouldn't be too long. Zeke buckled himself in staring at the air phone. Will stood on the podium alone. My fellow Democrats, he said, I am honored to accept your nomination. The crowd roared. Will quieted them and began his speech. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first officer speaking. The captain is pretty busy. We're climbing through 25,000 feet now, and we should be at our cruising altitude of 33,000 feet shortly. Relief swept over Zeke. He looked at his watch, 9.45. Lee should be right in the middle of his speech. The first officer continued his spiel as Zeke stared at the airphone. He felt the airplane level off, and he looked up at the seatbelt sign, which was still on. The airplane began to buck and lurch. We're encountering some weather this evening, the first officer said, so we'll be leaving the seatbelt sign on for a little longer until things quiet down. We could be encountering some severe turbulence, so I must caution you to keep your seatbelts tightly fastened until we're able to turn off the seatbelt light. 
Zeke flagged down a flight attendant who was struggling up the aisle. "'Miss, would you please hand me that telephone?' he asked, pointing at the airphone. "'I'm sorry,' she replied, "'but you'd need to place your credit card in the phone before the receiver will release, "'and I have to get to my own seat now. The turbulence is getting pretty bad.' "'Zeke fished a credit card out of his pocket. "'Could you do it for me?' "'All right,' she said, reaching for the card. "'Zeke suddenly snatched it back. "'Never mind,' he said. "'The attendant went to her seat and buckled herself in. "'He couldn't use a credit card. "'The name on it was Harry Grant, "'and the records would tell the cops which flight he had taken. "'God damn it!' he spat. "'Sir,' the woman next to him said sternly, "'I know it's rough up here, but please watch your language.' "'Zeke continued to swear.' but only in his head. Will wound up his speech and once again called Joe Adams and George Keel to the podium to share in the ovation. A little before two o'clock the following morning, a man named Walter Edmonds stood up in a bar on Melrose Avenue and, staggering a little, made his way to a nearby payphone. He'd had too much to drink and he already had one DUI on his driving record. He'd have to call his wife to come and get him, and she was not going to be happy about that. He dropped a quarter into the phone, and bleary-eyed began punching in numbers, hardly able to see the keypad. The phone began to ring. Suddenly a male voice said, "'Welcome to the podium of the Democratic Convention.' "'What?' Edmund said, outraged that he had gotten a wrong number. He reached into his pocket for another quarter, and as he did so lost his balance, falling against the phone.' His shoulder struck the keypad. The Los Angeles Coliseum was lit only by emergency lighting at this time of night. The night watchman stopped in the high seats and inserted his key into the time clock. Before he could turn it, a fireball rose from the platform at the other end of the building, and the shock wave in the enclosed space knocked him off his feet. He sat on the floor, his back against the wall, and tried to clear his head. His ears ached from the noise and the shock wave. Before he could get up, the sprinkler system came on, immediately soaking him. A moment later, from somewhere outside, he heard sirens, and they were coming his way. The van drove slowly down the street past the row of neat houses. The Secret Service agent in the front seat spotted the number first. That's it, he said, but keep going. He held his radio to his lips. It's quiet at the house. The front door is open, but there's a screen door that might be latched. I want two vehicles in the alley behind the house. Don't go in until you hear the word from me and use maximum caution. No unnecessary radio traffic. He turned to the driver. Make a U-turn and stop two doors short of the house. He buckled on his helmet and zipped up his flak jacket. Sixteen men, four agents, and twelve in the LAPD SWAT team hit the house simultaneously from front and rear. They swarmed around the ground floor, kicking open doors. The agent led a group up the stairs. The two bedroom doors were open, and the agent could see a bare foot across the doorway to one. "'All clear!' someone shouted. The agent went into the room and looked at the body of the naked woman. "'I want an evidence team in here and tell them to bring a rape kit. I want swabs from the woman.' He looked around the bedroom. Except for the fact that there was a dead woman in the room and that the bed was bare of sheets, nothing seemed amiss. The technician read from his notes, The woman had sex, but I can't tell you even approximately when. I want semen samples for DNA. There aren't any, the tech said. She was douched with something that may be window cleaner. The bed sheets were in the washing machine downstairs, still wet, reeking of bleach. This is one careful guy. We haven't been able to come up with a single fingerprint that doesn't belong to the woman. Shit, the agent said. Another agent came into the room. Here's what we've got so far, he said, reading from a pad. This Harry Grant rents an apartment in Vegas. It's empty and extremely clean. He has a bank account with less than $100 in it, a social security number, and two credit cards, and he owns a two-year-old Lexus ES300. Here are his driver's license and work ID photographs. He handed his chief the pictures. The agent looked at them. 
The big mustache will be the first to go. Then he'll look like anybody. I want renderings of the photographs, clean-shaven and bearded. My guess is his car is parked at a local airport, and it's just as clean as this house. The guy is a pro, the other agent said. The chief shook his head. Not just a pro. A fanatic. Run these photographs against our files on militias, white supremacist groups, anti-government organizations. We've got to have something on him. Will was lying in bed, spent and happy, having just made love to Kate. She was singing in the shower. He could not remember when he had felt so relaxed, so relieved, so unanxious. He flicked on the television. And the ATF is saying that the explosive used at the Coliseum was the same type that was stolen from a construction site less than a mile away. Police and the FBI are looking for this man. Two photographs of a sandy-haired man in his 40s with a handlebar mustache flashed on the screen. He is Harry Grant, of a Las Vegas address, who has been employed as a maintenance worker at the Los Angeles Coliseum. Police and Secret Service personnel raided the house where Grant rented a room early this morning. His landlady, Mrs. Rosa Rivera, 41, was found dead at the scene, having been strangled. Kate came into the room wearing only a towel. Why do you look so funny, she asked. It's something about an explosion at the Coliseum, Will said, switching to CNN. Anchorwoman Lori Dew came on. Secret Service sources have told CNN that the explosives planted under the Democratic Convention platform at the Los Angeles Coliseum were probably set to go off during the speeches last night, but somehow didn't detonate until the early hours of this morning. A Coliseum security guard was the only witness to the explosion. Kate sat on the bed. It started, she said. Don't jump to conclusions, Will said, getting up. I will if I want to, she replied, staring at the television. As he climbed into the shower, Will didn't doubt for a moment that he had been the target of the explosion. Zeke got off the bus at a crossroads and his son Danny was waiting for him in the pickup. "'Hey, Daddy,' Danny said, kissing Zeke on the cheek. "'Hey, son,' Zeke said, slapping the boy in the back. "'You want to go straight home? "'That's good, but I won't be there long.' "'How'd your trip go?' "'Not so good,' Zeke said. The chief of Will's Secret Service detail sat across the coffee table explaining what they knew. We haven't been able to connect this man with any organization so far, but I have no doubt that he's a member of some group. He had a complete, verifiable identity established. That takes time and money. And Grant had no visible means of support except a bogus computer business. Do you know what flight he took last night? Will asked. No. Half the people on airplanes are businessmen flying alone. We've run down every single person who bought a ticket with cash at the airport, but he was apparently too smart for that. We don't even know if he actually left the city. Leaving his car at the airport could have just been a decoy. Do you think he was the same man who was in Santa Fe? The agent nodded. No doubt of it. He was registered at La Fonda under the Grant name. Our people are checking out the room, but it's been cleaned a couple of dozen times since he was there. The parking attendant at the hotel remembered his car. Will nodded. Is the airplane ready to leave? It will be by the time we get to Van Nuys, the agent said. We're putting you on the Keel campaign airplane. All right, Will said. We'd better get packed. Zeke sat in his living room drinking coffee, surrounded by the other men in his group. The women were in the kitchen. That's about it, he said. Somebody used the telephone line I had the stuff connected to, so I kept getting busy signals. It's an incredibly long shot, but it happened. What made it go off in the middle of the night? One of the men asked. I don't know. Maybe somebody called the wrong number. Who knows? 
I like your technique, another man said. We should use it again sometime. It didn't work, the first man pointed out. A fluke. I think it was brilliant, Zeke. It should have worked. Shoulda, woulda, coulda, Zeke said. Next time I'm going to have to use more direct means. That's going to be dangerous, Zeke. I think it was Harry Truman who said that anybody could kill a president if he didn't mind dying himself. That goes for a candidate, too. Zeke, you're no good to us dead. Right now, I'm not much good to you alive, either, Zeke replied. George Keel's airplane was one of the new Boeing business jets. There was a bedroom and a shower aft and an office adjacent. Up front, there were seats for 34 staff and press. Poor George, Kate said, settling into a comfortable armchair. Now he'll have to fly in that flea pit you were using. You don't know George, Will said. With his connections, he'll have something lined up in a hurry. I'll bet he was on the phone to Boeing before he made his acceptance speech. The airplane was over Kansas on the flight to Washington when the news came that the president was dead. By the time they landed, the funeral had already been set for two days hence. Will and Kate arrived at the house about dark. I'd hoped you could just rest while the Republicans hold their convention, Kate said. I'll rest, Will said. The funeral is just one day. Kate turned to the Secret Service detail chief. I don't want my husband killed at that funeral, she said. Don't worry, Mrs. Lee, the man replied. The senator's detail is of presidential proportions now, and that funeral is going to have the tightest security in the history of the world. You'd better be right, Kate replied. Zeke logged onto the Internet and did a search for Senator Will Lee. Immediately he found the campaign website, and shortly he had the senator's travel schedule, which the site said was updated daily. He printed the schedule and logged off. Later, at Harve's house, he met with his group. Okay, he said. I've got the senator's travel schedule for the rest of the campaign. Won't it change from time to time? One of the men asked. Sure. So what I want to do is pick an event that won't be changed, something the senator can't afford to miss. Any ideas? Harve asked. The senator and Efton are debating three times, Zeke said. I reckon the last one is the most important, and it's an event the senator wouldn't miss for anything. It's a week before the election. Where? Zeke permitted himself a small smile. At Ford's Theater. Everybody burst out laughing. I love it! Harve shouted, and everybody laughed again. Finally, they quieted down. How you want to do this? Harve asked. I want to shoot him, Zeke replied, from somewhere in the theater. It has a certain poetry about it. How are you going to penetrate? A man asked. I don't think the maintenance worker thing will work again after L.A., Zeke said. I've thought about this, and I need an identity that's unlikely to be questioned at all. Anybody got any ideas? Catholic priest, someone suggested. I don't think I know enough about being Catholic to fool anybody I got into a conversation with. Harve leaned back in his chair. So what do you know about, he asked. Electrical, carpentry, construction, that's about it. You know about the Army, Harve said. We all do. Good point, Zeke said. Maybe I could move around in uniform without getting questioned too closely. Harve turned to the youngest man in the group. Benny, you're our hacker. Have you ever broken into a Pentagon computer? What will I be looking for? We need a real Army officer who's serving in the D.C. area. Virginia, Maryland, the Pentagon, maybe. He ought to be about Zeke's age, and it wouldn't hurt if they shared a general physical description. We'll need his jacket, basically, his personal file. Okay, I'll have a shot at that. How soon? As soon as possible. Can you start today? Okay. Zeke spoke up. Harv, you are a sergeant, Major. What else am I going to need? An ID card, Harv replied. I know a guy can make you one. Then you'll need some orders that will give you some freedom of movement if you're questioned. I can cut those on my own computer. Nothing to it. What about uniforms? Zeke asked. Once we get you the ID card, you can walk onto any army base in the country, 
Go to the PX and buy whatever you want. We can pick up some insignia and ribbons at a gun show. You need any weapons? Zeke shook his head. I've still got the Czech sniper rifle and I'll load some special ammo. Some that'll take his head off. Good. Okay, let's get to work on this. Zeke was out back working with the log splitter. He enjoyed the effort and the growing pile of logs was a satisfying sight. Danny would stack them against the house as they came out of the splitter. When they were done, Zeke sat down on a bench and looked out across the mountains. Danny came and sat down beside him. Daddy, I know I'm not supposed to talk about it, but I get the feeling you're leaving again soon. That's right, son, Zeke said, and it's for your own good and your mother's and your sister's good that you don't know too much. That's okay, I understand. Listen, son, there's a real good chance I won't be coming back from this one. Is it as dangerous as that? Danny asked. Zeke nodded. I'm afraid there just isn't any other way to do it. I'm going to have to put myself on the line for this one. If you don't come back, will we know what happened? Yeah, I expect you will. I don't think they'll be able to trace me back here, though. I don't think you'll be bothered. What do you want me to do if you don't come back? Run the place. Take care of your mother and your sisters. You can always go to Harv for advice. Danny nodded. What about the movement? You've never let me have anything to do with that. You're not old enough to be of much use yet, Danny. It'll be all you can do to manage the place. After the girls are grown, it might be different. I'll tell Harv how I feel about this. He'll respect my wishes. Daddy, I was thinking I might like to go to college. What for? Zeke asked sharply. Haven't I taught you everything you need to know? Sure, Daddy, but, you know, I thought it might be good to improve my mind. Later on, I'd like to travel some, see the world. I even thought about the Navy. Let me tell you something, boy, Zeke said. This country round cheer is all you need to know about. As long as you can run this place and take care of your family, you'll be a man, and college won't make you any better. Neither will the Navy. Danny nodded, but Zeke wasn't sure he'd made a dent in that hard head. The boy had an independent streak. Okay, Daddy, Danny said, rising from the bench. Whatever you say. You know I'll take care of the family and the place. Zeke stood up. Good man, he said, clapping the boy in the back. Zeke watched as he walked toward the barn. Will stared out the window of the Boeing at the Midwestern landscape and reflected on the past weeks. The Republican National Convention had met a week after the president's funeral and nominated Representative Howard Efton as its presidential candidate and Governor Robert Mallon of Arizona as its candidate for vice president. As a result of the attempt on Will's life, the security at the Republican Convention was unprecedented, and Will's Secret Service detachment had tripled in size. Now there were four agents attendant on his person at all times, while others worked the crowds and did advance planning for the campaign. Now Will convened a meeting of his traveling staff around the conference table in the big jet. Moss Mallet, the campaign's pollster, had joined at Kansas City, and now they were bound for Chicago in the campaign's second debate. Tim Coleman and Kitty Conroy sat down. I'm dying to hear this, Moss, Tim said. Me too, Will chipped in. Okay, Moss said. Here it is. Bottom line, we're in some trouble. Be specific, Will said. Specifically, although we're only a point or two behind, nationally we've got the potential of a sizable deficit in electoral votes. Efton could win the popular vote very narrowly and still drub us in the electoral college. Where are the big electoral deficits, Will asked. Illinois and California. We've got to win them both or lose the election. It's as simple as that. Thank God the debate is in Chicago, Kitty said. If you do well there, that could be a big, big help. Remember how the first debate helped us in the South? Yeah, Will replied, and I'm beginning to wish the third debate were in California. That would be nice, Moss said. I don't suppose we could arrange that. Not a chance, Kitty replied. We're committed to the League of Women Voters for the Washington debate, and so is Efton. 
It's been hard enough to pin him down to these debates without starting to ask for changes now. The phone on the conference table rang, and Tim picked it up. It's Sam Merriweather, he said, handing the phone to Will. Will took the phone. And how's my campaign director, he asked. Happy as a clam, I hope? Not exactly, Merriweather said. His voice was a little scratchy on the airphone. What's up? Two things. First, Larry Eugene Moody's appeal has been rejected by the Supreme Court. He's scheduled to die on the Saturday night before the Tuesday election. And how do you think that's going to hurt us, Will asked. Efton's bound to harp on your competence at the trial, Sam said. You'd better be ready for that. All right, we'll be ready for it. You said two things. What else is happening? Eft has backed out of the Chicago debate. What? He says he's too busy campaigning. Well, that's pretty lame. I'll give him hell about it. I think his people are prepared for that or they wouldn't have pulled him out of the debate. Well, shit, Will said. Anything else? Nope. I wish I had some good news. See you later, Sam. Will hung up the phone. What? Tim asked. Eft has backed out of the Chicago debate. I'll call a press conference at the airport, Kitty said. We'll blow him out of the water. Well, I think he's ready for that, Will said. I guess we did too well in the Atlanta debate. He's scared, Kitty said. No, Moss interjected. He's smart. He's obviously run the numbers and concluded that he'll lose fewer votes by pulling out than by debating you and seeming to lose. I think you're right, Will said. And I think Eft is right, too. If that's the case, what's to prevent him from backing out of the Washington debate? Tim asked. Nobody spoke. Do you really think he'd risk doing that? Kitty asked nobody in particular. He would, Moss said, if his numbers supported the decision. We can't let him get out of the Washington debate, Kitty said. We need that one bad. I have to agree, Moss said, but we can't force him to appear. Kitty suddenly brightened. Maybe we can. Maybe we can force him to appear in Chicago, too. You're going to put a gun to his head? Moss asked. In a manner of speaking, let's just go on with the Chicago debate. What are you talking about, Kitty? Will asked. I mean, we go right ahead as planned. We show up at the hall, and we rent a really big TV set and put it on the stage with you. Then we put together a series of F's statements during the campaign and play them back as his part of the debate. Then you answer them. Will's eyebrows went up. Debate a TV set? It'll get a lot of play, Kitty said, and of course you'd have the advantage of knowing what Eft is going to say. The networks would never give us the time for a one-sided debate, Will said. Then we'll buy it, Kitty said, and quick, since the network's already got it scheduled. And if we can make this work against Eft, he won't dare back out of the Washington debate. How much air time do we have to buy? Will asked. They've scheduled 90 minutes, Kitty said, but let's buy only 30. I don't think anybody would sit still for an hour and a half to watch you debate a TV set, but they would for half an hour. Call Tom Black and get him on it too, Will said. Get him to Chicago if necessary. Kitty picked up the phone and started dialing. Was that all Sam had to say? Tim asked. Well, no, Will replied. Larry Moody is going to die in the electric chair three days before the election. The Supreme Court turned down his appeal. We need to think about how this can hurt us. I'm not really sure that it will. Sam thinks Eft will try to find a way to use it against me in the Washington debate. We'll be ready for that, Tim said. But there's something else I'm not sure we can be ready for. What's that? Charlene Joyner. I hadn't thought about Charlene, Will admitted. What do you think she'll do? God only knows, but you know how hot she is to save Moody's life. I have a feeling it could be noisy. I'm not sure how we can plan for that. Neither am I, Will said. Zeke crossed the Potomac and drove to the Fairfax Hotel, where he had booked a room. He changed into his first-class uniform, then enjoyed a good lunch in the Jockey Club restaurant. When he had finished and signed the check, he went to the concierge's desk. 
Good afternoon, Colonel Waldron, the man said, glancing at the name tag on his uniform. How can I help you? I'm interested in Ford's Theater, where Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, Zeke replied. The concierge dug out a brochure. Of course, they have tours there twice a day. You can still make the afternoon one. He gave Zeke a map of the city and showed him how to get to the theater. Thanks very much, Zeke said. He went to the front door and asked the doorman for his car. He found the theater on 10th Street, Northwest, and parked the car, removing the briefcase containing the sniper's rifle from the trunk. He arrived in the lobby just as the tour was starting. Good afternoon, the elderly lady who was the tour guide began, and welcome to Ford's Theater. The woman led the little group of people upstairs. Zeke hung back at the rear and allowed the group to leave him behind. He walked back to the rear of the theater, checking sight lines, and then he saw a small sign pointing up another flight of stairs. It read, Projection Booth. He followed the stairs and came to a door which was ajar. Across the little hallway was a men's room. He pushed the projection room door open and found a light switch. Two large 35-millimeter projectors filled most of the room. There was also a table with two cranks mounted for rewinding reels, and next to the projector was a single theater seat where the projectionist could sit and watch a movie through his own window. Zeke looked carefully at the ceiling and found a large air conditioning duct. He stood on a chair, took out a Swiss Army knife, and unfolded a screwdriver blade. In a moment, he had the grating off. Then he took the briefcase and slid it into the duct where it fit very nicely. He replaced the grate, switched off the light, and left the room. As he departed, he noted a ladder fixed to the wall. He climbed and pushed open a trap door in the ceiling. He stuck his head up and looked around the roof. Maybe he wouldn't have to die after all. He rejoined the group, which was just leaving Lincoln's box. "'Oh, did we lose you?' the guide asked. "'I was just looking for the men's room,' he replied. As the group walked back toward the stairs, Zeke stepped into Lincoln's box and stood looking out over the theater. John Wilkes Booth, he knew, had slipped into the box as Lincoln watched a performance of a comedy, Our American Cousin. He had crept behind Lincoln and fired a single bullet into the back of his head from close range. Soon, Zeke mused, he would add another interesting page to the history of Ford's theater. He'd give the tour guides something new to talk about. Last night, a national audience was treated to the second of two debates between the presidential candidates, but with a difference. This time, Representative Howard F. Efton didn't show. Well, not exactly, anyway. Mr. Efton, after taking a bit of a drubbing in the Atlanta debate three weeks ago, backed out, citing a campaign schedule that was too busy to include the city of Chicago, his advisors having apparently told him that he had less to lose from canceling than from showing up. But Senator Will Lee seems to have gotten better advice from his people. Not only did he show up, he dragged F. Efton in by the scruff of the neck, as it were, and debated him whether he liked it or not. The invited audience arrived for the telecast to find a big-screen TV set up on one side of the stage, Efton's, and a lectern on the other, Lee's. A moderator introduced both candidates, and the debate began. Lee's staff had assembled a series of Efton statements from campaign appearances, speeches on the House floor, and from Efton's acceptance speech at the Republican convention. When Efton was called on to speak, he appeared on the TV screen and made his statement. Then Senator Lee was allowed to rebut. When the process was reversed, Efton clips were chosen to state the opposite position. But if the audience was surprised by this turn of events, the biggest surprise came in the way this spectacle was conducted. The Lee campaign could have chosen Efton clips to make him look bad or to set him up for Lee's punchlines, but they didn't do that. Instead, they treated the Republican candidate respectfully, showing clips that Efton might have chosen himself. The result was not just a political stunt, but something very close to a real debate. Furthermore, the Lee staff issued a statement claiming that Senator Lee had not been told in advance which Efton clips would be used so that his responses would be spontaneous. Who won? 
Far be it from me to offer an opinion, but an unscientific telephone call-in poll on the 11 o'clock news gave Lee the nod by a 20-point margin. We'll have to wait a day or two for the national pollsters to do their work and tell us how much Lee really benefited, if at all. But one thing Will Lee seems to have accomplished is to pretty much guarantee that F. Efton will not duck out of the final debate from Ford's Theater in Washington next week, and that may have been his intention all along. Kitty put down the newspaper, from which she had been reading aloud. And what's more, she said, grinning, we've pulled in more than a dozen editorials from major newspapers around the country saying pretty much the same thing. Will smiled and sipped his coffee. You're a very smart woman, Kitty, he said. We're redoing the schedule for the last week, Tim Coleman said. All your appearances are going to be in Illinois and California, with one or two others on the way to or from. It's driving the Secret Service advance men crazy, but they're getting with the program. Will turned to Moss, his pollster. You think this is the right thing to do, then? Will, it is the only thing to do. My newest numbers project that Efton can win if he takes either Illinois or California, but for you to win, you have to take them both. Will shrugged. Let's do it, then. Zeke was at the office of the League for Women Voters two hours before it opened, and a line had already formed. He cursed himself for not getting up earlier. His plan was all worked out, but in order to make it happen, he had to get inside the theater on the night, and that meant getting a ticket to the debate. The doors opened, and the line inched forward. Finally, there was only one person ahead of him, a small woman with a child in tow. "'This is the absolutely last one?' she asked, holding aloft the ticket. "'The very last,' the woman behind the counter responded. "'You're very lucky.' "'But what about my husband?' the woman demanded. "'My husband has to be there, too.' "'I'm sorry, ma'am,' the woman replied. "'But you're holding the very last ticket available to the public. "'The rest have already been issued to the two campaigns and the press.' "'Why does this always happen to me?' the woman wailed. "'I don't know,' the woman behind the counter said. "'Do you want it or not?' "'The woman turned and faced Zeke. "'Here, soldier,' she said, holding out the ticket. "'You take it.' "'Zeke accepted the ticket with a big smile. "'Congratulations, Colonel,' the woman behind the counter said. "'Now if you'll just step over there "'and give the Secret Service agent some information.' "'She pointed to a man behind the desk. "'Zeke walked over. "'The lady told me to see you.' he said to the man. Right, the agent replied. I'll need your name, your date of birth, and your social security number. You better give me your military serial number, too. Zeke was happy to give the man all of that. Zeke prepared carefully. First he dressed in civilian clothing, went out and bought a car, a late model Toyota Camry, metallic beige in color, using another well-prepared identity. He parked it near Ford's Theater, then took a taxi back to his hotel. He showered, shaved, and packed, then went over the hotel room, wiping every surface with window cleaner. Then he dressed in a pair of lightweight black trousers and a navy blue long-sleeved T-shirt. Over that, he put on the freshly pressed first-class army uniform with its ribbons, insignia, and name tag. Finally, he packed all the uniforms into a single B-4 bag and his civilian clothes in another bag, then checked out of the hotel, mentioning to the desk clerk that he had a plane to catch at Reagan National. He drove to Ford's Theater and parked the Taurus in a parking lot nearby. Leaving the bag containing the uniforms in the trunk, he walked to the new Toyota and put his civilian clothes into that car's trunk. Finally, with everything ready, and with half an hour to spare, he walked to Ford's Theater and got into the ticket holder's line. Secret Service agents were everywhere, watching everything. They walked down the line of waiting people and cut several people out of the group for a chat, checking tickets and IDs. A deranged-looking man was taken away in a car. Zeke noticed that the people getting the most attention from the agents were unaccompanied men, but when they came to him, the agents simply nodded and went on. The uniform worked. At twenty minutes before the hour, the doors were opened and the crowd admitted. 
Zeke immediately made for the stairs to the balcony and found a seat on an aisle, only a few steps from the staircase to the men's room and the projection booth. Now he had only to wait. Will sat in his dressing room and tried to hold still for the makeup lady while continuing to go over debating points with Tim and Kitty. A television set was tuned to CNN, and the mention of Larry Moody's name stopped all conversation. Everyone turned to watch. In just a minute, we'll be going live to the Georgia governor's mansion, where the governor is about to make a statement on the Larry Moody case. Moody is scheduled to go to the electric chair at Reedsville State Prison tomorrow night. We've had a report that the actress, Charlene Joyner, visited with the governor last night and again this afternoon, leaving the mansion around 5 o'clock. Our reporter caught up to her at a local airport as she was boarding a private jet. Charlene appeared on camera at the door of the Centurion Studios airplane. I visited with the governor last evening and again today and talked with him about Larry's case. I believe he spent the day alone at the mansion, reviewing the case in detail, and I hope for a favorable announcement soon. This is Larry's last chance to live. She turned and boarded the airplane, and a steward closed the door. The camera moved from the taxiing jet to the reporter. Sources tell CNN that after her arrival last night, Ms. Joyner was not seen to leave the governor's mansion until late this afternoon. The governor's wife is out of town, and his staff was kept at arm's length all day as he and Ms. Joyner discussed the case. Back to the studio. Anchorwoman Lori Dew came on screen. We now go to the governor's mansion for the governor's statement. The governor was seen to approach a cluster of microphones. You think Charlene was with him all night and all day? Tim Coleman asked. He looks pretty tired to me, Kitty replied. The governor began to speak. I have been reviewing in great detail the clemency request of Larry Eugene Moody, whose final appeal was recently turned down by the Supreme Court. I have concluded after much study and thought that although Mr. Moody is certainly guilty of the crime with which he was charged, his defense by then-senatorial candidate Will Lee with regard to the death penalty was a thoroughly incompetent one. I have therefore decided to commute Mr. Moody's death sentence to life in prison, and I signed the appropriate papers a few minutes ago. That's all. Thank you. The governor turned to go as the gathered reporters shouted questions. Did the visit by Charlene Joyner have anything to do with your decision? One yelled. The governor turned. Ms. Joyner is one of the people I talked with about this. How long did you spend with her? Another reporter demanded. "'Is your wife still out of town?' a woman's voice shouted. "'Good night, ladies and gentlemen,' the governor said, then walked back into the mansion and closed the door. Will turned to the makeup lady. "'All finished?' "'All finished,' she said. "'Then would you excuse us, please?' He waited until the door had been closed. "'I don't believe it,' he said. "'I actually suggested this to Charlene.' "'Suggested what?' Kitty asked." She was aboard the airplane in Van Nuys, looking all sexy, and I said, Why don't you turn that on the governor? I'm damned if she didn't. Tim's mouth dropped open. You mean you think that Charlene spent all night and all day screwing the governor? Didn't you see the bags under his eyes? Kitty asked. She's certainly capable of that, Will said. And you heard that his wife was out of town. And that he spent the day alone, Kitty added. But Charlene didn't leave until this afternoon. This has got to be a first in the administration of justice. You just have to wonder, Tim said, what Charlene was administering. You notice he got in a good punch at you, Senator, Kitty said. Two to one, after's going to come at you on this. Let him come, Will replied. There was a knock at the door and a Secret Service agent came in. They're ready for you, Senator, he said. You're on the air in five minutes. Let's do it, Will said. Will followed a young woman to the wings at stage left. Looking across the stage, he could see Eft Efton, and they exchanged a wave. Will thought Efton was smiling rather smugly. Zeke had to stand up to let a man into his row of seats. 
The man took the seat next to him. Then he glanced at Zeke's ribbons. You were a Nam, were you? Right, Zeke replied. My name's Dave Waters, the man said, offering his hand. Henry Waldron, Zeke replied, shaking the man's hand. What outfit were you in? Zeke told him. You guys saw a lot of fighting at Da Nang, didn't you? You better believe it, Zeke said. I never got out of Saigon myself, Waters replied. Zeke was relieved when the lights went down, and a voice came from the PA system. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and to our national television audience. Please welcome your moderator for the debate, Jim Lehrer of PBS Television. Lehrer took the stage. Good evening, he said. Our format tonight provides for a three-minute opening statement from each candidate, followed by a series of questions from me. After that, the candidates will be allowed to ask each other questions, and each will have two minutes to answer them. Finally, each candidate will have three minutes for a closing statement. We flipped a coin earlier to decide who would speak first, so Representative Efton will be first with the opening statement, and Senator Lee will be first with the closing statement. Gentlemen? Will came from the left wings as Efton came from the right, and they took their positions at the lecterns to considerable applause. Mr. Efton, you may begin, Lehrer said. I will warn you when you have 30 seconds left, and I will cut you off sharply after three minutes if you are still talking. Efton cleared his throat and began to speak. Zeke found himself to be nervous. He didn't want to sit through all this. He wanted to get on with it. He stood up and walked toward the staircase to the men's room and projection room. A Secret Service agent stopped him. "'Where are you going, sir?' he asked. Zeke placed a hand on his lower abdomen. "'To the men's room up the stairs there.' "'You'll have to use the one downstairs in the lobby,' the agent said. Zeke frowned as though in pain. "'I'm having an intestinal problem,' he said. "'I don't think I can make it that far.' All right, the agent said. Go ahead. Zeke began walking up the stairs, and as he did, the agent moved away, apparently continuing on his rounds. At the top of the stairs, Zeke looked back to be sure no one was observing him, then opened the door to the projection room and went inside, pulling on a pair of latex surgical gloves. There was no lock on the door, so Zeke braced a chair under the doorknob. First he emptied his pockets, shucked off the army uniform, and wrapped it into a ball, tying the shirt sleeves in a knot. Then he put the pocket contents into his black trousers, switched on a small flashlight, and holding it in his mouth, took his Swiss army knife and began unscrewing the grill over the air conditioning duct. He removed the briefcase containing the rifle, then shoved the bundled army uniform into the duct and replaced the grill. Will listened patiently as Efton made his three-minute speech. The first two minutes were bland enough. Then Efton changed tax. As you may have heard, the governor of Georgia last night felt he had to commute the death sentence of a murderer and rapist because the man's lawyer had given him an incompetent defense. That lawyer was none other than Will Lee, and I think he should explain to us tonight why his incompetence as a lawyer allowed a killer to escape the death penalty and why we should expect him to be any more competent as president. Dave Waters, who had been sitting next to Zeke in the balcony, was worried, and he felt he had to do something. He got up and began looking up and down the aisles, but he didn't see what he was looking for, so he walked down the stairs to the lobby where he spotted a man with a small medallion in his lapel. "'Excuse me,' he said to the man. "'Are you Secret Service?' Yes, the man replied. What can I do for you, sir? I need to speak to the agent in charge and right away. What about, sir? Waters produced a military ID card. I'm General David Waters, and I want to speak to him right now. Yes, sir, the agent said. He raised his cupped left hand to his lips and spoke briefly into it, then seemed to listen. He'll be here in just a minute, sir. Ten years ago, I was called into a judge's office in Greenville, Georgia, the seat of my home county, and asked to defend a young man accused of murder. I was reluctant to do so, but the judge pressed me. 
and I agreed. At my first meeting with the defendant, he told me that he was innocent of the charges and that he had never had any problems with the law. I defended him, well, I think. Then, near the end of the trial, a witness blurted out that the defendant had once been accused of rape. The prosecution took full advantage of the situation, and the defendant was convicted as charged. Had he not lied to me, he would probably have been acquitted. The defendant later claimed in his appeals that he received an incompetent defense, a claim that was thrown out by every state and federal court who heard it, including the Supreme Court of the United States. I think that is all the vindication I need, even if it isn't enough, for Mr. Efton. A middle-aged man in a dark suit approached Dave Waters. General Waters, I'm Charles West, the agent in charge of the Secret Service detail here. What can I do for you? Agent West, just before the debate began, I sat down next to an Army officer, a Colonel Waldron, in the balcony. I introduced myself, and noticing his ribbons and insignia, I asked him what outfit he had been in in Vietnam. He said his name was Henry Waldron, and that he had been with my outfit. I said that I had heard the unit had been at Da Nang, and he confirmed this. My outfit was never at Da Nang, and the officer I knew as Henry Waldron was not the man sitting next to me. I believe he is impersonating an army officer, and considering the circumstances, I thought you should know about it. Thank you, General, the agent said. He brought a fist to his lips. Attention all agents, he said. Suspicious person in the theater dressed as an army colonel. Locate immediately and detain. He turned back to Waters. Thank you, General, he said. I'd appreciate it if you'd remain here to identify the man when we find him. He got up and left his seat in the balcony about five minutes ago, Waldron said, but I didn't see where he went. Will finished his statement, compressing his opening remarks in order to stay under the time limit. As he finished, he saw a small flash of light somewhere high up at the rear of the theater. Zeke quickly assembled the rifle, then, judging the distance between the projection booth and the stage, adjusted the sight. The projectionist's window was hinged in the middle. He opened it, rested the tip of the rifle's barrel on the sill, and brought the stock to his shoulder. Agent West stood in the open doorway between the lobby of the theater and the orchestra seats, only a few seconds after broadcasting the first warning to his agents. Chief, this is Robbins, a voice said through his earpiece. Five minutes ago, I allowed an army colonel to use the men's room at the top of the theater. I'm on my way there now. Roger, West replied. Then something occurred to him. Is that the one opposite the projection booth? Affirmative, Robbins replied. West brought the microphone concealed in his left palm to his lips. Maximum alert. Maximum alert. All agents on the upper level converge on the men's room and projection booth at the top rear of the theater. Consider suspect an assassin, armed and dangerous. He began running for the stairs. Zeke brought the crosshairs to bear on the head of Will Lee. As he focused the telescopic sight, a movement at stage right caught his attention, and he swung the rifle toward it. To his astonishment, Howard Efton was lying on the floor behind his lectern, and a man was lying on top of him. He swung the rifle back toward Lee, and as he did, a man appeared from the wings and began reaching for the senator. Zeke fired without reciting, and there was an explosion at the lectern. Then Zeke heard the sound of running feet on the upper level of the theater. He dropped the rifle, kicked the chair away from the doorknob, ran into the hallway outside and started up the ladder, throwing open the trap door to the roof. As he turned to slam it behind him, he saw a man with a gun running up the stairs toward the projection room. Zeke sprinted across the roof, surprised that a Secret Service agent was not waiting for him. He reached the parapet and ran along it, looking for a fire escape or a drain pipe. Nothing. He jumped to the roof next door and, staying low, continued along the row of buildings. Glancing back, he saw lights playing around the roof of the theater. On the third roof, he found a drain pipe, and it took only seconds to slide down it into the alley below. He ran down the alley toward the street, shucking off the latex surgical gloves he had been wearing, and as he turned the corner, he stopped running and started walking, taking deep breaths, 
calming himself, trying to look like an ordinary citizen. Will sat in his dressing room, surrounded by staff and Secret Service agents. Kitty was holding a cloth to his forehead while an agent rummaged in a first aid kit. What happened? he asked. Somebody took a shot at you, an agent said. I already had hold of you and was pulling you toward the wings. Apparently the bullet hit the microphone on the lectern and the thing exploded. You caught some shrapnel, but it's not serious. You may need a stitch or two, though, and as soon as the area is secure, we're going to get you to a hospital to get looked at. You think it's the same guy from L.A.? Kitty asked. It's got to be, the agent replied. Either him or another member of his group, if there is a group. Have you caught him? Kitty asked. The agent held a finger to his ear, pressing on the earpiece. He's out of the building, he said. They're searching the streets for him now. Apparently a member of the audience can ID him. My wife is in the audience, Will said. We've already got her in a car, the agent replied. She'll meet you at the hospital. Zeke drove west along the interstate at the speed limit. He was a happy man, considering that he'd failed. He hadn't really expected to be alive at this moment, and he found the condition pleasing. Home lay ahead of him a thousand miles. They still didn't know who he was. They'd never find him. He'd go home and wait for another opportunity. Will looked out the window of the Boeing as it lifted off from Oakland Airport and turned east toward Georgia. The lights of the city passed under him, then vanished as the airplane climbed toward the Sierras. It was just after 1 a.m., Tuesday morning, Election Day. It was over. He had made more than 70 campaign stops around California during the past three days. His campaign and the party had poured every possible cent into television advertising all over the country, but especially in California. Efton had done the same thing, he reflected. What do you think? he asked Kitty Conroy, who was sitting next to him. I think we're going to win, of course. Does Moss still think it's too close to call? Yes, but he plans to do exit polling tomorrow. I mean today. Tell him not to waste the money. What's the point of polling when we'll have the answer by midnight anyway? I'll tell him, she said. She got up and walked forward. Will got out of his chair and walked aft to his private cabin and the flying bed that awaited him. He had one more stop, a morning appearance to thank the campaign workers in Atlanta, then to Delano to vote, then back to Washington. For a while, he replayed the campaign in his mind. There was nothing more he could do. He fell asleep. When he finally reached the Georgetown house, Kate was already home from work, watching CNN. You look exhausted, she said, kissing him and drawing him onto the sofa next to her. I think that's a fair assessment of my condition, he said. The strange thing is I'm not sleepy. I got a few hours on the airplane last night and a good nap on the way from Georgia to D.C. What does the news say? A good turnout, but not a huge one, she replied. Oh, they had been hoping for a large turnout, usually better for Democrats. Did you vote? You bet. Dare I ask for whom? Don't push your luck, kiddo. Will held up his hands in a defensive posture. I guess it's too late now. What time are we due this evening, she asked. Ten o'clock, he replied. His campaign had taken a hotel ballroom and a suite and had rented a lot of TV sets for election night. We can have a nice quiet dinner here. Their attention was suddenly drawn to the TV set by the mention of Will's name, and they turned to watch. The Secret Service and the FBI have identified a suspect in the assassination attempt last Friday night at Ford's Theater in Washington, the anchorwoman was saying. A photograph of a bearded man flashed onto the screen. He was identified from a fingerprint on the outside doorknob of the projection room at the theater. He is William Ezekiel Tennant, formerly of an address near Atlanta. Tennant disappeared from his home some ten years ago after he failed to make a federal court appearance in Atlanta, and a warrant for his arrest dates from that time. Tennant was a member of a right-wing militia group, 
headquartered in the Atlanta area, a member of which made an attempt on the life of Will Lee, who was at that time a candidate for the Senate. Tennant is rumored to be somewhere in the northwestern United States, and authorities are already searching for him there. Will, Kate, and his parents walked into the hotel ballroom and stood for a moment, taking in the scene. A big band was playing swing tunes, and many of the campaign workers were dancing to the music. A movie theater-sized television screen had been erected, and other TV sets were scattered around the ballroom. Will and Kate made their way to the stage, were introduced, and Will stepped to a microphone as the band stopped playing. I just wanted to speak to you for a moment, he said. Although we don't know the outcome yet, I'm optimistic. I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for the hard work you've put into this campaign. If we don't win tonight, it won't be your fault. I don't think any candidate has ever had such an enthusiastic group of people working for his election, and I'm very grateful to each and every one of you. Kate and I are going to go upstairs now and wait for the final returns. I'll speak to you again after we know the result of this election. In the meantime, have a great evening. You've earned it. The four of them were whisked backstage and to an elevator that took them to a large suite on the highest floor of the hotel. There, waiting for them, were Will's closest staff and a lot of big contributors to his campaign and to the party. Kitty ran over. The polls have just closed in Illinois, she said, and the networks, based on their exit polling, are giving it to us by two points. We can all thank you for that, Kitty, Will said, hugging her. Your idea for the debate against the TV set gave us the state. I hope that turns out to be true, Kitty said. I'll never get tired of taking credit for it. Midnight was approaching, 9 p.m. in California, when the polls would close and the networks could announce the results of their exit polling. The crowd in the suite were all sitting down now, occupying all the furniture and much of the carpeted floor, facing the big TV screen, which was divided into quarters, one each for NBC, CBS, ABC, and CNN. Kitty was switching the sound from network to network. More coffee than champagne was being served at this hour. Quiet, Kitty yelled, switching to NBC, where Tom Brokaw was speaking. The closest presidential race in American history, Brokaw was saying, closer than Kennedy-Nixon in 1960, closer than Nixon-Humphrey in 1968. The polls have just closed in California, and we can now talk about the exit polling we've been doing in that state all day, right up to a couple of hours ago. Based on that polling, we can now call the California race. Although no more than one percentage point separates the candidates, we can now say that California has gone to Congressman Howard Efton, and that means that Efton takes all 54 of California's electoral votes and the election. Howard Efton is going to be the next president of the United States. The crowd sat in shocked silence. Switch to ABC, Tim Coleman shouted. California gives the election to F. Efton, Peter Jennings was saying. Kitty switched to CBS and Dan Rather. It looks as though Efton has won this election, Rather said. Kitty switched to CNN, more of the same. Nobody said much of anything. Will beckoned Moss Mallet over. What do you make of this, he asked. No other kind of polling is as accurate as exit polling, Moss said. They talked to people who had already voted as they left the polling places. Quite frankly, if even one of the networks had disagreed, I'd say we have a chance. But they're all coming up with the same result. I'm sorry, Will, but we've lost it. Will stood up. Listen, everybody, I'm not going to say anything now except to thank you for being here tonight and for your support during the campaign. Certainly it doesn't look good at the moment. Kate and I are going to go home and get some sleep now, and I suggest you do the same. Kitty, schedule a press conference for noon tomorrow on the Capitol steps, and I'll make a statement then. Will took Kate's arm and started for the door, shaking hands along the way. Kitty appeared at his elbow. I'll call you if anything changes, she said. Don't, Will said. I'm going to go home and sleep the sleep of the dead, 
and I don't want to be disturbed by anybody. Please see to that. He hugged her. I'm sorry, Kitty. I know how hard you worked and how much you wanted this. Set up a dinner tomorrow night with just you, Tim, Moss, and Sam Merriweather and my folks, and we'll pick over the bones and talk about what we might have done. I'll be in the office by 11.30. Have a statement ready for me to look at. All right, Senator, Kitty said, and there were tears in her eyes. Will and Kate were quiet on the ride to Georgetown, but Billy seemed to want to talk. You know, he said, you ran one hell of a campaign, and if there were any justice, you'd have won. But we both know there's precious little justice in politics. I guess you're right, Dad, Will replied. I had an awful good time, though. So did I, Patricia echoed. You've got a lot to be proud of, Will. When they got out of the car, the head of the Secret Service detail approached Will. Senator, he said, we've just had word that the FBI has tracked down Zeke Tennant. He's in a mountain cabin in Idaho, and they're planning to take him tomorrow morning. They're not releasing this to the media. They don't want to alert him. That's good news, Will said. I want to thank you and all your people for your great work during the campaign, he said. You saved my life more than once. I'd appreciate it if you'd put together a list of the name of every man and woman who worked on the detail. I'd like to write to them. Of course, Senator, the agent said. I've had your cars brought back. They're in the garage. Our people are already out of the house, and I'll leave a couple of men on the front door to see that no one disturbs you tonight. In the morning, we'll be gone. Will let them into the house and began closing blinds. God, I'm tired, he said. Kate walked to the rear hallway, switched off the telephones, then came back. The agents are already gone, she said. They left everything as neat as a pin. Do you folks need anything? she asked Patricia. I might have a glass of milk after a while, Patricia replied, but right now I just want to get Billy to bed. He's very tired. Don't worry. I know where the kitchen is. Good night, then, Kate said, kissing her. Kate switched off the upstairs phones. How do you feel, she asked. Numb, Will replied. Let's talk about it tomorrow. They got undressed and into bed. You know, she said, life will be simpler now, but I had started looking forward to your being president. I think I'm more disappointed than you are. I'll catch up with you tomorrow, he said. Will fell asleep with Kate's head on his shoulder. Will came awake very slowly in the darkened room. Kate wasn't there, and he could smell coffee brewing downstairs. He rolled over and looked at the bedside clock. Nearly seven o'clock. He'd slept through the night without even turning over. He got up, went to the bathroom and brushed his teeth using his left hand, his right was too sore and swollen from shaking hands to make a fist. He put on a robe over his nightshirt, got into his slippers, and walked downstairs. Kate looked over her shoulder from the kitchen. Morning. Your folks are still asleep. You want some eggs? Don't mind if I do, he said, looking around. Did you bring in the papers? Nope. It suddenly occurred to Will that he had just lost the election, and he felt momentarily nauseated. He drank some orange juice and felt better. I'll get the papers, he said. He walked through the darkened living room, undid the latch on the front door, opened it, and stepped out onto the porch. Suddenly he was blinded by a hundred flashes, and a roar of voices washed over him. Blinking, shielding his eyes from the continuing flashes, Will looked around him. The street was full of people, press and cameras, held at the cross street by police, and the sudden din was amazing. The police removed the barricades, and the crowd rushed toward the house, stopped only by another cordon of barricades at the foot of the steps. Kate came to the door. "'What the hell is going on?' she asked. Kitty Conroy, Tim Coleman, Moss Mallet, and Sam Merriweather broke through a cordon of police and rushed up the front steps. "'You won!' Kitty shouted over the noise. What? Will yelled back. Kitty shouted into his ear. There was a huge rush of after-work voters in California, and most of the absentee ballots were for you. 
Those two things put us over the top. Efton is conceding even as we speak. She handed him a copy of the national edition of the New York Times. This edition went to bed at midnight. Efton defeats Lee, the banner headline read. Will stood dumbfounded, staring at the newspaper. His parents joined him on the porch, and Kate slipped an arm around him. Wave at the people, dear, she said. Try not to look semi-conscious. Will waved at the crowd and held up the newspaper to the crowd's delight. Smile, Kate said. Presidents have to smile a lot. Will smiled, showing all the teeth he had. At first light, Zeke was eating a bowl of homemade granola when his son Danny came down the stairs from the log cupola carrying an assault rifle, a 9 millimeter pistol strapped to his side. The boy was pale. "'What is it, son?' he asked. "'They are coming through the trees,' Danny said, and his voice trembled. "'Wake up your mother and your sisters and get them armed,' Zeke said. "'Then come upstairs with me.' Zeke ran up to the cupola and looked down the hill. Men in camouflage suits were creeping up the incline in squads, one group taking shelter and covering, while another group ran ahead a few more yards. They were 300 yards away, Zeke calculated, using the distance markers he had placed. He checked the wind sock and adjusted the telescopic sight on his rifle for distance and windage. He heard Danny coming slowly up the steps behind him. Hurry up, goddammit, he yelled. We got to pick off as many as we can before they get any closer. No, sir, the boy said quietly. He sounded very shaky. Zeke turned and looked at Danny. He was holding the Glock pistol out in front of him. "'What's the matter with you?' he demanded. "'I'm not going to let you get Mama and the girls killed,' Danny said. "'Nor me neither.' "'You holster that weapon and get to a gun port,' Zeke commanded. "'We spent two years preparing for this, and we're not going to screw it up now.' "'You brought this on us,' Danny said, "'and you're not going to stop until we're all dead.' His voice was stronger now. And I'm not going to have it. You'll do as you're told, boy, and you'll do it right now, Zeke yelled at him. No, sir, I won't, Danny said, pointing the pistol at Zeke's head. Have you completely lost your mind, Zeke shouted. No, sir, Danny replied. But you have. He pulled the trigger. It was the loudest noise Zeke had ever heard. Down the mountainside, the FBI agent in charge heard two shots. He picked up a handheld radio. Shots from the house, he said. Everybody hold your position. He trained his binoculars on the house and waited. Nothing happened for a good two minutes. Then the front door opened, and a teenaged boy walked out, his hands in the air, followed by a woman and two girls. Hold your fire, the agent said into the radio. He stood up and walked up the hill, motioning a squad of agents to follow him. He stopped ten feet short of the little group. "'Stand still, son, while my people search you,' he said. The boy and the women were quickly frisked. "'Everybody's clean,' an agent said. The agent relaxed a little. "'Good morning, folks,' he said. "'Who are you?' "'My name is Danny Tennant,' the boy said, "'and this is my mama and my sisters.' "'Where's your father, Danny?' the agent asked. "'He's up in the cupola,' Danny replied, pointing to the top of the house. "'Is he going to give us any trouble?' the agent asked. "'No, sir, he's dead. I shot him.' The agent took a quick breath, then motioned to his men. "'Take a look inside,' he said, "'and be careful.' Three minutes later they returned. "'Tenants upstairs,' an agent said. He's dead, like the boy said. There's nobody else in the house. The agent took Danny's arm and walked him toward the front porch. You want to tell me what happened, son? Yes, sir, I do, Danny replied. But it's going to take a while. We've got all the time in the world, the agent said. Will Lee stood coatless in the bright January sunshine on the steps of the United States Capitol, and tried not to shiver in the stiff breeze that snapped at the numerous American flags in his immediate vicinity. 
Only Kate knew he was wearing his ski underwear. He glanced over his shoulder at Joe Adams, who was beaming broadly at him as he pounded his hands together and who looked greatly relieved to no longer be president. He looked at his parents, who had stopped applauding and instead had their arms around each other. Finally, he looked at Kate and thought that she had never looked happier when sex was not involved. All was as right with the world as it would ever again likely be, unless he could, by force of his long experience and personal leadership, make it even better. He was determined to do so. He looked into the crowd of 100,000 inauguration attendees and into the lenses that connected him with a hundred million other of his countrymen. My fellow Americans, he began. We hope you've enjoyed this program from Harper Audio. To order additional cassettes or CDs, or to receive a complete catalog of Harper Audio and Cadman titles, please call us at 1-800-331-3761. You might also try our website, www.harperaudio.com. Thank you.